Hi, my name is Len Thompson. I'm the president of Cold Steel Incorporated and the chief instructor of our knife fighting training program. Over the last 10 years, I've spent an enormous amount of time sparring with my training partners in order to develop a method of fighting where we can cut and stab our opponent without being injured in the process. During this developmental period, I have borrowed heavily from the Filipino martial arts, including Lameco Escrima, Western boxing, Western fencing, including Epe and saber fencing, and Kenjitsu, or Japanese sword fighting. In the end, what we came up with was a long range fighting method where we use footwork, timing, rhythm, balance, speed, and strategy to defeat our opponent. In the following instruction, I'm gonna cover our basic long range knife fighting program. But before we get started, I wanna cover the following. The first is the three ranges a knife fight can occur in. The second are the types of knives you may find in the hands of an opponent and their advantages and disadvantages. Third is why your fighting knife must be both strong and sharp. Fourth is what your actual goal should be in a knife fight. And following this, we will go into a discussion of how to grip the fighting knife. There's a number of different grips that you can use. And also, how to adopt our basic fighting stance or posture. The most dangerous range that you can encounter an opponent armed with a knife at is close range. Now when I'm talking about close range, I mean you're so close to your opponent that he doesn't even have to take a single step. If Ron hands me this uh, training fighter here, I can cut him and I don't have to move. He can cut me or stab me and he doesn't have to uh, take even a single step. All, he doesn't even hardly have to lean. He can just put his knife out and cut you. The problem is that initiation beats reaction time. You have no reaction time at close range. An opponent doesn't need to be skilled. He doesn't need to be physically strong. He doesn't know how to have to, have to be able to joint lock you or to punch or kick you or elbow you or knee you. He doesn't need to know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He doesn't have to have any fighting skills. All he needs are two attributes, speed and desire. That's all he needs. We want to avoid this range whenever we can because it doesn't allow us to use our footwork and our timing, our rhythm, our balance, our strategy, all of the other fighting elements that we're going to develop over the course um, of the next, uh, this program. Um, it doesn't allow us to use those because we're so bloody close to them. The other thing I hate about close range is when people aren't skilled fighters, they tend to want to trade here. Quite often, you'll be facing an opponent that doesn't know anything about knife fighting other than he wants to kill you at that moment. So he may not have any regard or respect for his own body's safety. So he can go up there and just stab you and you stab him back and you stab him and he stabs you. Look, you end up trading at this range. So it's a very dangerous range. We want to avoid it in our long range knife fighting uh, program like the plague. I'm not saying you're not going to have to find yourself fighting at that range sometimes and you're still going to have to fight there, but we want to avoid it whenever possible. Ron and I are going to give you a brief demonstration of fighting at close range and how horrible and how difficult it is to do it successfully. But before we just begin, I want to stick in this little safety statement. You're going to hear me refer, refer to safety uh, throughout this presentation. The main thing to protect is your eyes. I'm going to leave off my fencing mask so that I can talk. I'm going to break my own rule. Don't you ever do this at home. Don't practice knife fighting, especially any type of sparring or training for sparring without having a three weapons rated fencing mask on like Ron has right here. This will give you total protection to your face and keep you from being injured. And now we're going to fight briefly at close range. Another dangerous range you want to avoid whenever possible is medium range. By medium range, I mean you're close enough to your opponent that only a single step separates you from your opponent. In other words, I'm only one step away from Ron. I take one step and I can cut him. I take one step and I can stab him. At medium range, you only have a fraction of more reaction time than you do at close range. It's not the optimum range to fight at if you want to emerge from the fray unscathed. In a moment, we're going to give you a brief demonstration of what this looks like fighting at medium range.
The distance we prefer to use in knife fighting is what we call long range. At long range, there's two or more steps separating you from your opponent. At this distance, you have a chance to use your skill and your footwork and timing and balance and rhythm and all your attributes that you've developed over years of practice to lure and trick your opponent into making a mistake so that you can cut and stab him and at a position or a moment in time where it's very difficult for him to counterattack or to cut or stab or harm you in any way. We're going to demonstrate this briefly now. There I used a flèche to make a rapid advance on Ron and cut him at a moment in time when he wasn't ready. There you saw a classic. I put forward pressure on Ron, just staying outside of range. I saw him lean back. I got the cut into his face. <laughs> knives come in all shapes and sizes. You can encounter little knives, medium sized knives, big knives on the street. I want to now take a moment and run through some of the different categories of knives that you may encounter in the hands of an opponent on the street. The first category are what I call mini knives. A mini knife is a little tiny knife like this that could fit on your keychain. It's so small that you can hide it in your waistband. You can ha hide one like this, this Urban Pal. Quite often you can hide this underneath your collar, behind a uh, belt buckle, in the cuff of your pants. Um, you can hide it under the tongue of your shoe. You can put it in the, under the instep of your shoe. You can tape it to the laces of your shoe. A little knife like this can be hidden on your body so well that you'll have to have a really expert person to frisk you to find a knife this small. Um, don't ever underestimate one of these little knives. Yes, they're not going to make a 5 inch deep, 20 inch long cut in you, but a knife like this can absolutely destroy your face in one slash. So you have to give these things a lot of respect. Um, the big advantage is their concealability and their lightweight. You can carry one of these 24-7. You can carry this your entire life and you'll never get tired of it. It has no weight, has no bulk, it's totally thin, has a real small profile and you need to be aware that these knives are out on the street. Now, that doesn't say that this knife is always a weapon. 99% of the time, this knife is going to be used for utility task. I mean, I can't tell you how many pop tops I've opened with my Urban Pal on my key ring or how many boxes I've opened with an Urban Pal. So most of the time, it's going to be used for utility, but it can also be used for self-defense. It goes between your fingers like that. It locks in there. You can use it with a straight lock wrist and punch with it and slash with it. Extremely difficult to take away from you. Very hard to disarm somebody with such a small knife. First of all, it's locked between your fingers and your fingers curl all the way around the handle and your thumb locks on the top like that. Let's roll in for a close up on that. Again, look how that knife is secured in my palm. It goes between um, my ring finger and my middle finger. Those fingers curl around it roll up, my, my thumb comes down and locks that little knife in place. It's not much blade to sticking out from my uh, fingers to try to get a hold of to disarm it. Not a lot of leverage for your opponent to work with there and this knife will look like a chainsaw in action. So you need to be aware that your opponent may have one or more mini knives secreted upon his person so that you can always be aware that even though you cut that knife out of his hand he may have one or more knives still that you're going to have to deal with. Here's another little one, our Super Edge. 
Again, very easy to conceal, very lightweight. Comes with a keychain. You can wear it underneath your clothes on a lanyard, suspended around your neck. Uh, you can tape it and pin it. You can pin it underneath a tie. I frequently wear one pinned underneath a tie. So it's another little tiny knife that can do a lot of damage um, in a heartbeat. It's very concealable, very easy to use. Again, this knife, 99% of the time, it's going to be used for legitimate purposes. So it's not necessarily an evil thing. It's a very useful tool, but it can be used for righteous self-defense and emergency very effectively. Next up, the continuum of force, if you will, is a neck knife. A neck knife is primarily worn, suspended from a lanyard around the neck. This is our mini tack. It has a flat craton handle. It's very thin. It's not even a half inch thick in its thickest part. It has a lot of cutting power. It's got a four inch blade. Uh, a very light knife though. This whole knife and sheath only weighs a, a few ounces. I think it's about three and a half ounces total. Very easily to conceal. You need to know about these knives and what they can do. Another knife that's really popular is something like this, an integral handle and blade model. This is called our spike. It has a thread wrapped handle, weighs a couple ounces, has a really nice sheath. It's easy to hide this in a boot top in the small of your back, up your sleeve. Um, it's another 24-7 knife. It's very easy to carry. Um, it has tremendous penetrating power, especially when you put it in reverse grip and you cap the end of um, the handle right here, put your thumb over that. You get tremendous power in all of your thrusts. Uh, you should be aware of these um, little neck knives. A boot knife is kind of falling out of favor in the last uh, 15, 20 years. It's been upstaged by a tactical folder. I think that's a shame because a boot knife is 20 times the knife a tactical folder is. First of all, it's got no pivot pin, so it's going to be um, terrifically more strong than a tactical folder. The blade doesn't fold, so you have a solid tang that goes all the way through the butt. It's very, very strong. It's not going to break in combat if it's well made. You usually have a four or five inch blade. Most boot knives have a five inch blade. This is our Coben. Um, this has a five inch blade. It'll go through a one inch rope like it was butter. Take a mineral rope. We can hang that thing up and cut right through it with this knife. That's enough stopping power to cut a man's arm off at the wrist. So you can have pretty good stopping power with it. It's got enough um, blade length to reach most of the vital organs on the body. It's light enough to be carried all the time. Its only downside is that it doesn't have a really long blade. Four or five inch blade isn't ideal for a fighting knife. It's a little too short. And it doesn't have much weight. This knife only weighs four ounces. So it's not going to do the massive cuts that our Laredo Bowie and our Gurkha Kukri would do. And we're going to come to those in a minute. But if you can talk yourself into carrying a boot knife instead of a tactical folder, I heartily suggest you do that. If there's any way that you can train yourself to carry a boot knife instead of a tactical folder, you'll be a lot better armed. Now boot knives come in all shapes and sizes. And here's another model. This is our Peacekeeper 2. It has a five inch blade. It's double edged, has a craton handle, comes with a nice um, conceal-X sheath. And it offers a tremendously good grip, a lot better grip than you're going to get in any tactical folder. It has a double integral guard to keep your hand from going forward when you're thrusting. And uh, very few folding knives have anything like that to protect your hand. And you can um, deliver a very cu effective cutting or slashing attack with this knife. Again, it's not going to be as devastating as a full-size fighting knife, but it can be very effective. And this is something to keep in mind that your opponent may be ar uh, armed with a knife like this. You know, we might have this in his arsenal. We also have a Desperado. Uh, this has an S-curved blade. It's very effective for slashing and thrusting. It's got a very cute point. You can hold it like this in a saber grip, or you can hold it like a push dagger. A very uh, versatile uh, fighting knife. It's got this egg-shaped handle, which allows you to draw it from the sheath in a moment's notice. It's very easy. Someone can really, if that skill, can pull their coat back and have this thing in action in less, a lot less than half a second. I'm talking about a third of a second. That thing's on its way cutting you. So it's really um, an effective boot knife, and I much prefer it to any folding knife. Let's face facts, though. Most of you are not going to carry a boot knife, and you're not going to carry a full-size fighting knife. Although I'm going to try to talk you into it, but you're probably not going to do it. What almost everybody wants to carry now is what is um, generally called a tactical folding knife. 
I see these in sizes of blades from three inches uh, to four inches. Four inches is about as big as most people want to carry. I think they're a real mistake carrying such a short blade, but that's about as big a knife that most people want to carry. Here's um, a tactical folder that we recommend. Of course, I'm going to promote my own products, but these have been extensively tested, and we can prove that this is a really strong, sharp, effective tactical folder. It has a four inch blade. This one has our ultra lock. It has a generous handle. You can get your full hand on this handle. A lot of people are killing, carrying tactical folders out there now with three inch blades and little tiny handles. Now, my hand is only medium in size. A lot of you people out there have a lot larger hands, and if you're carrying a little three inch blade, you don't have much control over it. Your hand is way too big for that little handle. So you wanna, when you're thinking about a tactical folder, you wanna look at that knife and look at your hand and think, hey, can I really get a good grip on this thing or not, or is it really too small? I really heartily suggest that if you're going to carry a tactical folder, that you carry one with a four inch or longer blade. A three inch blade is really difficult to uh, get an, enough edge into the target to stop that incoming arm or incoming hand. It just can't deliver enough blade and it's too light. A four inch blade is really about the minimum that you can really effectively carry on the street. So I heartily suggest this. Um, look for a knife that has a really strong lock because people don't stand still in a knife fight, and we're gonna to get to that in a minute, why your knife should be strong and sharp. But tactical folders, there's a whole bunch of them out there, and there's a whole lot of people going to hell for lying about their tactical folders. Some of those big names and those custom knife makers, when you put their knife in a vise, and you put 70, 80, 100 pounds of weight, four and a half inches from their pivot pin, you're gonna be surprised at how many of them blow up and break and fail. There's a whole lot of lying going on in the knife industry, and the magazines that you read aren't telling you the truth. So you need to buy from a really reputable maker that actually tests his products and can prove how strong his knife is. Here's another tactical fold that I like. This is our triple action. As you can see, you can open it in a heartbeat. It opens faster than a ballet song, faster than a switchblade. It opens at light speed. It's got a tremendous uh, safe locking mechanism. The um, blade, when it's closed, is totally encapsulated by the cover, so you can carry it in complete, uh, complete safety. You can use it as a pocket or your wara stick to hit with on either side. So it allows you to start at the bottom of the force conti uh, continuum and use percussion blows to defend yourself and then work up to using the edge and at last use the point. So it gives you a lot of responses. I also like our new tie light. This knife has a Zytel handle with steel liners. It's got a really reliable leaf spring lock. It's got a very acute stiletto like point. That point is sharp as a needle, but it's got tremendous cutting ability. And we'll just come in here for a close up, and if the camera can see me shaving hair from my arm. Now all these knives right out of the box that Cold Steel makes are this sharp. It's a very, very sharp knife. You wouldn't think a blade that's this narrow would cut that well. See, it has a fairly short bevel, but We've really got the edge geometry down on this knife and we can get it really, really sharp. It's very pointy and very strong. Very easy to make an insertion or a devastating cut with this knife. The disadvantage of tactical folders is, and again, I want to emphasize this, they're not as strong as a boot knife. They're not as strong as a full-sized fighting knife and a big knife. They're not as effective. They're a heck of a lot better than fingernails now. Don't get me wrong. I'd much rather have a tactical folder than just standing here with my knuckles. But they're not as strong and they're not as effective as a boot knife or a full-size fighting knife. But they're still a very good weapon to have in your arsenal of self-defense. Let's move up to full-size fighting knives. The more I train with a fighting knife and the more I practice and the more I actually use a fighting knife, the more enamored I am with the double-edged. When I started my knife making, knife making career back in 1980, I didn't like double edges because so many of the ones that I'd seen, the tips easily broke off them. But um, years ago, I designed a full-size double-edged fighter, this Taipan, that has a strong yet acute point. The point's very resistant to breaking, but the knife is very sharp on both sides. It's um, capable of delivering devastating cutting power. It's got a tapered pommel to hit with, so you can use butt strokes with it. It's got a nice long grip. It, the grip is oval in shape so that you can really lock your hand around it. Whenever possible, I earnestly, earnestly urge you to carry a full-size fighting knife. 
A full-size fighting knife like this Taipan will stop an incoming knife arm and disable it with one stroke. One stroke like that, finished. That arm is finished. Okay? You can't necessarily do that with a boot knife. You certainly can't necessarily do that with a tactical folder. And a mini knife, you even have less likelihood of being totally successful in disabling an incoming arm with one stroke. But when you're carrying a razor sharp, double edged fighting knife like this, I'm going to come out here, have the camera come over here, and just show what this knife can do. Look at that. Let's run in there, camera. And you're going to see me in this presentation, that little bald spot. And every time you see that bald spot, you'll know <laughs> how sharp your knife has to be. Has to be razor sharp like this. I like a, a tactical full-size fighting knife to have at least a six inch blade. Better is a seven or a seven and a half, even an eight inch blade. The longer the blade, the longer the blade, excuse me, um, the more effective it's going to be up to the point that it becomes too cumbersome to carry it or conceal it. Uh, again, here's another nice double-edged blade. This was, um, we call this our Black Bear. Originally, this was uh, designed by custom knife maker Bob Loveless, and this is one of the quintessential uh, fighting knives that's ever been designed. Um, it's got full double edges, clip point. It's got this sub help, which I really, really like. The sub help gives you better control when you're thrusting and when you're recovering from a cut. It allows you to overcome centrifugal force and keep that knife securely in your hand. See, it has a little turn up here. We call this a return, and it has the sub belt here. So your fingers slide between that and your little fingers right here in front of that little projection there, and that helps keep that knife securely in your hand. Um, Double-edged knife gives you tremendous advantages in a knife fight. You can cut forward, uh, backward, you can cut down, you can cut up, you can, any motion you make with that knife, you can turn that edge into it. So if you miss a stroke, you can pull back. If you miss a stroke, you can drop and cut the person. If you miss a stroke, you can turn the edge and pull it back. It gives you a lot of advantages. Paul Vunak, a famous martial artist that's trained with my friend Dan Asanto for years, once said, carrying a fighting knife with a single edge is like carrying a Breda 92 with half the magazine full. That's a, a, a really full-size uh, fighting handgun and 9mm caliber. It holds about 15 rounds in his double column magazine. He said it's like carrying the gun with half the magazine full. I feel the same way. If you're going to carry a fighting knife, I prefer you to carry a double edge. It's twice the power of a single edge knife. The only disadvantage double edges have is their points are, by necessity, a little bit weaker than a single edge. So you have to keep that in mind. If you want a single edge knife, though, carrying something like our Tanto, it's hard to beat something like this. This is a full-size fighting knife, has a seven and a half inch blade. It's got a really nice uh, craton handle that feels sticky to the touch so that you can get a tremendous grip on it. It's got this skull crushing pommel. It's tapered. And it comes to almost a point, and it's a little bit thinner right here. I don't know if the camera can come in there and see that. The reason for that is we want to focus the power of a butt stroke in one small area so that if you see a little opportunity to hit with the, the pommel or butt here, you can destroy a hand. You can break the bones in a hand. You can break the bones in a face and um, do a lot of damage with just a very small, quick movement. It's got a nice Tasuba guard, style guard, to keep your hand from going forward on the blade. Um, it's got the Tanto um, shaped blade that I invented back in 1980. It's got a, a 23 degree curve right here on the primary edge that intersects the secondary edge here, and it creates a secondary point right here, right in this spot right here. And we use this secondary point to snap cut with. I'll use that point and drive it into my opponent's hand or into his face or another target, and that cuts a V-shaped wound way out of proportion to what you'd think you'd get from such a mo movement. It'll open up a bicep and just a snap cut like that, you'll cut a big V-shaped wound in that and destroy the bicep with just a quick, brief movement of your wrist. It's got a reinforced point because the blade spine runs up to within a half inch of the very terminal end of that tip. Very, very thick spine all the way up to that tip. It's a very strong knife. It has really good cutting power. You can't go wrong with 
a tanto from Cold Steel, a full-size tanto like this with a seven and a half inch blade. Terrific fighting knife. Anytime you see an opponent armed with a full-size fighting knife, you're in a heck of a lot of trouble. It's a lot easier to deal with someone with a short blade, and we're gonna go into this later, than it is with a long blade. This is extremely, extremely dangerous compared to a small knife or even a tactical folder like this. This is a lot easier to deal with than something like this. These are really dangerous knives. Going up the scale of force, we get into big knives. A big knife like this Trailmaster can cut your, your arm off above the elbow or your knee off ab above, I mean your leg off above your knee. Right here, a stroke like that will cut your leg off. A knife like this will cut your head off in a single stroke. It's a devastating fighting knife. It can maim you with one blow. So when you see somebody armed with this, you're in a lot of trouble. At the same token, if you're carrying a knife like this, you're in a very, very powerful position. You have a lot of power, a lot of cutting power, and a lot of stabbing power at your disposal. I, it's hard to find a disadvantage to this knife. There's so many advantages I could go on and on and on about why you should carry a big fighting knife. When we make our training knives here, our foam trainers, we make them the size of this Trailmaster Bowie because this is what we really suggest you carry, a knife this size if you really want to have all the advantage in a knife fight. The only disadvantage though is its weight. These knives weigh about 16 ounces. They've got, this one has a nine and a half inch long blade and a five inch handle, so it's got 14 half inches overall length. That's a lot to conceal. It's harder to conceal these knives. You can conceal them with a little effort. Hey, it's not as hard to conceal a Trailmaster as it has a medium frame 38 Special. So don't get me wrong, it's not that you can't conceal these, it's just it's a little bit more harder to conceal them than a full size knife or a boot knife. The main disadvantage is weight. It weighs 16, 17 ounces and it's long, but it brings a lot of power. Even going up further is our Laredo Bowie. This has a 10 and a half inch long blade. It's got a false edge here on the top so I can back cut with it. It's got a very acute narrow point. So it stabs as well as a tie pan. Stabs incredibly well. And it's got a very thick blade spine. So it's very strong. It's got a five and a half inch handle so you can get a grip. Even somebody with a big hand can get a really good grip on this knife. Carrying a Bowie knife as your fighter is usually a really good thing to do. A Bowie knife makes a tremendous fighting knife. It's hard to beat a Bowie, in my opinion, for a full-sized heavy fighter. It, it cuts like a hatchet, even better than some hatchets. It stabs as well as a dagger. You can use the back of the blade as a bludgeon if you want to use less lethal or less damaging blows, you can hit with the back of the blade or the flat of the blade. It's a terrific fighting knife, and I really recommend that you carry. Hey, if you don't want to carry a cold steel knife, that's cool too. But make sure that your, your knife is strong and sharp and that it can end the fight with one stroke like our Laredo Bowie. That's why you want to carry a big knife, is it stops the fight right away. Going up to probably the very end of the force continuum for fighting knives, is something like this Gurkha Kukri. This knife has got a 12 inch long blade. It's 5 16 inch thick here at the spine. Devastating fighting knife. It's heavy though, it's 22 ounces. Now, that's heavy for a fighting knife, but when you think about it in the world of firearms, a 22 ounce firearm isn't very heavy. A 20, 22 ounce revolver or automatic pistol is be considered pretty light and easily uh, carried all day long. So you can carry this knife all day long. It's just that it's, it's pretty um, long overall length. It's about, what, 17 inches or so long, and it hangs down on your waist. And if you carry a big knife like this around in public, in plain sight, you're going to get asked a lot of uncomfortable questions by law enforcement. They're going to want to know, why are you carrying that big knife for? So that's the big disadvantage of carrying um, a, a Gurkha Kukri or a Laredo Bowie is they're not politically correct. When you carry them in plain sight, they cause a lot of people to a grimace and shudder and sometimes they pick up their phone and they drop a dime on you and the next thing you're explaining to law enforcement why you're carrying this knife. Um, in themselves, 
<laughs> They're inanimate objects. I've never seen a knife jump off the table, go down the street and stab anybody. It's the evil heart of that person that does the damage, that does the physical harm, that wrecks people's lives, not inanimate objects uh, like knives. Well, that's the end of my sermon on that. I want you to be aware, as we're uh, conducting this presentation of all these different knives, and that they can appear on your opponent, just because you cut the knife out of his hand doesn't mean that it's over. He could have more knives still to come. So keep that in mind, and remember that when possible, you want to carry a full-size fighting knife or a big knife. If you can't talk yourself into that, you know you're not going to do it, then carry a boot knife or a neck knife or a really effective tactical folder, one that will cut at least a one-inch rope, free hanging with one stroke. That's a pretty good litmus test. If it'll do that, it'll serve you well in a knife fight. When I was talking about the fighting knives that you can encounter on the street. We went through the different sizes of fighting knives you might find in the hands of an opponent and their advantages and disadvantages. I briefly touched at that time on the fact that your fighting knife must be strong and sharp. I'd like to go into that a little bit more right now. When you're picking a fighting knife to carry on your person for self-defense, one of the major criterion has to be how strong is it? How strong is the tip? How strong is the blade? How strong is the handle and the tang that runs through the handle? How strong is the lock? These are questions that you better have answered in your heart because your life could depend on it. You see, people don't stand still when you try to stab them with a knife. Let me illustrate what I mean. I have Ron come over against the wall. Sometimes your most carefully calculated thrust, you've timed this thing to an, the fraction of an inch, you're almost certain you're going to strike home. But your best laid plans quite often go awry and you stab the wall. There's a whole lot of things out there that are hard and strong that you can encounter with the tip of your knife when you miss your target. No one holds still when you try to stab them. They always move. No one stands, like a, stands there like a statue and says, put it right here. They're going to move. And your knife blade can miss its intended target and smash into a wall, a car door, a door jam, a girder in a parking lot. There's all kinds of hard objects out there that can break your knife. We found in testing that if you break 3 sixteenths of an inch off the tip of your knife, you've really degraded its ability to be a, an effective stabbing tool. You break a quarter inch off, you're really in trouble. You break a half inch off, you're really rele relegated now to just using the edge. You don't want to break the tip off your fighting knife. All of cold steel knives are engineered to be very, very strong and not to have their tips break like that. So you need to make sure that you're using a fighting knife that has a very, very strong tip. The other thing is, when you go to cut somebody, they move too. And your carefully timed slash that would have taken his face off just impacted the wall. Lots of times, a knife will break in half when you do that. The edge will dent or break, or the whole knife will snap in half. Sometimes people put um, saw teeth on the top of their knife and uh, these survival mo models. And what that does is puts a stress riser there. When you hit hard like that, the stress runs down to that first little cut in that saw teeth and a break right there. Now you've got a busted knife. You definitely don't want your fighting knife to um, break when you miss your target. Along with strong, your fighting knife must be sharp. It has to have a razor edge. When you have an opportunity to defend yourself with your fighting knife and you see that opening and you make contact with your blade, it has to be sharp enough to disable that arm or that leg in a single stroke. You can't afford to have a dull knife at such a critical moment. You always have to keep your dedicated fighting knife razor, razor sharp. Don't use it for chores around the house or the farm or the ranch. Don't use it in the warehouse. Don't use it at your desk at the office. Don't cut paper with it. Don't cut cardboard with it. And above all, don't loan it to anybody else to use to cut anything with. When you pull your knife out, it has to be razor, razor sharp. Again, I want to emphasize that the blade on your fighting knife, right here I've got a six inch um, Voyager with a clip point blade. When you pull this knife out, it has to be hair shaving sharp, just like this. Let's have the camera come in there, and you can see every part. From the heel to the tip, that blade has to be 
hair shaving sharp. Let me give you an illustration why this is so important. A friend of mine named Terry Register grew up in uh, North Florida. And his grandfather owned a slaughterhouse. And Terry worked there for many years after school. One day, these two employees at the slaughterhouse got into a knife fight. I mean, these guys hated each other's guts. They fussed at each other for the last three months in a row, and it had to boil over sooner or later. So one afternoon, when Terry was there, out came the knives. And when the fur quit flying, one guy was laying on the ground, bleeding from it seemed like everywhere. Blood was pouring out of him like a river. He was cut to ribbons. And the other guy was standing there in kind of a daze. And while the other employees were administering first aid to the man that was really severely injured, Terry went up to the other guy, the apparent victor, and said, hey, I saw you get cut. I saw his blade hit you. Why aren't you bleeding? And so they took off his Levi jacket and they pulled up his t-shirt. And underneath, he had red wheels and weeping lacerations where the other man's knife had cut through the Levi jacket, cut through the t-shirt, but just barely scored the skin. You see, the apparent victor in the knife fight had a razor sharp knife. When he cut his opponent, his knife bit through the jacket, bit through the t-shirt, and went deep into the flesh and did a lot of damage. His opponent's knife was dull. The man that lost the knife fight, he used his knife every day around the slaughterhouse. Uh, he cut things with it, he cut twine, he cut paper, he used it constantly. When he pulled it out to fight with, it wasn't razor sharp and it wasn't very effective. Now, there's two morals to this story. One, don't get in a knife fight. And the second one is, if you do, make sure your knife is razor, razor sharp. Carry a dedicated knife. If you're going to carry a knife for self-defense, carry one to defend yourself with and one for utility and chores. Let's talk about the training equipment you're going to need to acquire to train with a partner in knife fighting. The first thing I think you're going to need is to make some foam and PVC pipe trainers. This is what we use the most to practice knife fighting. It's a piece of PVC pipe covered in furnace foam and wrapped with duct tape. What you do is you cut your PVC pipe, then you get fiber reinforced packing tape. You run that lengthwise, then you wind it up diagonally forward, back, and forward again. So you're going to wind that um, reinforcing tape up and down the PVC pipe a couple times to make it really strong and keep that PVC pipe from breaking at any time because you can hit pretty darn hard with these things. Then you're going to slip some uh, furnace foam uh, that comes in tubes over that PVC pipe. You're going to pad the tip and you're going to tape that in place and then you're going to cover the whole thing in duct tape. You can pad the butt and the stabbing tip or you can just leave the butt and just put the padding on the tip. Now what we usually do on the stabbing side is we use a different color tape, usually red, so that we know that's the side that's padded that's going to go to your, against your opponent's body when you stab him. These things sting. They hurt. But we've been using them since 1983 and I've yet to break a bone hitting somebody with these padded foam PVC pipe trainers. Uh, there's no doubt when you hit somebody uh, that you actually cut them or stab them. They leave enough pain on that individual. If they're intellectually honest at all, they're going to recognize the fact that they got cut. The disadvantage of these trainers is that they don't give you a uh, constant edge orientation because they're round and you don't really know where the edge is. So what you do is you pretend the edge is always in line with these knuckles right here. Does everybody see that? So all, all you do is pretend the edge is right there. So when you cut somebody, you orientate your trainer like that. So it's always lining up with those knuckles. Obviously, it would be better to train with something like this. This is a rubber trainer, and you can clearly see and feel where the edges are. But we really like these trainers. If you're wearing eye protection and hand protection, you can train very safely. You can hit somebody literally as hard as you want or stab them as hard as you want. Yes, you're going to lose, leave some bruises. If I stab you with this thing, I'm going to bruise you. If I hit you with this thing, I'm going to leave a big red welt if I hit you hard. But in three days, it'll be gone. 
Um, when you're using all plastic or all wood knives, if I do the same thing, I'll break ribs and I'll break bones. So these are really a safe way to spar. I really suggest that you always wear hockey gloves when you're sparring. We're gonna get to sparring later in this presentation, but hockey gloves give you tremendous protection for your hands and wrists. Your thumbs and your fingers are well protected. You also are gonna need some leather gloves. Uh, I usually wear a hockey glove on my knife hand and a leather glove on my live hand, and we're gonna explain what your live hand is later. But a pair of leather gloves will give you a lot of protection when you're just fighting with these foam and PVC pipe trainers. They'll take the hardest blow and just pat it just enough, that impact just enough to so where you don't get a broken bone. It'll hurt, and you're gonna say more than ouch probably, but you're not gonna probably end up with a broken bone. You can use harder trainers too. You can go to a, a rubber trainer like we made here. These type of training knives are really good for uh, practice disarming and for solo drills and forms and stuff like that. Uh, you can use them in slow motion sparring when you're going at like quarter speed and you constantly want to practice your edge and point orientation. I mean, they bend and they're, they're softer than a wooden or plastic knife, but if I hit you just right with this thing, I can crack your ribs and I can do some internal damage. And that's gonna bend over, but if I hit you just right, uh, you're not gonna like it very well. They're a little bit uh, up on the force continuum from a PVC pipe and foam trainer. If I wanted to, and I see a clear opening at your hand, it's possible I can break your fingers with something like this. So for full out sparring, I don't really recommend it. Going up to something even more dangerous, you have a fixed blade knife like this, like this Trailmaster. We've taken the point and the edge off. This is really good for solo training. You need to get used to using a knife in your practice that's identical to the one that you're gonna carry. Uh, I have a bunch of these. I have one uh, in my living room uh, where I sit and watch TV. I have one at my desk. I have one in uh, my car. I've always got a couple of these around, so anytime I get a chance, I get to practice with them. This is the knife um, that I usually fight with, and this is the one I practice with the most. These are really good for, like I said, for solo training. You don't really want to spar with these things because I can easily break bones and damage internal organs with this. If I hit you in the arm with this, and there's no edge on this thing, but I'll break your arm. If I go like that on your fingers, I'll bust your fingers. So. This is more for solo practice and to get you used to handling a weapon that's identical to the one you carry. You always wanna take the edge and point off these, but you wanna treat them when you're practicing as if the edge and point were really there. We have these, I use a Taipan the same way, and it's um, a terrific training tool, like I said, for solo practice. And I usually use a Gurkha Kukri also, because this is another one of my favorite big fighting knives. You can go down and do the same thing with a folding knife. This is a five inch Voyager. I've taken the edge and point off. And since I often carry a five and six inch Voyager, I have a lot of uh, these also made up with no edges and points. Again, I don't recommend this for solo, I mean for um, training with a partner. Um, I see a lot of companies selling these. We don't sell these and there's a reason why. A lot of people will go and practice with a partner like this and with just a moment's inattention, somebody can be blinded for life. You stick somebody in the eye with this thing and you're going to really hurt their vision. If I stick you in the throat with this thing, you may never talk the same. Uh, the same thing with the edge. I've taken the edge off this, but if I do that on your fingers, I'm gonna cut your fingers to the bone. You take that edge off, but it's still thin, and when I apply that force, it's gonna either bust your fingers or split them wide open. Um, you can make your foam trainers just to digress in different sizes. This small um, foam trainer here, we made up to duplicate a four inch Voyager. It's almost exactly the same length. Let's see if everybody can see that, maybe against my jacket, or I'll hold them out here to the side and you can see that the sizes are almost exactly the same. These are really good to learn to practice against a bigger knife with. If you're gonna carry a tactical folder, you better practice with a tactical phone trainer. Don't think that you're gonna spend all your time practicing with this big foam knife and be able to pull it off in a knife fight 
with the little one. You've got to get used to this little one. What I do is I usually fight one or two rounds with the um, tactical uh, um, trainer every time I spar. Lots of times I'll use it in my left hand too to get used to using both hands ambidextrously. It's a lot harder to use uh, a, a small knife than a bigger one, but you need that practice. So when you make up your training knives, you remember you make one for your full size fighting knife and then you make one the same size as the tactical folding knife that you carry so that you're practicing intellectually honest. You're being uh, realistic in your training and you're not kidding yourself. Now, as I touched on earlier, safety is super important. When you're doing um, knife training and knife sparring, the only way you're really going to get badly hurt, I'm, I'm not talking about breaking your fingers or a bruise here and there and a lump on your arm where you got smacked hard or something, is your vision. If you get this in the eye, and that's one of the reasons why we make these so big, so that you have a little bit more protection, your eye socket can, has a good chance to pick up some of this if somebody gets in in the eye, but you don't want to get this thing stabbed into your eye when you're training. If you're wearing a three weapons rated fencing mask, this wire is so strong and so stiff, you're never going to be able to drive any of your training knives through this wire and injure your vision. So it's really important that you always wear a training mask or a Filipino stick fighting mask. Again, you've got a real heavy wire cage that you're going to protect your eyes really well. Um, a lot of people wear goggles. You can wear goggles when you're doing that and they'll do a good job to protect your eyes. Remember to fit them really tight to your face. I don't like them though because if, if I'm fighting people with just goggles, I'm going to bust their lips, I'm going to break their nose, I'm going to knock their ears off. It doesn't give that much protection. If I whop you in the side of the face and you got goggles on, your ears going to uh, balloon up like a football. That is going to jack you up. That's not going to feel good on the side of your ear and on your mouth. So I really recommend that when you're doing full-on sparring, you go ahead and you use the safety of a three weapons uh, rated fencing mask. There are six common ways to grip a fighting knife. Let's start our discussion today with the saber grip. To execute the saber grip, pick up your fighting knife, put it in your palm, kind of diagonally like this. So I have that situated in my palm. Curl your fingers around it. You're going to grip, grip a little tighter with these three fingers right here. This one's going to have a little bit of pressure on the knife handle, but not much. And your thumb is going to go right here on the top of the handle, just like that. So that's your basic saber grip. I'll show it again. You put it in your palm like that, slightly at an angle. These three fingers, the last three fingers are going to be doing most of the gripping. A little pressure from your index finger and your thumb. Your thumb is going to go just behind the guard on the top of the handle. The advantage of this grip is it gives you quite a bit of reach and thrusting and slashing. So it gives you good reach and it's a, it has fair security in your hand. You can hold on to it pretty good, but it's real long suit is the fact that you can reach. When I lunge, uh, quite often I use a saber grip to give me the most reach to my opponent. So it's a good grip. The only thing I don't like about it is it's not as secure as it could be. Because the thumb doesn't lock across the fingers like this, the thumb's on top of the handle and there's a gap right here. When your opponent comes in and he hits your blade, beats your blade with his knife hand or with his blade itself, he can knock the knife right out of your hand because of this gap. Your fingers and thumb aren't locked together like this. There's a gap right here and that makes that grip a little precarious when your opponent beats it or hits it. It's easier to knock your knife out of your hand. The other thing I don't like about it is your thumb is forward. It's pretty far forward and the thumb is a big target in knife fight. So your, thumb, your thumb rather is kind of exposed there and it's easier for your opponent to get at it. You lose your thumb in a knife fight and you're going to be Four Fingers Woo. Now Four Fingers Woo was a character in a James Clavell novel called um, Noble House. And in that 
he's um, uh, this no uh, um, four fingers Wu. He's a triad gangster, and he has a whole fleet of junks, and he's quite a character, but he lost his thumb in a knife fight in his uh, uh, younger days, and ever after he was known as Four Fingers Wu. So if you don't want to be Four Fingers Wu, you always have to remember that your thumb is exposed when you're using the saber grip. But it's a grip that you should put in your arsenal because you're going to use it. Quite often you're going to switch to a saber grip from another grip. Now, a variation on the saber grip is a quarter saber grip. It's the same thing. You take your knife, you put it in diagonally like this. Instead of putting your thumb on the top of the handle like this, you just move it over here to the side. Now, the quarter saber grip is a holdover from um, saber fencing, uh, particularly in the 17 and 1800s when uh, men fought on horseback a lot and they used a heavy saber. They'd quite often have a loop right here behind their guard, and the thumb would go through that loop. And that loop was there to uh, allow the thumb to get extra power and purchase to pull the heavy saber through the stroke and also to recover the saber. So they'd stroke down and they might come back. They'd cut this way and this way and this way and this way and it gave a lot of control over that heavy saber. But for knife fighting, I don't see it's that useful because it, doesn't, it, it still does give you reach but it doesn't lock your thumb over. So I don't see it has any real advantage over the regular saber grip, but you can still use it because it gives you lots of reach out here, but it compromises your grip. Again, the thumb isn't locked over the fingers. Let's go to a grip that we uh, use a lot. I call this the forward grip. In the forward grip, you put the knife in your palm diagonally like this, but this time, your thumb locks across your fingers. Some people call this a hammer grip or a hatchet grip. The long suit of this grip is it has tremendous power. You can really exert maximum force when you're cutting with this. You can exert maximum force when you're stabbing. You can stab forehand or backhand, especially in hooking blows. You can stab with a rising blow like this or a descending blow like that. It gives you a lot of strength. The big disadvantage of it is it compromises your reach. When you're in a forward or hammer grip, if you will, you're giving up maybe three inches of reach over a saber grip. See how my blade turns from this to this. You're giving up reach with this. That's the big disadvantage of it. But it allows very powerful stabbing and slashing and cutting and chopping attacks, and you're going to use it a lot in knife fighting. The next grip I want to talk about is the reverse grip. And the reverse grip is very similar to the hammer or forward grip, except this time, instead of the blade projecting out of the thumb side of your hand, it's going to project out of the pinky or little finger side of your hand, just like this. You're going to put it in your palm like that, you're going to curl your fingers around that, and you're going to lock your finger, or your thumb rather, over your fingers, just like that. Can everybody see that? Now, the big advantage to the reverse grip is power. When I'm holding this knife in a reverse grip, I've got a locked straight wrist, so I can bring all my power to bear. Any other grip, you've got a bent wrist, so you're never going to be able to deliver as powerful a blow with uh, any other grip style, except with possibly a push dagger, except, uh, except for the reverse grip. The reverse grip is the strongest way to hold the knife and deliver very powerful uh, cutting and stabbing attacks. When you have your knife in the reverse grip, I'll have Ron come out here. And for his safety and comfort, I'm going to switch to a rubber trainer. Let's step over here, Ron. When I've got my knife in the reverse grip like this, and I see an opening, I can stab right through his chest. A blow like that will split the ribs and go right into his chest cavity. From the back, let's switch here. Hope everybody can see. Here we have the lungs on either side of the backbone. From the back, bang, I can go right through the shoulder blades through the ribs and on into the chest cavity. But the big disadvantage of the reverse grip is it doesn't have reach. It has less reach than even the forward or uh, hammer or hatchet grip. You give up a whole lot of reach in the reverse grip. You see, the blade is sticking out the bottom of your hand. So instead of sticking out this way, where you can keep your whole blade in front of your hand, your blade's behind your hand. So you're giving up almost the whole blade length when you uh, hold your knife in the reverse grip. 
It also makes your hand, come in here, Ron. I'll give you a, a trainer here. Let's come over here so people can see. Hold that knife in the reverse grip and stick it out in front here like this. When he comes on guard like that, I can come to his, his hand this way, this way, or this way. His, I don't have to go through his knife. When he switches and holds this in a saber grip like that, I have to get past this blade to get to his hand. Now switch to reverse grip. From here, I can come this way, or here, or here. So it's very easy to come in here and slash his hand. I don't have to go through the blade. I can come in the top and cut his thumb off. I can come over here and just smash his fingers, smash the back of his hand very easily with that reverse grip. Also, because of its lack of reach, it's hard for him to defend. If I stab at his face, it's a long ways up for him to defend his face. If I attack this side of his body, it's a long ways over for him to intercept that. But here's where you use this. When Ron has his knife on guard, and I can get in here, and I cut that out of his hand. Now I pin his hand. I may switch to the reverse grip right now for power. I can drive that right, right through his rib cage down into his chest cavity. I can drive that right through all the way to the other side of his abdomen. I can drive that right through his thigh. I can drive that right through his groin. I can drive that right through his head. So it gives you a tremendous amount of power, um, but no reach. So there's a moment in time that you use it. Now, I want to be fair to all the people that like reverse grips. There's some other things it does fairly well. Because it's a power grip, it gives you power. It also has some pretty good cutting applications. Uh, have Ron um, get that uh, tie pan. It allows me a very powerful forehand cutting hack this way, horizontal, across this way. I've got that. That's pretty powerful. It allows me a rising diagonal cut. That's pretty powerful. It allows me a diagonal downward cutting attack this way. It's quite powerful. It allows me a rising cut this way. Pretty powerful. And straight down the same way. But all of my backhand motions are weak. See when I go to cut him backhand? Let's see if the camera can get this. Forehand, it's easy to get the blade on him. Backhand, I have to really turn and articulate my wrist to make contact with the edge. This one is powerful. This one is awkward and weak. So I really don't like backhand strokes with the reverse grip. That's a real disadvantage of it. The other advantage of a reverse grip is that it helps you in hooking motions. If Ron cuts number one, I can hook his arm, pin his elbow, step behind him here, and kill him the whole time. I can drive in very powerfully with those stabbing attacks. So it allows me to hook, cut backhand, it allows me to hook and kill him. So it has some close quarter applications. We don't want to fight at close quarters, but sometimes we do when we switch to the reverse grip. A lot, mostly when I cut his knife hand out of his hand, he drops the knife, and maybe I cut this, and I stab him here, and I switch for the kill. That's where you use the reverse grip. The next grip I want to talk about, thank you, Ron, is very similar to the saber grip. We put the knife diagonally in our palm like this, we wrap our fingers like that, and we put our thumb on the top of the handle. I particularly like this grip on folding knives because it puts my thumb out here on the, the top of the handle and it allows me to extend it out here on the blade like this. I also like it on, on this knife too because I can get my thumb right here on the back of the blade and really direct that edge. I'll call Ron in here again. Let's switch places. Come over here where maybe the camera can see us. Ron, when he cuts number one, I can come in here and stop his knife hand. See this? Got my thumb right here. Right from here, I can press in with a whole lot of pressure and control and pull that edge very, very accurately through the target with a lot of pressure. Gives me a terrific press cut. Any of this stuff in here. Now this doesn't feel that great even with the trainer. You can imagine what it's going to feel like with a real live blade. So the thumb reinforced grip gives you tremendous control over the edge. It's something you want to have in your arsenal and it's really useful when you're using a folder where you don't have a lot of weight and you need to, like, you need to get all the power and all the accuracy and harness everything you can into that cutting stroke. Putting your thumb here on the back of the blade like that can really help you. Now, thanks Ron. The disadvantage of the palm, uh, or rather the, the thumb reinforced grip, 
is that, again, your thumb is exposed. It's probably even more exposed than it is in the saber grip. It's really flat out, straightened out like that, well ahead of the rest of the finger. So you have to keep that in mind that your thumb is vulnerable there. But it's a good thing to know how to do. It's a good grip to have in your arsenal. The last grip I want to talk about is the palm reinforced grip. Palm reinforced grip, to execute it, you put it dangling in your palm like this. Except this time we're going to shorten it. We're going to put the butt right here in the middle of our palm. And our fingers are going to wrap around the handle to control the point in the edge. Now the long suit of this grip is again on the thrust. When I'm lunging thrusting attack, it gives me maximum amount of reach. So the long suit or the main advantage of the palm reinforced grip is it gives you the maximum amount of reach that you can get with a, your fighting knife. The drawback or disadvantage is again your integrity of your grip is compromised. Your fingers aren't wrapped all the way around the handle like that and your thumb isn't locked over your fingers. So when you have your knife in a palm reinforced grip it's easier to have the knife knocked out of your uh, hand. This is a type of grip that you're going to switch to quite often in a knife fight. You may be in a forward or hammer or hatchet grip if you will and you may be cutting and fighting here and you see your opening, you're going to switch to a palm reinforced grip and thrust. And you're going to do it without thinking because you're going to practice the transitions from one grip to another. And we're going to show you how to do that uh, later. It has um, a lot of advantages. I like the palm reinforced grip because it gives you the reach. And it also, it's an excellent way to use a knife for thrusting when you don't have a guard on your knife. If there's no quillions here or no guard, you can use the kitchen boning knife and a thrusting attack by just putting the butt like this in your palm. Hope everybody can see that. And just controlling the handle with your fingers like that. And what happens is when you make impact, the butt of the knife goes into your palm and keeps your fingers from going forward. There's no way that your hand can go forward onto the edge even when you don't have a guard when your knife's held in a palm reinforced grip. So it's a good way to um, wield the knife when you don't have a guard too. Now you want to practice switching your grip too. Like I said, you can go from the uh, hatchet or forward grip to the saber grip to the palm reinforced grip to the reverse grip. Now when you get to the reverse grip, quite often you're going to cap the end of it with your thumb, especially when your knife doesn't have a guard. We have double quillions here and they'll keep your hand from sliding down onto the blade. But when you don't have a guard or quillions on your knife, it's a really good idea to cap the pommel or butt with your thumb. And when you hit something hard, your thumb will stop your hand from sliding down onto the blade. So you also need to practice switching your grip from a forward grip to a saber grip to a palm reinforced grip to a thumb reinforced grip back and forward all the time until you get really, really comfortable switching grips. This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.
In this volume, we're going to concentrate on footwork. The first thing I'm going to teach you is our basic on-guard fighting stance. Then I'm going to cover the mistakes a lot of people make when they try to assume this stance. And then we're going to go into actual footwork drills and techniques that will help develop you into a superior knife fighter. Remember, there are no great knife fighters that don't have great footwork. So you need to pay very careful attention to this tape and practice these techniques diligently. All right, let's get to the gym and start training. To assume our basic fighting knife uh, stance or posture, what I want you to do is to stand like this with your feet about shoulders distance apart in a pretty wide area so you have room to move. Now what I want you to do is, what I want you to do is I want you to think that you're in the middle of a giant clock. 12 o'clock is directly in front of you. 6 o'clock is directly to your rear. 3 o'clock is directly to your right. And 9 o'clock is directly to your left. Next, I want you to take one step forward if you're right-handed with your right leg. You're going to reverse this if you're left-handed. So you can take one step forward. Now, not a long step, just an average one medium step forward. Now what I want you to do is I want you to turn and look at 11 o'clock on your giant clock. And I want you to turn your feet so your toes are both uh, pointing at 11 o'clock. Both to toes pointing at 11 o'clock. Now what I want you to do is I want you to lift your heel on your rear leg. If you're right-handed, that's your left leg. I want you to lift your heel about two inches off the ground. I want it off high. And I want you to exaggerate that because this is going to be your spring. By picking your heel up, you can make your uh, rear leg spring-like. So we're, it's really important that you constantly do this when you're assuming this stance. We want to see that heel up. Next, I want you to take your left shoulder and pull it back like this. What that's going to do is going to narrow the target that you present to your opposing enemy. You're going to narrow your target by pulling your shoulder back. Now, I want you to raise your knife hand up until the point of your knife is pointed, pointed at your opponent's eyes. Your arm shouldn't be entirely straight like that. There should be a slight bend in your arm, just like that. Now, I want you to take your left hand and bring it over here and put it on your left pec. I want you to pin your elbow to your side like that, OK? Next, I want you to bend both knees slightly. Your knees should have a slight flex in them. Your knife should be pointed at your opponent's face, at his eyes. Your left hand, we call this the live hand, should be on your left pec. Your left elbow should be pinned in. Make sure your shoulders turn back like this to present a narrow opening. Now, your head should be upright, it shouldn't be crouched, and your head shouldn't be forward. Try to stay as upright as you can and keep that shoulder pat, uh, pulled back to narrow the target. Now, I want you to, to make sure that you don't let your alive hand creep over here to the middle of your chest or to your right pec because it'll be of less use over there than it will here. When it's on your left pec, you can use it to cross with, you can use it to hook with, you can use it to shovel hook with, you can use it to uppercut with, you can throw an overhand right with it, you can really make it work for you. And you can also use it defensively, which we'll teach later. But when it's over here, all you can do is backhand slap or backhand chop. It limits your offense when you put it all the way over here. So I don't want it on your right pec. I want it here on your left pec. So what you're going to do is you're going to settle in here again. Your feet are at 11 o'clock. Your shoulders pull back to narrow the target. Your left hand's on your left pec. Your elbow's pinned. Your right elbow's pinned into your side, your knife pointed at your opponent, and you're upright and your knees are bent. This is our basic on-guard fighting stance. While you're practicing adopting our fighting stance, I want you to be aware of some common faults that many students uh, make or mistakes they make when they assume this stance. One of the most common uh, faults or mistakes is when people come on guard and they get in their fighting stance, instead of pulling their shoulder back, they tend to stand too square like this, presenting a wide profile to their opponent's blade. What you do when you stand square is you expose this flank, and we're going to go into detail later about that. But I want you to really be aware of, and look in a mirror. A mirror is a fabulous training tool. Look in the mirror and make sure that you've pulled your left shoulder back, and you've got your knife in the right position, your elbows are tucked in, OK? Another um, mistake that I see a lot of people make is when they assume this stance, they crouch. They bend forward like this, they drop their head. Some people even bring up their live hand. 
Uh, and a lot of people even come up higher with their knife like this. So when I'm like this and I'm boxing, this is a good defensive posture. But it doesn't really work with a knife fight because what you're doing is you're giving your opponent your face. Your knife is really close to your face. Instead of in your on guard fighting stance when your knife's here, your opponent's blade has to go a long ways before it gets to your face. It's a long time for you to intercept his knife. But when you crouch and you pull your knife up like this, your face is just inches from your knife. You've got just a moment of reaction time before that blade hits your face. So I don't want you to crouch. The other mistake I see is that when people step forward, they don't step one step distance or one shoulder's distance between their feet. They get too wide. You don't want your feet more than shoulders distance apart because it starts to affect your balance and it also tends to make you square immediately to your opponent. When I'm standing here like this, I'm wide, my balance is affected, it's not optimal, and I'm exposing my flank here. So I don't want you to do that. The other common mistake is when they step forward on guard into the fighting posture, they get too narrow. Their feet are less than a shoulder's distance apart. This really makes you wobbly. You don't want to be like that either. Really, truly, shoulders distance apart is about optimal for most people. You don't want to be too wide, and you don't want to be too narrow in your stance. The other thing you don't want is you don't want your, your stance to be too long. You only take one normal step forward and turn your feet to 11 o'clock, pull your shoulder back to narrow your body, okay? Don't take a long step because then, again, you're wobbling around here. You can't move forward, backwards, to the side as um, adroitly as you could if you had a slightly shorter stance, a more correct stance. So don't make your stance too long. The opposite of that is to make your stance too short. Instead of taking a normal step forward, you take more of a baby step forward like this. And you turn like that. Now, again, we're wobbling all over the place. We're not in optimal balance position. So you don't want your legs to be um, too narrow. You don't want them too close together either or too short. Another mistake that I see people make is they let this alive hand drift out away from their body. When you come on guard, turn your feet to 11 o'clock, pull the shoulder back, pin your left elbow in, pin your hand here, your knife hand comes up, the point's at your opponent's face, you're standing up right, your knees are slightly bent. Don't let this alive hand start drifting out like this. You can let it rest on your pack or hover an inch or so off your left peck. But don't let your hand turn out like this. Don't let your arm drift out. Don't let your elbow drift out. Keep that in tight because this is a prime target for an experienced knife fighter. I mean, he'll pick this off in a heartbeat if he sees this drift away from your body. When you keep it in close to your body, he has to reach in really deep in front of your knife. His blade's got to come all this way in to attack your hand. But when you turn it out like this, you give him five or six inches easy that he doesn't have to go as far to get to cut your fingers off. He cuts one of those fingers off, you're in a lot of trouble. So you want to keep that pinned in uh, tight and don't give him an easy target. The other thing I want you to do, and I see is people as they, they flop their knife all over the place. You want to keep your knife when you're in your basic fighting stance, especially as a beginning fighter, in what we call a window of movement. We want it in between your hips, between your shoulders. So it's right in here. It describes this window of movement. Your knife is constantly in motion inside this window, but don't let it drift too high and don't let it drift too low. Keep it above your waist and below your chin, right in this window of movement. Don't let it come out to either side like that. That'll leave you unprotected. If your knife's over here, you can't defend this flank. If it's over here, you can't defend this part of your body. If it's too high, you can't defend your legs. And if it's too low, you can't get it up in time to defend your face. So you want to keep it right in this window of movement. Now, for training purposes, we're going to pretty much hold it still to begin with so we can concentrate on our footwork. But you want to keep in mind that when you're actually fighting, your knife hand is always in motion. OK? Stand upright. And don't let this drift out. One of the major truths about knife fighting is this. There are no superior knife fighters who don't possess superior footwork. You need superior footwork if you're going to be a successful knife fighter. You see, footwork for knife fighting is different than any other sport. In other sports, quite often you need to bring power to accomplish your goal. In knife fighting, you don't. If I'm boxing and I want to throw a cross, I've got to dig in with my rear foot. This foot's going to dig in, I'm going to sink my body weight, and I'm going to throw that cross.
Okay? In knife fighting, all I have to do is snap my wrist to destroy my opponent's life forever. All I have to do is bring my body in range, and I don't care how, how you get there, it has to go really quickly on balance and drop that knife down. I don't have to bring power though. That's the big difference in knife fighting footwork versus any other sport or any other combat is the blade does the work for you. You don't need muscle, you don't need power, you don't need weight. All you need is speed and, and some balance. So your footwork is really important. It has to be smooth, it has to be adroit, it has to be clever. It can't be slow or ponderous. And you really, really need to develop this aspect if you're going to be a good knife fighter. You have to have good footwork. So we're going to start right now on working on developing your footwork so that you can be a superior knife fighter too. The first thing I want to do in teaching you footwork is to teach you how to move forward and backwards. What I'd like you to do is get in front of a big mirror if you can. Start with your feet shoulders distance apart and assume our basic on guard fighting stance, okay? Your feet are shoulders distance apart, your knees are slightly flexed, your palm is on your left pec, you're gonna pull your shoulder back, your knife's pointed at your opponent, your elbows are pinned in, your knees are slightly flexed, and your heels off the ground. You're in a good fighting stance. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to use your rear leg, that's your left leg for you right-handed people, uh, that's gonna be your spring. You're gonna push off, take a step, and recover. Push off, take a step, and recover. Push off, take a step and recover. Now, to go to the rear, we're gonna reverse things. Now our front leg is gonna be the spring. We're gonna push off with our front leg, reach back and recover. Push off, reach back and recover. Push off, reach back and recover. Push off, reach back and recover. To go forward, you're gonna push off with your rear leg, take a step and recover. Push off, take a step and recover. Push off, take a step and recover. Push off, take a step and recover. Let's go one more time to the rear. Push off with your front leg. Take a step and recover. Push off, take a step and recover. Now, look in the mirror. Are your feet shoulders distance apart? Are they too wide? Are they too long? Are they too short? Are they too narrow? Are you over teetering like this? It's really easy when you're moving to come out of your basic fighting stance, especially when you stop movement. As I move forward and I move back, when I come down and stop moving, I want to be in a good fighting position. I want to be able to attack or defend instantly. I want to end up on balance. That's why I'm going to keep stressing correcting your, your fighting posture, your fighting stance, so that you're always in a perfect position to respond to your opponent. Now, as we go through this tape, I'm not going to bore you with endless repetitions of footwork, but that doesn't mean you don't have to do them endlessly. I can't tell you how many thousands of hours in the last 23 years I've been practicing knife fighting I've spent on footwork drills. You're going to have to practice until these are second nature, but we're not going to spend all of our time in this presentation just working on one or two drills. Sometimes you're going to need to move forward or backwards in a hurry. What we call this in our knife fighting footwork is a rapid advance or a rapid retreat. To execute these footwork movements, what I want you to do is come on guard. Now what I want you to do is with your left, uh, left foot or rear foot, take a step forward and just continue like this and come down on guard. To go backwards, you're going to take your front leg and move it back like this. And when you stop, you always want to come on guard. Always stop with your knife hand in front. You always want to keep your body behind your knife and you always want to end up in a good fighting stance. Now, when you start to advance rapidly, and we're going to go a little bit slow here, I want you to remember that you may have to attack or defend at any moment in time as you're moving forward. The same thing when you're going rapidly to the rear. You may have to defend or attack any time as you're moving backwards. So you got to keep that in mind. You don't want to disturb your balance. You want to keep on balance as much as you possibly can when you're moving rapidly forward and to the rear. You need to practice in this in the mirror hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times because quite often you'll take your opponent at a moment in time and cut him or stab him by this rapid advance. Being able to quickly come forward and attack someone or quickly get out of the way and come down on balance will serve you in good stead as a knife fighter. I don't care what kind of fighting you're practicing. I don't care if it's boxing, I don't care if it's wrestling, I don't care if you're using a saber or a stick or an epee 
or a walking stick. I don't care if it's using a knife or a butcher's cleaver. You have to learn to move to the side. You have to learn to move laterally. And you can't stand rooted like a tree and fight like this. You're going to have to learn to move laterally. It's super important in knife fighting. And we want you to really uh, take some time and practice learning how to move to the side. Here's how we're going to teach it. What I want you to do is step forward, assume your basic knife fighting stance. Okay? Look in the mirror. Get a good stance going. Okay? Now, the key to moving laterally correctly is always to move the foot closest to the direction you want to go. If you want to go to the right, your right foot moves first. If you want to go to the left, your left foot or rear foot moves first. Whatever direction you want to go, that's the leg that's closest to it. That's the one that's going to move first. You have to discipline to do yourself to do this. And don't do stuff like this and get crossed up. That'll, that'll really hurt you in the end, and we're going to go into more about that in a minute. So get in a good knife fighting stance. Now what I want you to do is push off with your rear leg, and you're going to take a step to the side and recover. Take another step and recover. Take another step and recover. Now, to move your left, you're going to do the same thing. Take a step and recover. Take a step and recover. Take a step and recover. Now look down. Are you in a good knife fighting posture? Are your toes pointed at 11 o'clock? Is your left hand on your left pec? Are your elbows pinned in? Is this shoulder pulled back? Don't let it push forward a little bit like I had mine right there. Pull it back. Keep, get that target narrow to your opponent, okay? We're going to move to the left again. Take a step and recover. Take a step and recover. Now, don't get too narrow. I'm exaggerating there. Don't let your feet get like this. Don't get them too long. Don't get them too short. Don't let them too wide and stand here square to your opponent. I want you in a good knife fighting stance. We're going to move to the right again. Step and recover. Step and recover. Step and recover. Step and recover. Go to the left. Step and recover. Step and recover. Step and recover. Step and recover. That's how you basically move laterally. The key is to move the foot closest to the direction you want to go and to stay as much as possible in your correct knife fighting stance so that when you stop motion, you're on balance, ready to move, ready to attack, ready to defend. Quite often, taking one lateral step or one sideways step won't get you out of trouble. When you're fighting and you take one step, sometimes it's not enough. Your opponent can still reach you. My friend, Dr. G, he's both my friend and mentor, taught me a long time ago that when you move laterally away from an opponent that's attacking you, quite often what happens is when you move to the side, he cuts and you move and he misses. But then he leans and he backhand cuts and he catches you because you only took one step. So what I want to do now is to teach you how to move laterally with two and three steps at a time. So what you're going to do is you're going to get in your basic fighting stance. Again, get in front of a mirror. That's the greatest training tool for footwork that you could possibly acquire. Get in front of a good mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror. Is your stance good? Now, what I want you to do is to take multiple steps to the side and come down in balance. Go to the other side and come down in balance. Let's try it again a little slower. One, two, three. One, two, three. Come down. Look at yourself. Look at your stance. Is it correct? Now, as we speed this up, here's what I've noticed in my training classes happens. As you move laterally with several steps, what happens is, look at me in the mirror here. I'm all tilting all around like this. As you take multiple steps laterally, what most people do is their stance tends to narrow. They get like this. This is how you end up. Every time you step, your feet get closer and closer together to when you stop, you're like this. You're too narrow. Here's a little trick to prevent that. As you move to the side, you take a normal step with your front leg. If you're going to the right, that's your right leg. I take a normal step and a half recovery step with your rear leg. Step, half. Step, half step. Step, half step. Come down, you're just about right. When you go to the left, you take a normal step to your left with your rear leg and about a half a step with your right leg and recover, just like that. Normal and half. Normal and half. Normal and half. Look down. You're just about right if you do that. This takes a little practice. So you need to get used to moving to the side laterally, quickly, and coming down in balance, on guard, ready to fight. Oftentimes when you're fighting at long range, you want to break contact with your opponent and take 
big steps laterally. You want to bring him out in a circle and draw him out so that as you make him move around you, he starts to lose his concentration and his defensive posture starts to break down and he starts to give you openings that you can penetrate with your offense. Uh, earlier, we showed you how to move laterally with one step and multiple steps. Now, I want to teach you how to move in big lateral motions where you're going to take up a lot of ground. Let's say that I want to make a half circle around my opponent. From my on guard fighting stance, I'm going to pull my right leg back till it's parallel with my left leg. Now I'm going to push off and I'm going to move like this around in a big circular fashion. Now, to come on guard, I can step forward and come on guard, or as I move in big motions laterally, I can come backwards and come on guard. When you come on guard this way, you're being more aggressive. As you move laterally this way and you pull back, you're being more passive. When you want to drive somebody off, you come on guard and move forward and threaten them. When you want to suck them in and lure them in, you're moving like this and come on guard and you move backwards like that and come on guard. And that will draw them in so you can get your own counterattack in. One of the ways to train big lateral movements or circular movements, if you will, is to buy some of these traffic cones. You can go to any of the box stores and you can find them there pretty cheap. I've got dozens of them that I use in my training and they're almost indestructible and they're really useful. You won't regret buying them. What I do is I set mine out about eight feet apart in this little square like this. To practice your big lateral motions, what I want you to do is to come on guard. If you can, set this up in front of a mirror, okay? Now remember to pull this front leg back till your feet are parallel, push off on your rear leg, and go around the cones. Now, what I don't want you to do as you're moving is to do this. Don't get your feet too close together. When you put your feet too close together like this, you could be knocked down and knocked out or knocked over, okay? What I want you to do as you're moving around is keep your feet shoulders distance apart as much as you can. Try to stand upright as much as you can. Don't get like this. In our training classes, I see everybody leaning like this. No, get upright and stay upright as you move around. Now when you want to stop, you just come on guard. To go the opposite way, you just reverse. You want to come on guard, come on guard. And just keep going. You want to come on guard and come to the rear? Pull your left foot back and come on guard. Practice that a lot. When you're fighting with a knife, one of the things I want you to be aware of is that your front leg is quite often a target. Particularly you tall guys, your front leg is really vulnerable to your opponent's knife. Um, when you have a, a longer, higher leg, it's easier for a shorter man to attack this leg without um, disturbing his balance or his posture very much. If there's a tall man in front of me, I can attack his leg by just squatting just a little bit and easily get to his leg. So what I want you to do is become very adept at the defense for attack on your front leg. We call that defense a front leg replacement. What you do is you come in your basic on guard fighting stance, okay? You imagine your opponent's in front of you and he's gonna cut this leg. What you're gonna do is remove it. And we call this a front leg replacement. When you see that cut coming at this leg, you pull this foot back, touch down, and recover. Pull it back, touch down, and recover. Now this is a light, deft motion. You're keeping most of your weight on your rear leg. You're just touching down. So you pull it back, get it out of the way, and recover. Pull it back, and recover. Pull it back, touch down, and recover. Now, here's some of the faults that I commonly see when I'm teaching this. The worst one, and the most grievous, is this. When a people pull their leg back, they go like this. They rock. And their front leg goes behind their rear leg. They rock like this. That will never go in a knife fight. You'll never get your leg out of the way in time if you react that way to a cut at your leg. It has to come straight back. It has to be very quick and very light, just like this. Light, deft motion. Let's look at it from this angle. 
When you see that opponent cut at you, you pull your leg back and touch down. Pull it back and touch down, touch down, touch down. Just like that. One of the strategies we use in our long range knife fighting program is to use our footwork to take an opponent at that moment in time, in that place in time, with our knife when he doesn't expect it. In other words, we intercept him at a moment where he thinks he's safe. One of the footwork techniques I'm going to teach you next is called the lunge. I borrowed this from Western Fencing. It's used both in a pay, uh, in foil, and in saber. Uh, probably everybody um, does it a little bit different. I'm going to teach you a very deep, long lunge because our weapon is short. I don't have a 32 inch long um, 1796 light cavalry saber, which is my preferred saber. I don't have that. I've got a 14 and a half inch overall long fighting knife. That's not a lot of reach, so I want to make that reach up with my lunge. To use the lunge properly, you'll take your opponent at a distance where he feels safe. For just a brief moment at time, he may be resting there, he may be thinking there, he may be moving, but you're going to stab him at a distance that he thinks he's safe at. Now, a lunge is to be used judiciously. You just don't use it at any whim. You've got to have some thought and planning in it because when you lunge, you're in a precarious position momentarily. You're very committed, you've got a lot of weight forward and it's hard to recover from. I'm going to demonstrate now how to do a lunge and you'll see what I mean. What I want you to do is start with your feet shoulders distance apart. Step forward and assume our basic fighting stance. All right, pull your shoulder back, get in good, look in the mirror, make sure your stance is right. Now, I want you to push off on your rear leg and take a big step forward with your front leg. You're gonna bend your front knee until it covers your toe. You're gonna pull your shoulder back. You're gonna turn it. You're gonna extend your hand. You're gonna probably switch to a palm reinforced grip or at least to a saber grip to get the most reach. Keep your chin over your knife looking straight ahead. Keep your live hand and this elbow pinned in tight. Don't let them pooch out. Don't let your butt pooch out. I'm exaggerating that. Keep your butt tucked in. Just like this. You want the maximum amount of reach that you can get. Okay? Now, to recover, you can push back off your front leg and come on guard, or you can bring up your rear leg and come on guard. When you Recover by pulling this leg back. It shows a little bit more passivity. When you recover by bringing up your back leg, it shows a little bit more aggression. Both require strength, so they're slow. When you make that lunge, you better make sure that you're gonna connect because you're gonna be vulnerable for uh, a few split seconds while you're making the recovery. So it has to be used very judiciously, but it can be very effective. Here's another view of the lunge from the side. Assume your on guard fighting stance, push off, take a big step, lean in, pull your shoulder back, and extend. Keep your head up. Don't your, turn your head to the side like this. Keep your head looking straight ahead, because you may have to defend from this position. As you recover, you may have to defend. So you have to have your face towards your opponent. Another way to attack your opponent at a long distance where he thinks he's safe at is with the fliché. I use the fliché quite often when I'm uh, fighting because it allows me to, to take up a lot of ground very quickly in one motion and score my opponent at a range where he thinks he's safe, where he thinks I can't touch him. And it differs a little bit from the lunge, and I'm going to demonstrate it now. It has a lot of advantages, but it shares the same disadvantages as the lunge in that it's a very committed motion. When you use this fliché, you better have a clear opening, a real opportunity that you're pretty certain is going to be effective when you initiate this movement because your recovery is slow. Come in your fighting stance. Now, this time you're going to take a big step forward with your rear leg. A big step forward. You're going to bend that front knee. You're going to pull this shoulder back. You're going to lean as far forward as you can and extend your knife arm in a palm reinforced grip. Just like that and you're gonna take up a lot of ground in one big step. To recover, you can push off on this leg and push all the way back and come on guard, or you can pull your rear leg up and come on guard. Either way. Again, when you go forward, you're showing aggression. When you're going back, you're being more passive. They both have advantages. Sometimes you may fliché just from outside of range. And as he thinks he, he's got something going on, he's going to step in, you can pull back and attack him. 
Void that space and cut into it. He thinks he senses an opportunity. There's lots of things you can play with with a lunge and fleche. Let's look at it from this angle. Gonna come on guard. Get a good guard position. Take a big step and extend. Don't look to the side. Don't let your face turn to the side. Don't let your butt pooch out. Keep your butt touch, tucked in tight and recover. One of the hardest things to learn how to do when you're practicing knife fighting footwork is to learn to move diagonally. But it's probably the most important thing that you can learn to do well. You see, when you're knife fighting, almost everything keys around diagonal footwork. Whether you're on offense or defense, you're going to have to move diagonally. You're never going to be able to be a pillar of salt and sit here and fight like this. You're always going to have to move diagonally. But it's a little harder to learn than anything else that I've showed you so far, so I want you to pay close attention, and I'm gonna go slow, and I'm gonna do the very best job I can to teach you how to move diagonally. It's super, super important, because almost everything you're going to do, you're going to, to use diagonal footwork. The first thing I wanna teach you is how to move diagonally to the right. The way we're gonna practice this is I've got some uh, strips of tape here on our training floor. They're about eight foot long, and they form a giant X. I'm gonna stand here in the middle of the X and I'm gonna pretend my opponent is directly in front of me, just like this. To move diagonally forward, that's the first thing I wanna teach you. You're gonna come in your fighting stance, okay? Uh, you right-handers, you have your right leg forward. You left-handers, you're gonna to have to reverse my instructions. So I'm gonna go slow so you can practice at home and reverse everything for your uh, left-handed lead, okay? So you're in your fighting stance. You see your opponent's incoming attack. It could be a straight stab at your abdomen. It could be an angling in machete chop. Doesn't make any difference. You're gonna go diagonally forward to the right to get away from it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna push off on your rear leg. You're gonna take a big step at a 45 degree angle. That gets you at angle of your opponent and you're gonna pivot around to face him. Let's try it again. You're on guard. You see that attack coming. You're going to Angle 45 degrees with a big step. Now, because our principle is get your knife in front of your body or your body behind your knife, you're going to pivot. This leg's gonna pull you around like that so that your knife is in front and you're still facing your opponent. Now, the point in time when you use this is quite often when you see a forehand blow coming from this side. The, the blow is coming this way and you're going to move away from it diagonally this way. It gives you more time to read that incoming attack and to respond to it. So when I see a motion coming at me this way, I'm gonna step away from it this way to get more time to react to it. I'm gonna have Ron come in and illustrate that. Ron's gonna stand here with his back to you. And as he cuts slow, cut one, I'm gonna step over here and get to the side. Let's go again, cut number one. I'm gonna step here. As I step, I intercept his attack, and I end up with my body behind my knife ready to fight. That's where you use that forward diagonal stepping. So for you right-handers, you're gonna push off, take a step, and you're gonna pivot around, you're gonna pull your body back around behind your knife and come on guard, okay. To go to our left, it's a little different. You see the attack coming from this side, it's coming at you this way, and you want to step over here. So our principle for movement is we always move the leg closest to the direction we want to go. So when I see that attack coming, I'm going to take a step with my left leg here, and I'm going to turn back into my opponent. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move forward diagonally with my first step. Now, watch, I make a little adjustment step here, and I turn back into my opponent where my body is behind my knife. Let's see it one more time. You're on guard. Pull that, pull that uh, shoulder back, get a good on guard position. You see that attack coming, you step here, and you turn back. That turn back is really important. In reality, what you're gonna do with, come here Ron, cut number two, is I'm gonna come here. As I see that cut coming in, and now I'm gonna come back and get behind my knife. So, there. As he cuts, and now I adjust to get my body behind my knife. That's how you use that diagonal stepping. Thanks, Ron. 
Now I want to show you how to move to the rear. You come on guard, get in your fighting stance. I want to move diagonally to my rear. Again, using our principle, moving the foot that's closest to the direction you want to go, I'm going to pull my right leg back this way with a good size step backwards. As I step back, I'm going to pull my leg around behind me like that. I'm going to pivot around to get my body behind my knife. Let's try it again. I'm going to step and pivot and come down on balance, ready to fight. Now in reality, you're going to deal with that attack as you step right in here. As you finish your movement, you're going to end up with your body behind your knife, ready to move. Let's go a little slower. These backward steps are harder, especially this one going to the right diagonally. It's hard to perfect. I've did it 100 and 100 and 100 and 100, hundreds of times and practicing on my own. So you step and you pivot. You step and you pivot behind and come on guard ready to fight. It's easier to move to your left. All you do here is you reach back with your left leg because it's closest to the direction you want to go and you take a little replacement step. So I reach back and I turn back into my opponent, get my body behind my knife, just like that. Another valuable footwork technique that I think should be in every knife fighter's arsenal of tricks is what I call the leaping cut. This is, should be in everybody's repertoire because it can be very effective. It has to be used judiciously. You can't use it repeatedly because someone will key to it and cut you when you're doing it. But when it's used correctly, it can be very effective. The best way to use the leap and cut is, and I'm going to demonstrate Ron come on guard, is what I'll do is I'll try to draw Ron's attention up. It's really useful when you see somebody tracking your knife hand. When you see them watching or keying on your knife hand, following your knife hand around, this is a really good technique to use because you can bring your knife this way. You bring your knife up. As you bring your knife up, you jump in, cut him, and jump out with your palm up just like that. So to execute the leap and cut, you raise him. Raise him with your body. Look how I, I kind of lift my whole body up, everything. It's a little accentuated. And as I see him react to that, I leap in, cut him, and leap out. Now, when you're down there underneath its knife, underneath his knife, it's pretty scary. So that when you do this, raise him, leap in. Now watch, keep your eyes up. As he descends, cut him. If he drops on you, be ready to turn your palm up and intercept his knife hand. That's the leap and cut. In my mind, one of the characteristics of a great knife fighter is his comfort and skill in moving backwards. There's many times in knife fighting that you have to move backwards very quickly. Nothing else will do in that particular moment. Moving to the side won't get you out of trouble. Your defense won't get you out of trouble. You have to move backwards. It's really important that we all get comfortable as knife fighters moving backwards. One of the things that I start each of my classes doing is just simply moving backwards. We'll come up to a mark on the training hall and we'll just move backwards like this. And then we'll just repeat it. Now, we have a pretty big training facility here. It's about 2,600 square feet, so we have a lot of room to move backwards. And what I'm walking on right now are cushioned uh, pads that, or tile squares that cover our entire training facility. And you can see patterns on these. And what I'll do is, with well, our class, is we'll actually form like a conga line. And the whole class will line up, and they'll follow me walking backwards. So this is a good drill that you can do at home, is just learn to walk backwards and get used to looking over your shoulder and using your peripheral um, vision to tell you when to make your turns. And try to make your turns neat and concise so that you can develop your skill and comfort and moving adroitly backwards. Okay, Lots of different ways that you can practice this. When you're going for your walk every day, try every 10 minutes to put in 200 steps moving backwards whenever possible. So every 10 minutes as you're walking, you want to spend 200 steps moving backwards. That'll give you a lot of invaluable practice and get you used to using your peripheral vision to help yourself as you move around. Another way to increase your skill in moving backwards 
is to get out your traffic cones that you bought and set them out in a square with one in the middle and just practice walking around and between those traffic cones. It's very easy to do, doesn't take much time, but it really help you in developing your coordination and adroitness at moving backwards. All you have to do is just move around the cones like this. And you can start out slow at first. And you make up the patterns as you go. And just move around them. As you get better, you want to cut in a little tighter to that cone and make that turn a little tighter. We're not going to spend all of the tape having you watch me work or walk backwards, but this is something that you can practice at home. It doesn't take a training partner, but it'll really help your ability as a knife fighter moving backwards. Another way to improve your skill as a knife fighter is to practice footwork drills at home. I call this solo practice. What you want you to do is to incorporate all the things that we've already taught you, all the different footwork methods we've taught you, incorporate that in your own solo practice. Here's a good way to start out. Here's how I usually start out. I'll come on guard and I'll look in the mirror and I'll come back a couple steps. And then I'll come forward a couple steps concentrating on staying on balance when I come down. Then I'll squirt to the side for a few steps, squirt back to the other side, move backwards, move to the side, maybe I'll move diagonally, come back on guard, move to the side, maybe I'll break into some circular movement, come on guard, pull back, go the other way, come on guard, come on guard the other way, keep moving, step in, Step back out, step in, step in, step in, step out, squirt to the side. One thing to remember whenever you're practicing going backwards is you can seldom afford to take more than a couple steps backwards without scooting out to the side. When you go backwards, if you don't move laterally pretty quickly, you're going to get overrun. Try this at home. Make up your own footwork solo drills. This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes, and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision, as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.
In this third volume, I want to teach you how to use the point and edge of your fighting knife so that you can take maximum advantage of it when you're actually in the street and having to use your, your blade. The first thing I'm going to start with is the point itself and I'm going to teach you how to rake with it, then how to use the speed jab, the straight thrust, the power thrust, and the epe thrust. And then I'm going to conclude this section with how to use your point in elliptical, looping, or circular stabbing motions. Then I'm going to go on to teaching you how to use the edge. The first thing we're going to start with is the slash, then the cut, then the chop, then the hack, then the snap cut, then the vertical whip, and finally conclude this with sawing, which is seldom taught. Then I'm going to go into the 12 angles of attack, how you can recognize these angles and how to use them both offensively and defensively. So let's get into the gym and start training. In my opinion, one of the least taught aspects of knife fighting is how to use the point. Hardly anybody goes into great depth in teaching you how, all the different ways that you can use the point in a knife fight. We're going to remedy that situation in this presentation. I'm going to teach you today all the basic ways that you can use your point in a knife fight. We're going to start at the bottom of the force continuum and then work our way up. At the very bottom is raking. What you want to do when you rake somebody with your knife tip is you want to limit the damage that you're doing to them. What your goal is, is to cause pain and fear. You want them usually to move away from the knife. To get that response, you're going to use the tip, just the tip, not the edges. You're going to use just the tip to rip open their flesh. I'm going to have uh, Ron come in so I can demonstrate this. What I want you to do is I want you to take your fighting knife. Now this is a trainer. I've taken the edge and the point off. I want you to turn it to the blade is flat against his body uh, part or target that you want to engage first. So the tip goes flat. You're going to raise the handle till that tip bites in. You can see that. The handle is raising up. And Ron, can you feel that? Mm -hmm. That tip is biting into his flesh now. I'm going to pull diagonally across Ron's chest. I always want the edges to be at right angles to the direction I'm going to pull. You never rake this way edge in the same direction because what you do there is you drive the edge into the flesh. That's not what you want. What you want to do is just take the tip and rip the flesh open because you want a shallow wound, not a deep wound. So the edges are always at right angles to the direction you're going to rake. So I'm just going to dip that in there and pull across his chest. I like to rake the pecs because it does the least amount of damage. Here, I'm ripping open his abdomen, and he can get a lot uh, more problems with infection and stuff like that if I, finish, uh, uh, if I um, pierce the stomach cavity, get into the intestines, if I cut those, he's got a lot more problems. But if I stay up here on these big muscle groups and I rip those like that, it's gonna rip the, the skin open, it's gonna rip the um, surface flesh open, the blood's gonna spring up, it's gonna cause pain, and the, most people's reaction, when you go like that, they sink into it, and then they go, they grab it just like Ron did, and they go, ah, oh, I've been cut. And they want to get away from that. They don't want to stay there and have you do this. Okay, so this is a good target from the front, is the pecs. Now I'm going to have Ron turn around from the back. The shoulder blades are another good target that you can rake. Again, I like to rake diagonally, like this, either way. So you're going to lay Lay the tip of your knife flat on your opponent's shoulder blade, lift the handle to the point bites, and then drag it across, just like this. You can do it forehand or backhand. Another good target for raking is the outside of the arms. Now remember, our goal in raking is to limit the damage that we're doing, not to maximize it. So we're going to use the tip of the knife to rip that flesh open on the outside of his arms. Same thing on this side. You can also rake the outside of the thigh, and if you're knocked on the ground, you can rake the outside of the calf. We want to stay away from the insides of the body when you're raking, because you're going to do more damage in here, more damage in here. We don't want to rake those areas. We want to limit the damage. When you're faced with multiple opponents, like I am right now, there's obviously they have more force than I do. There's 
There's some of them are bigger than I am, and there's more of them. But it's probably not a good idea to start stabbing everybody in the stomach to begin with. You probably are on the wrong there because you've escalated the force way past what's called for at that particular moment. This is where raking can stand you in good stead. You can use the tip of your knife to drive these people off. Now, I want you to imagine that these men are actively involved in a felony. They're assaulting, sexually assaulting women in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's my job, I hope I had the courage to do this in real life, I don't know if I would, but I hope I would. It's my job now to drive them off. So what I would say is, back off! And if they don't move, he gets raked, and he gets raked, and he gets raked, okay? Now, sometimes that may be en not enough. So that when I rake this person, and I rake this person, they close on me. And I have to cut this person, and cut this person, and cut that person. Because in a fight, when you're facing multiple opponents, you can't afford to go to the ground. If Robert ties up this arm, and Ron shoots, and I try to sprawl a little bit, I've got to get rid of things right now. If I go to the ground, they'll kick me to death very quickly. I've got to cut him. I've got to cut him. And I've got to cut him. I just can't fool around at that point. You've got to match the force to the situation. If I can drive them off by raking, I will. I will. I will. But if that doesn't work, or there's too many, you can't afford to be overwhelmed. You're going to have to use your edge and your point. To practice raking at home, I want you to grab your training partner and use your foam trainers. These are, remember, made out of PVC pipe and furnace foam with duct tape over them with a padded tip. One person is going to be the target person. The other one's going to be the defender or aggressor. What I want you to do is I want you to take the padded tip of your trainer, lay it on your opponent's peck, lift the handle till the tip bites in, and press in as you pull diagonally across this chest. You have to press in as you go across the chest. This doesn't feel that great, but you need to endure it so that you get the feel for actually raking somebody. What I don't want you to do is this. That won't even rip somebody's t-shirt hardly with a fighting knife. You have to lay the blade flat, lift the handle till the tip bites in, and put some pressure into that. Then have your training partner spin around, and I want you to practice raking the shoulder blades the same way. Dig in and rake across. Then I want you to practice raking the outside of the arm and the outside of the thigh. Now, your training partner can give you some feedback here now. He can say that's too light, or yeah, that feels like that's really gonna bite in. He needs to tell you if you're going too light. You want to feel some pressure. That's how you train it. I want you to go back and forth till you're used to it. I want you to train the pecs, the back of the shoulders, the shoulder blades, the outside of the arms, and the outside of the thighs, so that you go to those instinctively when you want to rake somebody with the tip of your knife. Next up on the force continuum is the jab. You can use the tip of your fighting knife to jab with, just like a boxer uses his lead hand. Um, the purpose of the jab is to uh, confuse and to drive and harass your opponent. You can hurt him into the position you want with your jab. You can keep him off you with the jab. You can confuse him as to your real intentions with the jab. Now, when you're using the jab, your goal isn't to embed the entire knife blade in your opponent's body. All you want to get in is maybe a half inch, that much of the tip. A half inch to an inch of penetration with the jab, that's all you're looking for, because the jab has to be executed with speed. The most important element of the jab is speed. Deft, precise, smooth speed, not power. There is no power with the jab with the tip of your knife. All you want to do is get in your fighting stance, and you want to extend your arm straight out all the way and retract it. It's arm power. You're not bringing any power from your legs, no power from your hips, no power from your, your back, and no power from your shoulder. All I want you to do is extend your arm smoothly. I want you to start out slow at first so you get used to doing it. And then, little by little, I want you to start increasing your speed. Now, when you jab, 
Try not to make your arm straighten all the way because it puts shock on the back of your elbow. You don't need to irritate your elbow doing this. Leave just a little bit of room before you fully extend it and start your retraction. I don't want your arm to snap out and fully extend and then pull back. Try not to extend all the way. And a good target for the jab is your opponent's face and his knife hand. All you want to do is, like I said, is get about a half inch to an inch of your tip to penetrate. Now, as you progress in practicing, I want you to concentrate on your retraction just as much as your initiation. When you stick your blade out, it goes out fast and it comes back faster. So it's out and back, out and back, because the jab is used so you're not exposed very long. I don't want my knife hand out here and very, for a very long period of time because I don't want to be countercut. The jab limits the time that your opponent has to countercut you. When you stick it out there fast and bring it back, back fast, he doesn't have a good time to mount his own counterattack. So I want you to stick it out and retract it. Stick it out and retract it, just like that. Light, deft motions, just with your arm. Our goal when using the jab was just to get a half inch or an inch of the tip of our knife into our opponent. Now we're going to add a little bit more power and try to get more penetration with a straight thrust. A straight thrust is very similar to the jab, except we're going to add more power. So the way you execute a straight thrust is to get in your fighting stance. And now I want you to add more power from your shoulder and a very slight bend in your knees as you transfer power into that tip. Now, when you're doing a straight thrust, you're trying to get most of the blade into your opponent. So penetration now is more on our mind than just speed. We're trying to get some penetration. Show you again. Get it in your fighting stance. And you're going to stab a little harder now. Your knees may bend a little bit. And you're going to bring a little bit more power from your shoulder and put more power into that straight thrust. A straight thrust, in my experience, will totally drive your blade up to the guard and the abdomen. Once you get past the clothes and the skin, the abdomen is just like spaghetti. There's no resistance to your point. It'll go all the way in. Also, in my experience, it will frequently split the rib cage. If you hit a rib, unlike on TV, with a straight thrust, a good straight thrust, and you've got a good fighting knife, it's going to split the rib and it's going to continue to penetrate. So the rib cage quite often doesn't stop a straight thrust. The sternum may stop a straight thrust because it's really hard and it's a little bit thicker bone. It may or may not stop your thrust. The ball joints of the shoulder and the ball joints of the hip will stop your straight thrust in my experience. Uh, you've got a good chance though of going through the shoulder blade back here on a straight thrust and getting, into the, in getting your blade into the lungs. So it's a really useful uh, way to use your point. Uh, it's a little bit more committed, so you have to have a bigger opening to get in a straight thrust than you do to a speed jab, but it does a lot more damage. Get with your training partner and have him extend his arm, just like we did with the speed jab. I want you to practice it this way. Get this all the way out, your target is the end of, it, of his trainer, or the end of his training knife, that red area right there. I want you to assume your fighting stance, and I want you to stab that with a little bit more power now. Your goal is to drive your blade all the way through the target. Now, as you get a little bit more familiar with that, move around a little bit and stab it. Stab it, stab it, stab it. Keep in mind, you may want to get back out again, but you're trying to get penetration on that. Just like that. The power stab is one of the most powerful ways you can employ your fighting knife's point. Before, our goal was with the speed jab, just to get a little bit of the point in, and then with the uh, straight thrust, we're trying to get all the blade. Now, I want you to use so much power in your stabbing motion that you would drive this point through any obstacle. To execute the power stab, get in your fighting stance, imagine your opponent's in front of you, and 
Now, you're going to have to summon up some internal en energy here. Some people might even call it hate. You're going to have to bring up some force out of your stomach, out of your uh, lower midsection, right in there, summon that power. Think about totally transfixing your opponent with your knife. You're going to drive this thing all the way through him, through his shirt, his jacket, his t-shirt, his rib cage, all the way right through his heart. That's what you have to think about in a power stab, because you're going to bring all your power now. What I want you to do, it's very similar to a straight thrust now, but what we're going to do is we're going to use our legs, we're going to bend our knee, we're going to transfer body weight, we're going to use all our power in our stabbing motion. Here's how, what it looks like. Notice I almost take a step forward and I bend my knee. It's not a, a big step or a deep bend of the knee like in a lunge, but it definitely commits your body weight forward and you're going to stab him and you're going to stab him. You're putting so much power forward into him that your retraction is slower than with a straight thrust or a speed jab. So this is a more committed motion, so you have to have a good opening in order to get in a power stab, but it's a fight ender. Let's try it again. Just like that. Now, I'm going to call Ron in, and we're going to show you how to train this at home. Get in your fighting stance. Summon your internal energy and stab that thing like you don't like it. Your goal is to penetrate that totally. Now, you're going to notice your accuracy. As you increase power, your accuracy is going to decrease. So you need to practice this and practice this and practice this so that you can hit a small point on your opponent's body with a lot of power. The more power you try to bring, the slower you're going to be and the less accurate. Just like that. Switch back and forth as you practice this. Another way to use your point in a straight thrusting motion is in what I call a fencing style or a pay thrust. To do this, it's pretty simple. All you do is face your opponent and use your trainer, come in your on guard fighting stance, pick the point that you want to attack on his body. I'm going to take Ron's left pec. I reach out with my knife. Normally you raise your knife to execute this, but you can also drop your knife onto the target. I raise my knife till it touches the target, just till it touches it. When my tip touches the target, I bend my front knee and I shoot my hips forward like this. And that puts my point into the target, right through his chest. So all you want to do to begin with is get your training partner, have him stand here like this in exposed position, because this is just to help you learn. It's a little bit uncomfortable, so you're going to have to endure a little bit of discomfort. It doesn't feel that great to have this happen to you dozens and dozens of times. But I want you to learn how to do this so that it's reliable when you use it in combat. So I want you to just reach out and touch. You can get really good. You can touch his chin. You can touch his nose. You can touch his thumb or thumb on this hand. I can touch the inside of his elbow on either side. Um, I can touch him here in the Adam's apple very easily. We all know how to point. That's the beauty of this type of thrust, that we all know how to point. So you just straighten your arm. So your fighting knife is here. You're just going to reach out and touch him. Straighten your arm, put the tip on the target you want to hit, like on his pec. That's a good place to start because it's a pretty big muscle and it gives him some padding. So put it on his pec, touch it, and now as you touch it simultaneously, bend your knee and sh shoot your weight forward like that. In reality, what it really looks like is something like this. When you match your push with the touch to where they're seamless, simultaneous, you touch it, you touch it, and you touch it, and you give that push. And as you get better at this, you won't see two movements. It'll just be one motion, just this. That's all. Now, that's exactly how I want you to practice it. I want one person to be the target and the other person the attacker. And he's going to attack either side of the chest like that. As you grow in skill, you can also do it to the abdomen and any part on the body. 
But of course we want to stay away from the face. We don't want anything to do to coming close to the eyes for um, uh, good protection there. But you can do the abdomen too. If you do this, again, it's not that comfortable, but it's got tremendous amount of power and it'll penetrate almost anything. Up to now I've taught you how to use the point of your fighting knife in only straight thrusting attacks. But I don't want you to think that's the only way you can use your fighting knife is in straight stabbing attacks. Nothing could be further than the truth than that. You can use your fighting knife's point in hooking, looping, or arcing attacks. So you can hook with it, both forehand and backhand. You can loop with it, or you can arc it in. Just like that. This point can, ta uh, can travel in every direction you can imagine. And um, you can deliver it with a lot of power with hooking, looping, or arcing attacks. I want to demonstrate each of these. I'm going to call Ron in, and I'm going to switch trainers. I'm going to show you a few examples. Just come on guard, Ron, and stand there. I can hook the point of my fighting knife into his hand, both forehand or, let's move this way a little bit. I can also backhand the point in and just hook it in or arc it in. So forehand or backhand. I can hook it into his leg. Either way. This way, too. I can hook it as I go past him into his abdomen. Or I can go past him and hook it into his kidney. I can use my hooking attack with the point to bypass obstacles that are in my way. I can go around his guard and attack his head with a hooking motion. What you do when you're doing this is you're getting your blade past his peripheral vision. Um, try this. Put your hand in front of your face like this. Look straight ahead and move it out and watch it with your right eye. And it should start disappearing right about here, right about even with your temple. That's about, if you move it forward, you should still see just a vestige of your hand. That's the end of most people's peripheral vision. What you want to do with your fighting knife is get past this peripheral vision. You do that by hooking it in. I can come clear in here and hook it into his neck on either side and bypass that. So I can move around like this and stab him with that hooking motion very quickly. There I drove it into his neck. It doesn't feel very good. Ron's a tough guy and uh, he's enduring this, but it's not pleasant. That's why we put this mask on, okay? You can move to this side, just hold still, and hook this way and go right, right around his arm and hook him in the kidney. Let's spin just like that so everybody can see this. Just like that. You can hook in here and drive your point into the kidney. Um, lots and lots and lots of good ways that you can hook with your knife. You can also use looping motions. We're going to show this later in our overhead posture, but I can be here and still stab downward and a looping stabbing attack, just like that. I can drive it at his face, I can drive it at his chest, I can drive it at his thigh, just like that. And you can change the directions. It really can be confusing because you don't know how that point is going to loop. I can hit his hands on either side. I can hit that hand, his face, his shoulder. I can hit this back leg if I want to. You can loop your point in. You can also arc your point in. From here, I can arc. Arc down. Put your hand a little bit in front, like that. I can arc it in like this. I can arc it in this way. I can arc it in that way. I can arc it in. So all kinds of circular arcing, looping attacks. You can also come from the bottom up. This is really important. Come on, guard. See his hand right here? If I position my knife a little bit low underneath his hand, I can arc up this way and stab the bottom of his hand just like that. He has a hard time seeing that attack because his hand, his own hand, is covering up my motion. What you do is you line your fighting knife up, and I like to look up at his face to make his attention come up. As his attention comes up, I might raise my hand and drop it and then stab, just like that, right underneath. If you miss, always pump again. We call that a double pump. If you miss it on the first time, you'll quite often get it on the second. Or you can alternate here and here. Go for his alive hand. That's why I told you earlier, you don't want this live hand out here. It makes it easier for me to take. So 
it's really important that you keep in your mind all the time that you don't have to use your knife and straight attacks when you're stabbing with the point. You don't have to do that all the time. You can also hook it, loop it, arc it in. Any circular looping arcing motion that you can think of. You can be way out here like that. A lot of times that confuses people because they're used to seeing more um, succinct attacks, more uh, deline de delineated attacks that are really nice and crisp. When you come outside the box and give them something they're not used to seeing, it freaks them out. And lots of times you get that. Now, and I'm going to show you how you can practice this at home. It's going to extend his arm. What I want you to do is come on guard, and I want you to practice hooking your tip in, forehand and backhand, right into that dot. Just practice it like that, nice and slow. Then I want you to come up like this, from underneath, and I want you to start arcing it in from the top, from the sides. Get used to doing that, just like this. Then as you get better, you can move around and you can stab it that way, just like that. Just like that. So far, I've taught you how to use your fighting knife out of a forward or hammer grip, but you can also use it out of a reverse grip to stab with effectively too. You don't have as much range, but you have a lot of power. From an on-guard fighting stance, you can use it to peck with, like this, at his face or neck, just like that. You can also use it in a backhand pecking motion like that. I'm going pretty slow so you can see what I'm doing. If you use a little body English, you can come over here and peck kind of daggling down like that. So you can use your tip pretty effectively at short range to peck away at your opponent. If he comes lower at your body, you can peck down here too. So uh, it's pretty useful for light pecking motions in this grip. So reverse grip has some options. If you want to add power, you can go diagonally down, horizontally across, backhand across, backhand down. You can drop your butt and stab up this way with the reverse grip. This is useful when you faint high and bring somebody up and drop underneath and stab them right here in the crotch, just underneath the testicles and the perineum, between the anus and the testicles. And it goes right in there. It's a soft spot. goes right into the nether regions of the body, and you bury the blade. There's no bone to get in the way. It's a really, really frighteningly effective stabbing attack that you can make with a reverse grip. So you can fight with the reverse grip out of your basic fighting stance. Remember, your range is really limited. Or if you want to add power, switch your leads, go left foot forward. Left foot forward, your feet turn to one o'clock, like this. Your rear heel comes up, your live hand pulls in tight to your left pec. Keep that elbow tucked in. Don't let it drift out and make a present to it to your enemy, because you'll cut that off. Keep it in here. Now, you can add even more power because you've got a better turn at your waist. You can put more of your body weight into your motion. You can stab down powerfully. You can stab down diagonally very powerfully. You can stab across very powerfully. Your backhand motions, like I said before, are weaker. Okay? Now I want to show this in action. Ron, I want you to take an on guard fighting stance. Okay? I want to show you how you can attack now your training partner. Um, with your knife in reverse grip. Ron's got some pretty good protection on. I'm just going to show you how you peck away at his face like this. Just like that. Just like that. You can peck at his face. You can backhand in. You can forehand in. Just like that. Just like that. So to get this forehand diagonal motion, you've got to lean your body a little bit to get the right angle to stab in. And you want to peck at his eyes if you can. That's a really good shot or at his neck from here. Backhand, you're going to you want to get his hand out of the way and then come in. So just peck away at his eyes from here, just like that. Again, pecking at his neck is another good target. You can peck downward at his knife hand. Drop your hand a little bit. There you go. Downward at his knife hand, just like that. Or this one. So you can come from here and here. Lots of times I'll, I'll peck this one and I'll switch and I'll go from here, here, just like that. Bang, bang, bang. So you get this one, the live hand, and stab him in the neck three motions. 
You want to add more power, you have to add more commitment. I might want to drop and stab him right here on the inside of his thigh where his femoral artery is and pierce that. I might want to come up here and stab behind his clavicle and go in to get the subclavicle artery in there and pierce that so he bleeds out really quick. Get inside the collarbone with my blade and drive it down into his chest cavity. That's another good attack. I might want to lean here and stab it into his, into his spleen on this side and penetrate that. I might want to get here and turn him and stab him in the back of the neck right there. Now you notice I switched leads there. I went from right foot forward, switched to get power, gathered myself, drove it in. While I'm here, I'm going to show the attacks to the back, right through the shoulder blades on either side, right through the kidney. Let's spin so they can see that right through the kidneys on either side, right in the middle of his back into the spine. That will pierce his spinal column and he'll drop when that spinal cord gets cut with that attack. You can always remember, hit the lungs by going through the shoulder blades and here underneath this shoulder blade, you can stab into the heart. So when you want to add power with your reverse grip and you're in the, your basic fighting stance, switch and put your other leg forward. Now, see how I can turn, just like in boxing, if I was going to hit him with a straight shot, I got that power, bang. You put that same power in your reverse grip and drive him back, just like that. This one is pretty hard to practice at home, but here's how I want you to try to do it. Safety is first. I want you to extend your arm like this, and I want you to practice pecking at that. Backhand, forehand, upward, all different angles. Then I want you to proceed with more power, more power, more power like that, and switch off so you get better and better at making contact in the area you desire with the tip of your knife with your knife held in reverse grip. If you're going to get the most out of your fighting knife's point, it really helps to know where you can insert this and get the best results. You need to know the best targets for uh, thrusting. Now this subject um, targets for thrusting is kind of gruesome and before I get started I would just want to say that I'd like um, the viewers out there to use a lot of common sense. Don't go out and stab somebody in the guts because he called you uh, some filthy name or smarted off or don't go out there and stab somebody in the throat because he punched you in the nose. Listen, what we're going to show now is deadly force. How to kill people, how to maim them for life. You need to match your reactions to the situation. If you're attacked with hands and feet, defend yourself with hands and feet. If, but that doesn't mean that you have to take a beating and, and get kicked or beat to death by multiple opponents or great big opponents. When you're starting to lose consciousness and you can no longer defend yourself and there's no escape, always try to run away first, that's real self-defense is leaving the area, but if you can't escape and you think you're going to go unconscious or you're going to be seriously hurt or killed, that's the time that you might start thinking about pulling out your knife and using thrusting attacks. So use some good common sense and stay out of prison and only use your knife when you're, when you're sure that your life is in jeopardy and there's no escape. Now with that said, I'm going to go into some of the targets for the point. Starting at the head, the forehead isn't much of a target except if you cut up here by the hairline you can, or stab up in there, you can cause a lot of blood to sheet down over the face and cover the eyes. And that it's pretty good, but that bone is pretty strong and you're not likely to penetrate into the brain with a stab in the forehead. The eyes though, just below it, are very vulnerable. If you want to stop somebody's forward motion, you put your tip of your knife in a jab or a straight thrust anywhere in his eye socket and he's not moving forward. He's going to recoil in horror because the eyes are very sensitive. If I go up and do this, just this, with my finger to your eye, or I go up there and just touch your eye like that with my finger, you're going to have a horrible reaction. Your eye is going to tear up. It's going to be shooting full of pain. You're going to really be in a mess. Just imagine what happens when I just do that in your eye. So one of the ways I like to attack the eyes is get my tip just underneath the eye and let it follow the bone and slide in underneath the eye socket right into the eyeball. But any 
stabbing attack around this eye socket is going to be really effective. It's going to make his head snap back. When his head snaps back, he can't see your lower attacking lines. So you get his head to rock back with the eye attack. You can go from here, drop right here and stab him in the throat, or you can rock him and stab him in soft areas on his body. Get his, eye, his head to rock back. One of the best ways to do that with your knife is stick him in the eye. The other good target for the, your point is the front of the throat. Anywhere here in the front of the throat, you stick your tip and push in two inches and you've pretty much taken him out. It's a mortal wound. From the side, you've got the cartoid arteries and the jugular vein. The cartoid arteries, let's spin right here, are right here underneath the ear, like this. I like to stab these things and hook my knife blade in to attack in here. Always try to transfix. If this was the knife blade, shove your knife all the way through till the point breaks out the other side. If you have a double-edged knife, just pull out like that and open up the whole throat. But always stab and all the way through his neck and transfix the neck from one end to the other. If you're going to stab him here in the front of the throat, you want your point to come out here in the back if you can. You want to get full penetration of that neck. Another good target from the front is the subclavial arteries inside the collarbones here. The collarbones are pretty easily broken. It only takes about 16 pounds of pressure with a hammer fist right there to break that collarbone. But when Ron has his hands up, it's pretty hard to get that in there. But with a knife, which a lot of times is you arc your blade in here inside that collarbone, there's nothing there. If you get your blade inside that collarbone, there's nothing impeding the progress of your knife blade but mush. It goes past the skin and dips right into the chest cavity. A really good place to stick the knife. Now you police officers that are wearing a vest, you need to be particularly aware of the fact that you have an opening all the way around here that someone can insert their knife in. The vest doesn't give you much protection against the thrust anyway. It's got a lot more protection against slashing attacks than it does thrusting. But you should be aware of that there's no protection right here. From the front of the body, you have the lungs here on either side of the sternum. Like I said earlier, with a, a good straight thrust, you'll split these ribs and enter the lungs with your blade and collapse the lung. So that's a good place to stab. The sternum is a it's pretty hard and bony, and it offers a lot of resistance to your point. I'm not saying that a powerful thrust won't go through the sternum. It will, but a lesser thrust or one that isn't perfectly um, placed may slip off or slide off, and you might not get through. The heart is just a little bit here to the left of the sternum and a little bit down. That's a good place to stab. It is protected, though, by the rib cage, so you need to stab hard to get through the rib cage into the heart. Another way to reach the heart that the Sikhs use with their curved knife they call a kirpan is to stab underneath the rib cage upward like this. Your knife enters the chest cavity at an angle just like that. So it comes underneath the ribs, angles up, splits the diaphragm and goes into the heart from, from beneath. On this side here you have a spleen. The spleen is a reservoir of blood. You hook your blade and, and drive your point in like that into the spleen and you can do a tremendous amount of damage internally and it's going to bust his will to fight. On this side we have the liver right in here. This is a great place when you're boxing to drive that hook or that shovel hook into. You see when people drop with a body shot suddenly like that and don't get up it's because it's usually they took a hook to the liver there. It's the same thing with your knife. If you're in your fighting stance and you move this way and you drive your blade into that liver, ah, oh, what a shock. It can be a mortal wound. The liver is a really essential organ in your body and it's really vulnerable to the knife. Now you have the lower abdomen. The lower abdomen is just spaghetti in there. I mean those intestines and everything are just spaghetti. Once you get past the shirt and the skin, your blood uh, glides in there very, very easily. For best results, you always want to um, rock your blade inside or turn it and rotate it to widen that wound. If I get, with, I have a double-edged blade, and I stab in the chest here like this, the first thing I'm going to do if I can, if I have enough time, is I'm going to rotate my handle so that that blade inside the chest cavity goes like this and widens the wound. So keep that in mind when you're stabbing. You want to widen the wound. Sometimes though, your opponent's too alert or has too much fight and you get this and you have to get out again because you can't stay there with any safety. But 
if Ron's on guard, and I beat his knife out of his hand, and I stab him in the chest, and I stab him in the abdomen, I've got more time. You don't always have that option. Moving down from the abdomen, we have the bladder and the groin. I like to attack the groin in an upward direction, this way. I showed on the reverse grip, you can stab this way, also and attack the groin. On the inside of the legs, right here, we have the femoral artery, right in there, okay? A lot of the times, I like to hook this in, just like this, and try to attack that way. What you do, if you cut that, he's gonna bleed out pretty quickly. If he can't get there and get to the hospital and get that clamped off really quick, he's gonna bleed out very shortly. A lot of blood comes down to supply the leg off those femoral arteries. The front of the thighs, not that great of a place to stab people. The muscles run across like this, mostly up and down in your leg. If you stab somebody in the leg, you may separate those muscles and cause them some pain, but you're not going to incapacitate them if they're a tough guy. Not like in the movies. They can still move around and put weight on that leg. So there's limited use in stabbing the muscles of the leg. Come on guard for a second. Now I showed earlier I like to stab the inside of the knee just like that and drive the tip of your knife into that knee. What quite often happens is when you do this with power, you just knock him down and knock him right off his feet when you stab that. I took a little bit of power out of that thing because it doesn't feel great even with this trainer to stab the inside of the knee. Again, the targets lower than that aren't that vulnerable. If from the back you can stab, and we're going to get to that, I'll show you where you can stab him in the back of the leg. One thing you might try to do though is if you see your, pinch, uh, your opponent's attention is high, you can drop underneath and just drop your body weight and stab him right through the foot and break those small bones and the top of his foot and go right through his foot. This will really incapacitate a lot of people. Um, there are no good one-legged knife fighters. There just isn't. So anything you can do to break down his capacity to move is a good thing. Let's move around to the back. From the back, you've got the base of the cerebellum right here. You take your point, put it right here, and push. Bang! Goes right through the spinal cord, cuts the spinal cord right there, and he drops. Goes right here where the spinal cord goes up into the brain, right there, the base of the cerebellum. Okay, you have the spine all running down the center of the back. You can attack that with stabbing attacks, especially from the reverse grip. If you want to come up and do this, you'll drive that, just like a push Ron forward, and I'm not even hitting that hard. You'll drive that thing in that point, if the blade's long enough, will come out his chest. You got tremendous power there. That's a good place to stab. On either side of the shoulder blade, we touched on that earlier. The lungs are just opposite those shoulder blades. You can reach them by penetrating those uh, shoulder blades. The kidneys, just above the belt line, to either side, about two inches either side of the spine, are the kidneys. Those are really vulnerable to stabbing attacks. Very painful place to stab somebody. You come up and stab somebody in the kidney like that. You can almost give them a heart attack from the pain it's that bad. It can be a very painful place to be stabbed. Stabbing people in the butt isn't that effective in that it's not a mortal wound usually, but it can impede his ability to move somewhat, and that wound is really hard to close because he can't walk without opening it. It's, but it's even more vulnerable to a cutting attack. Stabbing the back of the legs, the hamstring, if you hit it just perfectly, is all right, and the Achilles tendon is a good spot, but they're very small targets, it's easy to miss them. So stabbing the back of the legs, I don't think is that super effective. Now, the arms, from the front, come on guard. Stabbing the hands is always a flipping good idea to do, always. You can break these fingers with just a slight amount of pressure, just a speed jab like that, and I'm back out again, will cut off fingers like little chunks of butter. Just moving like this and taking the tip of my knife and hitting them in the back of the hand, breaking those metacarpals right there, can really degrade his ability to fight. So stabbing the hands is always a good thing. Coming here and stabbing the thumb, let's switch. Just switch all the way around. Stabbing that thumb is always a good thing. Anytime you can arc down or arc your blade in and stab that thumb, it's really good. Or bring your hand, or rather your knife, up from the bottom 
and stab them here on the fingers or on this fleshy pad here. Drive your point up into that. Ugh, he's going to be hating that. It's going to degrade his ability to fight. Any stab into the elbows is good or into the bicep or forearm. All those muscles, and we're going to get into more in this in cutting, all the muscles and tendons that keep his hand closed are on the inside of his arm. Any stabbing attacks there are good or into the bicep. Quite often, I get a stabbing attack into the point of the shoulder right here, right where your rotator cuff is. When he cuts number one in a big movement, I'll get him with a stop hit right there. You can see him recoil just then, just from the pressure of this foam trainer. It doesn't feel good. It tends to rest forward motion when you hit it right. So that's a good spot to hit the arms in. There you have the basic uh, points on the body that are vulnerable to a stabbing attack. Memorize those and practice them. You want to practice them gently with your trainer. One person's going to come on guard, and the other person is going to come around and pick off some of these spots until he gets used to doing it. Try that at home. One of the best ways to increase your ability uh, in using the point of your fighting knife is to practice stabbing drills. Um, what I want you to do is you work on drills that increase your eye-hand coordination. I want to show you a drill that we use here at Cold Steel that's been very helpful in helping our students imp improve their ability with the point of their fighting knife. What we have here is some wiffle balls. Um, starting at this end, they're the size of a medium-sized orange, then going down to about apple size, and then going down to about the size of a cherry tomato. And we just have them on some string here um, under a little bit of tension. Now, your fist is actually about the same size as this wiffle ball right here. So when you can hit this pretty reliably, you're on target because you're hitting the fist holding your opponent's fighting knife. If you can stab that reliably when he's moving it in motion, you're doing pretty darn good. As you move down to smaller targets, it takes more skill. I want you to um, make a frame. It doesn't have to be fancy. We use PVC pipe and some concrete uh, bases that you can get at a box store and made our own. You can also hang these wiffle balls from your raised garage door. I practiced that way for years at home. So you can improvise this, but what I want you to do is get used to stabbing small targets with the tip of your fighting knife. So take your trainer and come on guard and stab these balls, just like that. And you're going to go from one end to the other. And you're going to stab, 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 just like that, and practice that. Um, in our class, we form lines, and we have multiple of these, and we all go through practice stabbing them in motion, just like that. Try that at home. I think it'll really increase your ability to hit the target you want with the tip of your fighting knife. Continuing on with the offensive use of our fighting knife's blade, I want to teach now the slash. Now, with the slash, all you're using is the portion of the edge from the tip about two inches down the blade. That's all, because the slash isn't a real powerful motion. It's like the jab with the point. All we're trying to do is injure a little bit to a degree. We're just trying to create a wound that will distract and frighten our enemy and start to degrade his ability to fight. To execute a slash, come on guard in your fighting stance. Extend your knife hand. As you extend your knife hand, you make contact with your opponent's body and pull through and pull the butt back towards yourself. It's a real quick, light motion. There isn't a whole lot of body weight transport. It's mostly from your arm, just like the jab. You're going to come out here and give a little slash and come back. Now I'm going to go slow. You extend your arm, make contact with this portion right here, the front portion of your edge nearest the tip. Pull that through the target and pull the butt back towards yourself. Now in any cutting motion that you make with a fighting knife, the butt always is pulled back towards your body. I don't care if it's coming diagonal or it's coming upward. I don't care if it's coming horizontal or backhand. The butt 
is pulled back towards the body. That pulls the edge through the target. Every single cutting motion you're ever going to make with your knife so edge is the butt is always going to be pulled back towards the body so keep that in mind now I'm going to call Ron out here and I'm going to demonstrate the slash Ron's just going to come on guard and what I'm going to do is you're going to pretend right here is the edge of my fighting knife I'm just going to slash his fingers and get out I'm going to lean in slash his fingers and come out I'm going to come underneath slash his forearm and come out I'm going to feint him high, slash his leg, and come back out. I'm going to come to this side, slash his face, and come back out. What I did is I come in here, I extend my arm, put the tip, that edge near the tip, on my target, pull, and pull the butt back towards myself. Same thing with his fingers. I come in here and come back out. Just a light cutting motion. Nothing heavy, not a lot of power. All I'm trying to do is cut a finger off or two. All I'm trying to do is lay his cheek and lip open. All I'm trying to do is open up his gut pile. Just to split the skin and get through the muscle wall and get out. Maybe that intestine starts to peep out a little bit. That's really going to scare him. Get some blood going. Just get it on his forearm and get out. That's the slash. Here's how you train it. One person's going to stand here like this. With his knife hand extended, oh, um, where the tip isn't any higher than his shoulder. Just like that. The other person is going to come in here from his fighting stance. Now remember, you're just using the front part of your edge right up here near the point, and he's going to slash just like this. Reach out and go slow at first and get a feeling for that forehand slash. Now, depending on the type of knife you're using, you may have to move your wrist, twist your wrist to get that edge to line up with the target. So I might have to twist my wrist to get that edge on, but get it on and pull it back. Try it forehand and try it backhand. Try it backhand. Remember, get the edge on, pull your butt back towards your body. Get your edge on and come out. Forehand and backhand. You can also try it this way. One person holds it like that and you come underneath and slash up this way. Again, you're going to have to use a little body English here to get the correct orientation of your edge. I bend my knees, get my, turn my wrist so my edge lines up, make contact, and pull back. So I come in here, extend my arm, make contact, pull. Just, it's a quick motion, just like a jab is. It's the same thing with a slash. I'm in and I'm out. Your arm doesn't want to be sticking out here for any length of time. You don't want to give him an opportunity to countercut you. So it's a real quick darting motion. You can come from the top, same thing. Come over, drop your tip, engage that edge, pull back, pull it back towards your body. That's how you slash. A cutting attack with a knife is very similar to a slashing attack. The main difference is the amount of edge you use and the power that you put in the stroke. When I was teaching you how to use a slash, I didn't want you to use a lot of power. I want you to concentrate on speed and just using the first part of the edge of your knife. When you cut somebody with a knife, I want you to get as much of the blade edge as possible onto the target and I want you to use a lot more power. When we're slashing, it's like this, a real quick motion. When we're cutting somebody, we're, we're going to use a lot more power. See my body lean into it? I'm going to put weight into that stroke. I'm going to try to engage the target with my blade right about here. Ideal would be get clear back here to the choil and run the entire seven inches of the blade across their flesh. But in reality, you will seldom get that kind of accuracy in a slashing attack, especially when people are moving. If you can get two-thirds of your edge, if you can get two-thirds of the way down the blade, get that as your starting point on your target, you're doing really well, and you're going to get a really effective cut. So try to get your blade to start. Look at my thumb right here, just like that. That's what you're going to pull through, that entire part of the edge. If I was going to um, cut somebody's abdomen, I'm going to look at that target, I'm going to push my arm forward. As I engage that, I'm going to press in and I'm going to pull through and pull that butt back. So it's like this. There's a lot of commitment and force in a, in a cutting attack compared to a slashing attack. What your goal in a cutting attack is, is if possible to dismember and to open up the body cavity, to open up the arms, to open up the legs, to open up that entire leg and make that muscle flap 
to open up that bicep and let it flop open. Okay? You want to destroy muscle groups and bile organs with your cutting attack versus just injuring to a small degree with a slashing attack. I'm going to call Ron out here and demonstrate. Come on, guard, Ron. When I slashed, it's like this. When I cut, it's like this, like this. I'll lean in here and cut him like this. So a slash is light, like this, and back out. A cut is this. See that? Like that. I might come all the way across his body, all the way across his body like that. That's the difference. You're going to come in here, engage his neck, and cut it. When you pull back, his head should flop because you cut through all the muscles and tendons of his neck and all the pipes. His head's flopping over there. It's half cut off with one good cutting attack. That's what you should be trying to, to get. Now, to train this, I want one person to stand like this, just like with the slash. The first thing I want you to do is get in your fighting stance, and I want you to extend your arm. Now, try to make contact just above your fist here, so you're getting all of your edge through that target. Put your edge on his trainer and pull through. Put your edge on his trainer and pull through. Now, try it with a little bit more power. A little bit more power. Forehand and backhand. Backhand, forehand, backhand. So if you get an opportunity to slash him across the knee like that, or rather cut him across the knee, hey, the back of his leg, he flops. Because you cut all those muscles and tendons there. It's a lot different than a slash. Here, we're just trying to get a finger. Here, when I cut him, I'm trying to destroy that hand. I want to cut the fingers off, get the thumb, cut across into the palm, totally destroy that hand. Same thing here. I can slash his face, or I can cut his face. Big difference. So you want to practice this. Forehand and backhand. Same thing. You want to practice it down and up. Just like the slash, when you're coming up, you have to turn your wrist to orientate the edge properly. Get that edge on there and pull out. Get the edge on there and pull through. Practice it like that a lot. When you use the edge of a big fighting knife like this Trailmaster Bowie in a chopping attack, you can end the fight in one motion. A chopping stroke has a tremendous amount of power. It can shear through an arm or a leg very easily if you've got a well-made, very sharp knife. The big difference a chopping, uh, between a chopping attack and a cutting or slashing attack is that when you chop, you don't bring the butt of the knife back towards you. You push it away from you. Every time you chop, the butt of the knife goes away from your body. It doesn't return or it doesn't be pulled back in towards your body. It always goes away. When we're cutting, we're pulling the edge through something. When I'm slashing, I'm pulling the edge through. When I'm chopping, I'm pushing. I'm not pulling. I'm going to push that edge through. I'm going to drive it right through. I'm going to sever. I'm going to shear with that edge. My idea is to shear his arm off with the stroke, to shear his leg off with the stroke, to shear right through his neck with that chopping stroke so his head flops off. That's the idea with the chopping stroke. To execute a chopping stroke, get in your basic fighting stance. Imagine your opponent's extended arm is right in front of you. All you're going to do is you're going to drop your body. As you drop your body, you're going to snap your arm down and through the target. You want to make contact with about the middle of the blade, or maybe just a li little bit closer to the guard than the middle, maybe right in here. So a little bit of your blade, if possible, overhangs the target so that you're uh, certain that you're going to get um, all of the edge that makes contact all the way through that target so it shears it right off. So try to get, if I'm going to cut an arm off, I want to land right about here, just like that. Imagine that arm there. You're in your fighting stance. You see that? Bang! You're going to drop on it, just like that. You get a lot of your power in your chopping stroke from dropping your butt and getting your body weight in sync with your hand motion. So it goes simultaneously. The best way for me to do this is to get rid of this trainer and get a foam one. Pretend that's your opponent's hand. I see my opening and I drop. I see my opening and I drop. What I want to do is shear right through that. This isn't a mamby-pamby motion here. You're using power. A, a chopping attack, when I see that, I'm committed. Your recovery is a little slower than in a slashing or a cutting attack, so you have to have a good opening. You have to have enough time to make this move count, but it's devastating. 
If I come in here and I chop his leg like that with a Bowie knife, like a Trailmaster or a Laredo Bowie, he's going to hit the ground. This leg's going to buckle. I just cut his leg off. If I see an opportunity to come in here and chop his hand, or come in here and chop through his hand like that, I'm going to split all those fingers off and hit the handle of his knife with that stroke. If I see an opening to come in here and chop into the side of his neck like that with a bowie knife or a kukri, hey, there's nothing here, folks. In the side of the neck here, you have some muscle here. You got the collarbone. That's it. Over here, you have that thin shoulder blade. A bowie knife or a kukri will go into that juncture right here and slide clear into the middle of the chest, maybe off the other side. A chopping stroke is really, really dangerous, but it's a committed motion. So you need to practice it, and you have to have a good opportunity. Here's how I want you to practice that chop at home. One person is going to be the target. He's going to stand here like this. The other person is going to practice his chopping. Now, for safety's sake, I want you to try to hit out here near the tip. Don't hit your training partner on the thumb with this stroke. It hurts like belly hell. You're not going to enjoy that, and he's going to enjoy it a lot less if you smack him there. So try to keep out on closer to the edge over here and not close to the hand when you practice this. What I want you to do, get in your fighting stance, look at your target, and drop, just like that. Drop, drop, drop. The power in chopping comes from that dropping of your body weight. It's not from muscle. It's from body weight transfer. It drops like that. Now, I'm not hitting particularly hard with my arm, but Ron can tell you, he can feel that all the way up and down his arm from that stroke. It's a very, very powerful stroke. You can chop downward like this. You can chop diagonally. You can chop horizontally. The main thing is your knife always moves away from your body. You keep in mind that you're trying to shear through the target, not pull the edge through it but penetrate, shear, cleave it in half. That's your goal. You want to cleave something when you chop. So practice it like this until you're getting your arm motion and the drop of your butt happening almost simultaneously. So your weight is in your chopping stroke. Try that at home and be careful. Don't smack your training partners in the hand. It hurts a lot. But it's well worth practicing and taking some discomfort for because it's a really useful cutting stroke to have in your arsenal. If you ever find yourself fighting at extreme close quarters, it will really behoove you to know how to use the edge of your fighting knife in a hacking attack. The main difference between a hacking attack and a chopping attack is we substitute speed and repetition for power. When you chop somebody, you're using a lot of power and you're dropping your body weight behind the stroke and you're shearing through. When you use your knife in a hacking motion, what you're doing is you're picking a target and you're hitting it in the same place repetitively. So if I want to hack somebody's arm off, I pick a spot on their arm. I might not have much room to move my knife, but I hit the same spot again and again and again. And it could be really short motions like this or longer motions like that. But you sell them in a hacking attack, have the uh, luxury of being able to drop your body weight into it. Also, that's such a committed motion, you lose your repetition. So the long suit of a hacking attack is it doesn't need a lot of space to work in, and all you do is hit the same spot again and again and again and widen and deepen that wound channel. You hit the hand, you hit the same spot again, maybe the fourth hack, the hand falls off. I'm going to substitute for a softer trainer now and demonstrate this. First, I'm going to show you how you can train at home, and then I'm going to demonstrate it on uh, Ron and Sergio. Just hold your arm out there like we did before. On a hacking attack, just uh, wait for a second, Sergio. On a hacking attack, you're going to train similar than we did with a chopping attack. You're going to come on guard, you're going to look at your target, and you're going to hit it like that. Let's hold that up a little higher and give me as stiff as you can. Just like that. You're going to use repetition and speed. Look at the target. Strike it with your edge, retract, strike it with your edge, strike it with your edge, strike it with your edge. Don't pull through. You're shearing. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Just like that. Pick the spot and cut through it. Against Ron's arm. If I want to cut that arm off, I pick a spot. One, two, three. Off comes the arm. Same thing the bicep. One, two, three. I can hack at extremely close range. 
I'm tied up here, one, two, three. I can hack into his face, bang, bang, bang. I can hack into the side of his face. I can hack on his neck. I can hack on his leg, just like that. Let me show what happens when you get tied up at close quarters. If you get rushed by multiple op opponents, uh, knowing how to hack with the edge of your fighting knife is a really good thing to have in your arsenal. I'm going to show you what I mean. The first thing you want to do is you want to break your knife hand free. The way you do that is they can't hold your body weight. So step and break one arm free like this. Now I'm going to hack on Ron's shin like that until he starts to move that. Now I'm going to hack on his leg. Now I'm going to hack on his arm so that comes off. If Sergio's still there, I'm going to probably knee him and let him have it, just like that. You use the hacking attack at close quarters when you have no room to use a more effective cutting stroke. Sure, I'd rather drop and cut the legs off with one stroke, but when you're tied up, you don't have a lot of room, use speed and repetition to drive your edge through their limbs. One of the most useful cutting attacks a knife fighter can have in his repertoire is the snap cut. The snap cut is a non-committed cutting motion where you can damage your opponent at long range, get in, get out, and minimum amount of speed, minimum amount of fuss, maximum amount of damage. It's really, really useful. You're going to use the snap cut all the time when you're fighting. It'll be used just like you use the jab with a point. You're going to snap cut all the time. It's used just like the jab to harass your opponent, to interrupt his, his mindset, to drive him where you want to go, and to fend him off. When I back up and I can keep my jab out in front of me, to keep to fend off an opponent the same way I can back up and snap cut to keep somebody off me. It's a really, really useful cutting attack. To execute the snap cut, come in your fighting stance and you're going to extend your arm about two thirds of the way out. When your arm's two thirds of the way extended, you're going to snap your wrist down and drive the tip of your fighting knife into the target and retract your arm. So you're going to come out snap down and come back just like that and you're going to snap the tip down. Now the Tanto that I developed in 1980 is really well suited for the snap cut because of the secondary point. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that's why we put this point configuration on the knife like this because right here where you see the tip of my little finger we call that a secondary point. You could snap that secondary point right into the target and it makes a wound way out of proportion to what you think would occur. It makes a horrific wound with that secondary point. When it hits flesh, it just opens it up in a V-shape. It's horrendous. Really useful to have. A snap cut can bust the bones in the hand. It can open up the bicep and damage it, open up all the major muscle groups. Really good thing to have. You use it just like a cat uses his paw. A lot of you have seen a cat play with a ball of yarn. And he kind of gets his paw out here like this, and he bats at it like that. Just with the end of his paw, just bats at it. It's the same thing with a snap cut. You're going to be out here like this. You're moving around. You can extend your arm out. I'm going to go kind of slow so you can follow me. I'm going to extend my arm. See how you lean a little bit? You lean into it just a little bit. It's not so much power. You're not putting a lot of power in this. But you're going to lean in forward a little bit. Rock forward. Bend your knees. Extend your arm. When it's about 2 thirds of the way extended towards the target, you're going to snap your wrist down. Drive that secondary point or the edge of your blade nearest the tip, that first inch of the edge. Drive that into the target and retract your arm. Now, you want to do this in a quick darting manner. You don't want your arm left out there for very long because you don't want your opponent to have a, a good opportunity to counter cut you. So it's out there and it's back. It's out there and it's back. You snap cut somebody, snap cut them, and it comes right back immediately. I'm going to get rid of this blade and go to a less dangerous trainer. Ron, come on guard. I can use my snap cut here to tack his hand, just like that. Tack the thumb, tack this side of the hand. You can use your snap cut uh, vertically down. You can use it horizontal. You can backhand with it. So I can turn my body like this. You can use a little body English to line up your blade and snap cut and cut off his fingers like that. I can also, let's spin, I can move to this side of Ron, and as I move, again, I like to angle my body. So I kind of turn like this, and turn my wrist over, and snap cut, just like that. 
quickly, breaking the metacarpals in the back of his hand, moving out of range very quickly. I can snap cut his forearm here, just like that. Snap the blade down, hit that muscle group, split it open, and leave. I can snap cut his face, just like that. Reach in, snap cut, hit him right in the eye, pow, and back out. Hey, can you imagine what's going to happen when that tanto point hits you in the eye like that? It's going to split the whole thing open. Here's another good use for the snap cut. We're going to talk about this later in strategy, but I use it a lot on the top of people's head. Quite often when I'm fighting, I'll come in here and I'll move on people's hands a little bit. And I'll think, want them to think that's the target. And then I'll come up the top of their head, right here, and snap cut, right on the scalp. You take a tanto and you hit somebody right here on the top of their scalp there like that and split that skull open, blood is going to piss down their face like a river. Just going to sheet his face with blood. It's going to scare that crap out of him. It's not a mortal wound, but it, the scalp bleeds like crazy. So that's another really good target for the snap cut is just above the forehead here, right there on the scalp. Drive that in and get out. It's very easy to get that blow. You can also set it up by going low. You can make him think that your target is low and like that. When you see his knees bend, you react and come above him, snap cut him that way. Here's a way to train it. I want you to come on guard. You just pretend Ron's your training partner. One of you get like this, get your foam trainers. I want you to try to hit the red end of his trainer, the tip. Stay away from his thumb and fingers if you can. Come on guard. Extend your arm part way, about two thirds out. When you're two thirds out, snap down and retract. Like that, like that, like that. I'm going kind of slow so you can follow me. You don't bring power. This is not a chopping stroke, okay? This is a snap cut. All we're going to do, extend our arm, snap our wrist down. You're going to let the blade, that's the beauty of knife fighting. We talked about this earlier. The blade does all the bloody work. You don't have to bring that much power. That sharp edge, that unyielding steel does the work for you. So all you do is you extend your arm, snap your wrist down, drive that sharpened edge near the tip into your target and come back out. See how that's a quick darting movement? Just like that. That's how we want you to practice it. Now, for variation, you're going to have to switch to this type of grip. Your partner's going to have to feed you this angle. Put it up vertical like that. What I want you to do is I want you to lean your body. Sometimes you'll take a little bit of step to the side. Remember I talked about in footwork how you have to use diagonal uh, movement, both forward and backwards, whether it's an offense or defense. Here's a prime example. I want to move off to the side. I'm going to tilt my pelvis a little bit and drop my shoulder and snap cut this way, forehand to the side. Same thing when I go to the other side. I want to backhand. I'm going to move a little bit this way, tilt my body over, and snap cut. Practice that. You can snap cut down, and you can actually snap cut as you're leaving this way, that way. A lot of times, come on guard, Ron, I'll be here and I'll cut him as I'm moving away. I'll be here and I'll move backwards and snap cut. So it doesn't always have to be vertically or horizontal. It can also come from the bottom up. It can rise that way. Practice with it, experiment with it, but make it your own. Become an expert at the snap cut. You won't be sorry. In my experience, one of the hardest cutting attacks to learn how to do is the vertical whip. But it's so useful that I'm going to go all out to try to make you understand how to properly execute this cutting attack. The vertical whip can be used like the speed jab and the snap cut to drive your opponent into the position you want and to hold them off. When your opponent's being really aggressive, you can retreat behind a series of vertical whips and put up a wall of steel that he has to go through to reach you. It can be very disconcerting for someone rushing you to all of a sudden face this. Very disconcerting. It makes him reconsider, whoa, I don't know if I want to go there or not. So I want you to know how to execute the vertical whip and to get really good at it. The way I'm going to teach it, I want you to come in your basic fighting stance. I want you to pretend your opponent's right in front of you and his arm is extended. That's your target. What you're going to do is you're going to extend your knife arm out like this. You're going to make contact, cut through his arm, 
and withdraw your blade back to start your vertical whip again. Normally, you execute the vertical whip in multiples. I usually just don't whip once. It's usually two or th three times in a row that I'll execute a vertical whip. It works well when done in multiples. So to show that again, your knife hand, it usually folds back just a little bit towards your body before you start. It's very seldom and it's hard to execute from here. It's usually better to start it right about here. See how my blade is pointing away like this diagonally in front of my body? Just about like this. So you're going to extend out, cut through your opponent, and return. Now watch my wrist. As I cut through the target, my wrist starts to turn and my elbow bends. See how my arm bends like this and the point is pointing this way? And it comes back like this and it recovers. So the motion looks like this. The other element that you should know about the vertical whip is the vertical whip takes up space. It cuts a path like this, a diagonal path in front of you and it takes up space. Anything entering that path in front of you is going to get cut. So that's really important. The vertical whip is an occupier. It occupies all the space in front of you. It cuts an elliptical path like this too. Just like this. This is which I'm exaggerating this, but that's the motion. It doesn't go straight like this. It cuts diagonally across and occupies space. So when you do it, you want to make sure that your blade is moving. Right now, my blade is starting to intercept anything in front of me all the way out here till it starts to descend, makes contact with the target, cuts through the target, and starts to return. Now, you always want to make your motion elliptical like this because it's harder for your opponent to track and countercut you. So you see, your, what happens is your knife comes out, drops, and retracts. Comes out, drops, cuts through, and retracts. It drops, so now he has a harder time tracking that motion than if it's a slow, straight motion. It's easier for him to key to that and pick that up than that vertical whip. Now I'm going to have Ron come in here and I'm going to demonstrate this some more. To execute this vertical whip, I'm going to move around a little bit. I see an opening and I'm going to cut. Just like that. I see him and I'm going to cut. I see him, I'm going to cut twice like that. My arm comes out, drops on the target, cuts through, my wrist starts to turn, my elbow bends, comes back and I recover. Now on your recovery, sometimes you might want to take your thumb and just bounce it off your stomach like this. That's one of the things that happens to keep the blade away from you. You can bounce here and keep that blade. You don't want to come back and stick your own knife in you. So you need to be careful with that vertical whip and keep it in a safe spot. So your knife comes out, occupies this space, cuts this path diagonally across, lands on the target, cuts through, and returns like that. Again, you can use it to drive somebody back, or if he enters, I can hold him off with it also. Very, very useful. Here's a way to train it. This is your training partner at home. He's got his trainer extended. You're going to aim at the little red stabbing tip. Come on guard. Extend your arm. Drop and cut. Cut through. As you start to retract, now just as you come off his trainer, as you start to retract, your points start to turn. This elbow here is going to bend. Starts to bend and you come back and get ready to start again. So you get this motion like this. All right. Now, you want to be careful that you don't leave your arm out here exposed very long. We're going to get to show you that later. You don't want to show a lot of this to your opponent. It's better if you can shorten this. So he doesn't see all of this. He just sees a part, this part here, like that. Not a flat form across here. I want to see less of my form. Show him as little of your form as possible. So it's really hard for him to pick off and counter cut you. That's another good trick. But you're going to need to practice this vertical whip. Now, you can do it from your backhand side, like I'm doing right now, or you can vertical whip forehand. It's a little bit more dangerous to yourself because you could pull it back into your own face. But you can also vertical whip this way. So the way you set that up is you bend your knees and that gets your knife to drop. You extend your knife, you've got to turn your wrist to orientate your edge correctly, 
get your edge on there, and pull through, just like this. So it's a circular motion. One, two, one, two, just like that. Two different ways you can do it. Um, you want to just put that down, Ron? I can vertical whip this way or this way. I prefer a backhand motion like this, but sometimes you'll confuse your opponent by switching and come underneath. Lots of times, come on guard, I'll come this way, like this, like that, and whip that way. That's a confusion technique and a change up. So practice them both ways, but be careful, don't hit each other in the face, but practice hard. The final cutting motion or attack I'm going to teach you today is sawing. Sawing is a really useful thing to know how to do with your knife's edge, especially I like it with a double edge because it gives you twice as many options. What you're going to do with sawing is you're going to um, disentangle yourself from opponents at close quarters that are grappling with you and trying to subdue you, or even if they've taken you to the ground. You saw with the edge when you can't do anything else. It's a, 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 a motion that you use when you have very, very little space to operate in. I'm going to have Ron come out here, and I'm going to demonstrate what sawing is. Let's say Ron grabs my arm. And imagine now that I have very, very little space to work with. I get in here like this. Let's spin so the cameras can see us, Ron. I spin like this, and I may just use my shoulder like that with the edge. And I start sawing. You put the edge in one place, keep it in that same spot, and rapidly saw the edge back and forth, just like you would with a wood saw. And you're going to use that edge very quickly. If you can't use your arm, you can even saw with your shoulder right from here. Now this is a blunt trainer. You can see Kron's arm motion. That didn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to be sawn on. With a razor sharp knife, or even worse, a serrated edge, oh, it's really effective. So you can use a sawing attack with your edge when you can't do anything else. When you have no room for any type of cutting attack or any type of stabbing attack, you can almost always saw. And then when you have a double-edged knife, it's really helpful because you can saw in any direction. Now I'm going to have the rest of our crew come in and attack me, and I'm going to show you how you use sawing against multiple attackers. The first thing is you're going to have to get your lower your body weight and saw here. That's going to come off. That's going to come off. That's going to come off. And that's going to come off. Now pretty soon, no one wants to be there and be sawed on. Happens pretty quickly. Now, this is a dull trainer, and it hurt these guys. And these are tough guys. They didn't like being there, being sawed on. If you've got a tie pan, a razor sharp double edged knife, and you start sawing with people, they're going to come off you like you were red hot, heated to 300 degrees. You were hot oil. They want to get away from you. They don't want to get splattered. Now I'd like to discuss the targets that are most vulnerable to your fighting knife's edge. I'm going to have Ron come over here. Ron, you want to stand right here and just come on guard. One of the, my favorite targets with the edge is the face. We have a saying in our knife fighting program that says, when in doubt, cut and stab the face. The Romans had two major targets for their short sword, their gladius, the face and the abdomen. When you cut somebody across the face, just drop that down a little bit, when I cut somebody across the face like that, diagonally across the face, it just totally wrecks their life. I mean, every morning, what we do when we get up and we take a shower, we look in the mirror and we shave and we comb our hair and we brush our teeth, we look at ourselves in the mirror all the time. We're all concerned about how we look. When I take that fighting knife and draw that thing across his face, he's going to be a ruin the rest of his life. No one wants to be cut in the face. So it's very disconcerting to cut somebody across the face. I like to make this stroke diagonally. Starting here at the forehead, I cut across the eye socket, cut through the nose, come off the mouth, and quite often you'll get part of the shoulder as you come off. Now, this isn't usually a mortal wound, but it's a horribly disabling, disfiguring wound. And you need to use this judiciously. Don't come in and take your fighting knife and, and cut somebody or slash them across the face unless your life is in danger because you got a good cha chance of blinding them you're going to scar them horrifically. You're going to probably cut through the nose. You're going to cut through their lips and through their gums. You might cut, knock some teeth out. You're going to cut across here the chin, and you're going to cut, cut across usually their shoulder. So it's a very disfiguring thing to do, and you have to make sure that you're in the right when you use this type of, 
uh, motion or cutting motion. You don't want to cut that face unless your life is in danger, all right? So you can cut the face either diagonally forehand or backhand. You can cut across the face on the cheeks, which is a favorite, a favorite saber cut. But I like to cut diagonally whenever possible. A lot of times you cut the face straight down, and we'll explain why later. But lots of times you get this straight down cut over the face like that. Very, very effective to cut the face. Now again, we have the neck on either side. You can cut in here, cut the cartoid arteries and the jugular vein. So you need to penetrate about an inch and a half deep to be certain of cutting these arteries and veins. So you want to get in there and get as much of your blade on that target as you can and pull through and cut that deeply. Hard as you can. A good, hard uh, cutting motion right in there on the side of the neck is very effective. You can also cut the front of the throat. Come in here sometimes, you'll get this as you go past. Again, your blade needs to bite at least an inch, inch and a half deep to be effective. Don't cut him superficially uh, on the neck. You won't get the desired result. You can cut the traps on either side. That makes them harder to use this arm. Um, cutting across the pecs, other than raking or harassing, doesn't really get you that much. So it's not that great of a target. You're not, unless you have uh, a bowie knife or a kukri, you're probably not easily going to be able to cut deeply through those ribs. Um, with a bowie knife or a kukri though, you can just cut in here, sever the ribs, and just keep going. You know, you cut almost all the way through the person. So that can be pretty effective with a heavy knife. But if you've got an 8, 10 ounce knife, you're probably not going to cut through the rib cage very effectively and get into the uh, internal organs. The abdomen though is really susceptible to your edge. Um, like I said earlier, there's just some cloth covering it and some skin, and after that, it's all spaghetti. Very easy to cut that soft tissue in the abdomen and get those intestines to flop out and uncoil, which is really disconcerting. I mean, you'll, you'll lose it when you see those, your intestines from your disemboweled stomach on the ground and you're stepping on them. It'll cause your mind to spin in a hundred different directions. It's a really good place to cut somebody. The Romans knew that when they stabbed somebody in the belly, it was all over. So the soft parts of the stomach are really vulnerable. Um, the front of the thighs can be cut effectively. When, you, when I talked about stabbing, I said it doesn't do you that much good to stab the thigh because the muscles run lengthwise and you just separate them. But when you cut them, you make them open up, especially when you cut them on a diagonal motion. If I cut Ron's thigh diagonally across like this, and I can get that to pop open, he's going to have a hard time walking. Those muscles are going to open up and they're not going to close readily again. So that can be a pretty effective place to cut somebody. Uh, I like to cut, again, like I said, cut diagonally across the thighs. You can also come in here and you can chop at the knees. Chop above or below the knee and cut the leg off. If you've got a heavy knife, that stroke has a really good chance of taking the leg right off. If you have a kukri or a bowie and you drop here, you got a really good chance cutting that leg right off. That's a fight stopper. You can also faint high and drop and cut the toe right off. Cut his big toe off or split the toe all the way up the instep like that. You separate that foot like that, he's not going to walk very well after that. He's going to be a one-legged fighter and very vulnerable to be finished. From the back, let's spin over here. The back of the neck is very vulnerable. Again, there's just skin here and exposed spine. You can chop here at the base of the cerebellum, take him out that way, sever the spinal cord. Uh, you can cut through the neck right here. Uh, and cutting attacks, you can cut the kidneys. If you've got a serrated folding knife or fixed blade that's razor sharp, those kidneys are very vulnerable to be cut. We have an instance in our files where someone defended themselves with a five inch Voyager folding knife with a um, serrated edge. And it was a situation where his friend was in a brawl and was being beat to death and he couldn't get the people to stop. So he grabbed the guy that was doing the most damage took his knife, he said, and just pulled one time on the kidney, cut the kidney right in half. He didn't even realize that he had put that much power in it. The adrenaline and that razor sharp edge did horrific damage. Cut him, cut that kidney right in half, and that stopped that fight right there. I mean, when the other people saw him bleeding and how badly he was injured, they desisted, beating his friend to death, and rushed him to the hospital, and he was able to rescue his friend from almost certain death. So the kidneys are vulnerable. Also, the hamstrings in the back and the Achilles tendon here. 
The hamstrings are vulnerable, especially with a big knife. But if you've got a really sharp 8 to 10 ounce fighting knife, just hold still, Ron. And I come in here and I give that a good cut, I've got a good chance of, of cutting that hamstring. Definitely the Achilles tendon. If I get down here and get in here and pull through, I've got a really good chance of cutting that Achilles tendon, having that roll up, and making him, again, a one-legged fighter. Those are your major targets for cutting. Now from the front, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about targets for stabbing, the hands and the arms are really vulnerable to cutting attacks, extremely vulnerable. Just a slash like that will cut a finger off. You come in here and you snap cut that hand, you're gonna knock two fingers off probably. If you can get on the top here and cut that thumb off, again, we talked earlier, he's gonna be four fingers woo. He can't hold his knife without that opposing thumb. He's not gonna be effective in wielding a knife with that hand when you cut off that opposing thumb that locks it in place. So cutting the thumb off is a really good target. The insides of the forearms, especially cutting diagonally across, very, very good target for your knife, as are the outside of the forearms. This is preferred but I certainly wouldn't shy at taking this if it was offered to me because it's very, very disruptive to his ability to fight. The bicep, again, you've got the brachial artery in here. It's not that far down. It's about an inch, inch and a half below the surface. You cut that and he's gonna bleed out. But in a minute or so, he's gonna pump dry. He's gonna be finished. If he doesn't get immediate medical attention from experts, when you cut that brachial artery right in here, he's finished. Very, very susceptible, especially to a serrated edge. Ooh, easy to cut that. Those are the main targets on the hands and arms. I like the bicep, the inside of the forearm, and the fingers. Your fingers and your hand are super, super vulnerable. That's why I want you to be really good with that speed jab and that snap cut and that slash, because it doesn't take much to get in, wreck those fingers. Once I cut a couple fingers off, he has a very um, difficult time holding that knife and you've changed his mindset. You've really degraded his ability to fight. So always remember, never pack, pass up a chance to cut somebody's hand. Also, you're showing mercy when you do that also. If I can end the knife fight by cutting his hand and the knife flies out, now it's up to my morality what happens next. We're in a bargain position. I don't have to necessarily go in there and finish him. He's finished. He's no longer an effective fighting force. So, um, I've really diminished him totally as a threat now, and I can negotiate his surrender at this point. So keep in mind these targets and think about them as you practice so that you can locate them instantly and attack them with great accuracy uh, at will. Now that you have a better understanding of how to use the edge and point of your fighting knife, I thought I'd teach you about the angles or planes or trajectories that a knife can travel to attack you or that you can use in attacking your opponent. Imagine that you're standing here and there's a big 360 degree circle in front of you, a big circle. On that circle, every one of those points on that big compass, uh, an attack could be launched. It can come from high to low, it can come from low to high, any way or anywhere on that compass, you can be attacked on one of those angles. I'm gonna have Ron come in here, and just stand there, Ron, and I'm gonna scribe this 360 degree circle around him. I can attack Ron at this angle. I can attack him at this angle. I can attack him at that angle. I can attack him at this angle. I can rise with my, my cuts. I can rise up. I can come straight up. I can come straight down. I can attack at these angles. We'll switch a little bit here. I can come this way at all these angles, all the way. They can constantly descend like this. Or they can constantly rise upward. So they can come this way. All those angles, okay? Very, very confusing and hard to judge and to see where all these attacks are coming from. It's hard to do, but in the Filipino martial arts, they've developed different numbering systems for these angles that are very effective in giving you the idea of the basic attacks. Most people attack in certain patterns. And in 1983, when I was uh, attending 
Dan Inosanto's college seminar. He taught me the 12 basic angles of attack, and I've used them ever since, and I've never had a reason not to use them. They really do work well in giving you a broad idea of all the different ways that your opponent can attack you and all the ways you can attack him. Now I'm going to teach you these basic uh, 12 angles. What I want you to do is I want you to follow along with me in the mirror in your training area. I want you to come on guard like this. Come on guard. And the first angle that I want to teach you is angle number one. That's a descending diagonal forehand strike at the neck, at the juncture of the neck, right in here. So that's where you're going to cut that line, descending like that. Number two is backhand. So this is number one, number two. Number three is a forehand cut across the abdomen. Number four is a backhand cut across the abdomen. Number five is any stabbing attack down the center line of your body, right up the center of your body. Any stabbing attack. Could be low, could be medium height, could be high. Any stabbing attack straight in the center of your body is a five angle. Number six is the descending diagonal thrust at inside the, the uh, clavicle at the neck, down in here like this, a descending diagonal thrust. Seven is a backhanded descending thrust. Eight is a forehand diagonal descending cut at the head, the side of the head. Nine is backhand, the same way. This is descending forehand. Nine is descending backhand. At the target is the head, like that. Ten is a rising cut at the thigh, but it could come higher. Normally we train it at thigh height, but it could come at the waist, it could come at the abdomen, it could come at the shoulder. It's basically synonymous with any rising diagonal cut. Number 11 is backhand from the other side. Thigh height, waist height, chest height, or neck height, or even head height. Any rising diagonal cut like this, 11. 12 is straight down or straight up. 12, you drop straight down, turn your wrist, cut straight up, right down the center line. Those are the 12 basic angles of attack. Now, keep in mind that you can cut these angles or you can stab these angles. I can stab a number one, I can stab a number two, I can stab a three, I can stab a four, I can stab a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 12. You can cut them, you can stab them, or you can combine them. It doesn't have to necessarily always be a cut. You can descend with a number one and stab back up. So I can cut down, stab back. I can stab down, cut back. You always have to keep in mind that the knife is very fluid, very evasive, very subtle. It can change its motion or direction in a heartbeat. Now I like to call Ron out here and I want to demonstrate these angles of attack on a live target. Again, you're going to get in your fighting stance. You're going to reach out and you're going to cut number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, number 11, number 12, and 12. Get with your training partner. One person's going to stand here like this as the target. The other person from just outside range, now don't smack him in the eye, whatever you do when you're doing this. Stand outside of range. He's just a visual representation of what you need to do. He's just a target. He's a reference point. So come on guard. Think about, I'm going to cut number one, which is a diagonal descending stroke at his neck. Down, like that. Two, backhand, same direction, like that. Three, forehand. Four, backhand. Five, straight stab at the midsection. Six, descending diagonal thrust in front and behind the collarbone. Seven, backhand. Eight, downward descending strike at his head. Nine, downward descending strike at the other side of his head. Ten, rising cut. Eleven, rising cut. Twelve, straight down or straight up. Okay? I want you to practice like that a lot. Cut these strokes in the mirror. You know what? It's a good idea. Why don't you follow along with me right now? Come on guard. Get in front of the mirror. Get in a good fighting stance. And, and are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. That's how I want you to practice it. Practice it a lot till it's second nature. And remember that on these angles, uh, 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 10 and an 11, or a 1, or a 2, they can descend at any target, or they can rise to meet any target. They're not necessarily just at your neck or just at your thigh. What we want you to do is get used to seeing descending and rising blows, straight stabbing attacks, all of these different angles intermixed. That's called line familiarization. The more you become familiar with the different ways that your opponent can attack you, these different lines or these different angles, the better knife fighter and the better fighter, period, you'll be. This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes, and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision, as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. In this fourth volume, I want to concentrate on defense. The first thing we're going to teach is defensive footwork. Then we're going to teach how to use your knife to counter slash and stop your opponent's blows. Then I'm going to teach you how to avoid cuts and slashes at your knife hand. And then I'm going to go into using your empty hand or a live hand defensively. And finally, I'm going to finish with the study of my, which is the study of judging distance. So let's start training. One of the ways to stay alive and uninjured in a knife fight is to develop an impeccable defense. One of the, the defensive methods that I want to teach you now is defensive footwork. We went over footwork earlier in this presentation and went over all our basic footwork drills. And now I want to show you the footwork you're going to use the most when you're acting defensively. The first is, I'm going to go back to that front leg replacement step. As you recall, in that front leg replacement step, we got in our basic fighting stance. And when we sensed or saw that opponent attack our front leg, we pulled it back, touched down, and came back. So you're going to pull it back out of the way, touch down, and come back in fighting. I'm going to move over here camera get a better angle. I'm going to pull back, vacate that space, and come back on guard. So I'm going to pull back, vacate the space, come back on guard.
So when you sense somebody coming at your leg, you want to pull your leg back and then come right back and be ready to attack and defend. I'm going to have Ron come in now and we're going to demonstrate this and then I'm going to show you how you can practice this at home. Come on in, Ron. I'm going to assume my fighting stance and Ron's going to attack my leg. I'm going to vacate and get out of the way. Vacate and get out of the way. Vacate and stab him. Vacate and cut him. I can cut him here. I can drop 12 on him. I can drop 12 here or I can just get my leg out of the way and step in. The main thing is you pull this fragment leg back touch down and be immediately ready to attack or defend because you don't know what's going to come. He could come up and cut me and I may have to parry right there. He could throw the rear hand and I have to continue my attack. All right. Now, the one, way I want you to train this at home is one person is going to hold his knife high like this because I don't want you, the person that's attacking, to run in and get this in the eye. So he's going to hold this up high. I'm going to attack Ron's leg and he's going to pull back just like that. I'm going slow to give him plenty of time. That's what I want you to do. One's going to be the aggressor, one's going to be the defender. You want to cut the inside of their leg. Hey, don't go so fast that your friend that you're practicing with can't defend. It doesn't do any good if you smack him continuously in the leg. Feed him at a pace that he can be successful in his defense, then switch off. Another defensive method that you're going to be using all the time as a knife fighter is what I call the single step retreat. I don't care whether you're on offense or defense, you're going to find the need to take one step backwards and make your opponent miss his attack as you can launch your counter attack. So I'm going to demonstrate that really quickly right now, but keep in mind that you're going to use this a lot, so you need to practice it. From your on guard fighting stance, we move over here so the cameras can see a little bit better. From your on guard stance, what I want you to do is push off, take one step, and come back. Push off, step back, and then step right back where you were. So you're going to give ground and take it back. Give ground, take it back. You use this a lot in boxing too, the same type of footwork. It's a little bit more abbreviated, but with a knife, you really have to move a lot further than you do to avoid a punch because the knife is. It has so much greater reach and it doesn't take any power. It just has to touch you with it. So you're going to have to move at least one full step back and then come back. So you're going to give ground, take a step, then take it back. That's the single step retreat. Give ground, come back. Give ground, come back. Give ground, come back. Earlier in this presentation, I spent some time teaching you how to move backwards quickly. When you're fighting with a knife, you're going to use backward movement a lot, especially defensively. Sometimes when you're moving around, your opponent is going to put so much pressure, you're going to find yourself giving ground very rapidly. When you come down, you better be on balance. I want you to practice this a lot. Get in front of a mirror in your training area. Look in that mirror. Imagine your opponent putting forward pressure on you and having to move backward and come down on balance. Let's try that again. Move backward quickly, come down on balance, ready to fight. You may have to squirt out to the side and circle. You may have to run, then get behind your knife. You always have to be prepared to move backwards quickly. Now, remember, when you're giving ground quickly like this, at some point, you're going to have to squirt out to the side. You cannot give ground indefinitely. He'll overrun you and kill you. So when you're moving backwards, you may have to push off and give ground to the side because you can't go back and let him drive you into a wall, you'll be killed here. Keep that in mind when you're moving backwards. Our long range knife fighting training program stresses forcing your opponent to get past your knife hand to reach you. That means that your knife hand is going to be one of his primary targets. He wants to cut this knife hand Disable it so you drop your knife so that he can attack your body in safety. We don't want him to cut our knife hand. We want to keep that knife hand in action. So I'm going to teach you a lot of ways now that you can defend. The first one is a basic you. I'm going to have Ron come out here. All I'm going to do when I see that cut or stab coming at my knife hand is I'm going to drop my knife hand down and circle up into a U-shaped motion. It moves like this in a U, in a U, just like that. So when he cuts real slow motion, I'm going to go like that. 
Backhands, I go like that. I just drop in you, drop in you, drop in you, drop in you, drop in you. Very easy to make him miss. Now, the beauty of this is, when you pull this defense off, you're in a good spot to counter slash him. Or, I can immediately come right in here and finish the fight. I can corkscrew right into to his face or neck with that U-shaped motion. I can either cut his hand or I can take him out. Depends on the situation, what I would need to do right there. If I need a quick kill, I may just come in here and kill him right there instantly when I make him miss. If I have more time to be safer, I might come here and cut him and see what that effect was. Maybe then I beat his knife, beat his knife out of his hand. Now I can kill him at will. The basic U, really effective, defense. Here's how I want you to train it. We'll switch around here again. Thanks, Ron, for your cooperation. I roughed you up a little bit on that one. One person's going to hold his knife hand out. The other person, the attacker, is going to cut his knife hand. Now, when you're working with your training partner, he's helping you. He's cooperating. Don't come over there and smash his hand like that with all your might. Go gentle at first. Give him a nice, long, straight motion that he can pick up. Aim right at his knife hand and continue. He's going to U out of the way. I'm going to cut it, Ron's knife hand, and he's going to U underneath it. I'm going to backhand. He's going to U underneath it. That's how I want you to train. Don't come in here and see how fast you are and bust him on the thumb. You'll lose a lot of training partners that way. Take it easy at first. Your goal is to help him learn how to make this defensive motion. All right? So don't go faster than what he can be successful in defending at. If you find yourself constantly hitting him, you need to slow down. All right? Let's try it again. I'm going to cut, 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 cut. Now Ron's going to attack my hand. Make a nice good cut at it. Ron did a nice thing there. What he did is he broke his rhythm to see if I was anticipating. That's the same thing I want you to do. Don't anticipate. Force your hand to be there and get it out of the way. Now, you can see him telegraph a little bit in his eye, in his shoulder, and in his arm. Sometimes you'll see somebody just a little bit of change of their focus before they go. You'll see it sometimes in their arm. You'll see it a little bit in their body. You've got to be alert to that. And when you see him go, you. 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 That's the way I want you to practice it. Another defense I'd like to teach you against uh, cuts or stabs at your knife hand is called the fold back. All you're going to do from your on guard fighting position is, as your arms are out here and you sense that cut coming in it, you're just going to bring your arm and fold it back into your body like this and then come back to where it was. So you're just going to fold it back, bring it back in tight to your body, let his attack go by, and then you're in a position to counterattack or move. So it just looks like this, just simply folding it back. Sometimes you could take your thumb and bounce the thumb of your knife hand against your abdomen. And that way you keep the blade away from your body and you have a reference point. So you just fold back and touch your thumb to your abdomen and get your hand all the way out of the way. The cut or the stab is coming at your hand. Your hand's out here moving around. He wants to take that hand out of the picture so that he can come to your body and finish you. He see, you sense him cutting or stabbing your hand, you fold it back. Just fold it back. Fold it back. Pull it back and come right back on the guard. I'm going to have Ron attack my knife hand really slow so you can see what I'm doing at first. I'm going to extend it so you get a little bit better picture. He's going to attack and I'm going to fold back. Now we're going to pick it up and he's going to go. Go ahead and cut it. Go ahead and cut it. I'm going to let him make contact a couple times now. It's almost a foolproof, uh, fail-safe way to avoid a cut or stab at your knife hand because you totally remove it. You're not ewing here. 
you're pulling it all the way out of the way. It's not sticking out at all. And it's his cutter stab is going to miss it by a mile. Just fold it back out of the way and you can come right back. You can fold back, you can pull back and come on. And come right back on offense, right away. You can come back. I like this one a lot too. When you fold back, stab up. It really is deceptive. You fold back and you stab right up the center line, just like that. You can almost always take him right underneath the chin into his neck. Remember that fold back. It's really effective defense against cuts and stabs at your knife hand. One of the things any good fighter will tell you is that you can't use the same defense repetitively. When you're fighting, you can't defend the same way time after time. Your opponent will key to that, he'll time you, and he'll take you out. I don't care if you're a boxer or a wrestler or a saber fencer. You have to vary your defense to keep your opponent guessing how you're going to react. One of the defenses I want to teach you now is what we call lift high. When an opponent attacks at your knife hand and you sense that attack coming, you lift your blade up. Lift it a little bit higher in your head and let that attack go underneath your knife hand and then you're in a good position to drop on it or stab him in the face. You, you don't use this all the time. You use it judiciously. Um, lots of times you fold back, you may you, you sense it coming and you lift your knife high. Let it come underneath your blade. You just vacated that space. His attack missed, now you're going to be in a good position to drop on him. Let me demonstrate this. Ron's going to attack my knife hand and I cut him and I cut him and I cut him and I cut him. Let's just go a little bit. Just like that. Here's how I want to train at home. One person is going to be the attacker. The other one's going to be the defender. It's the same thing with the basic U and the fold back. So when you attack him, give him a chance to lift that out of the way. Go slow enough that he lifts it out of the way. Go slow enough that he lifts it out of the way. Attack that hand. When you see him being successful, pick it up a little bit. Pick it up a little bit until you're getting him a couple times. You should be making contact maybe two out of every ten, uh, ten attempts, one out of every ten attempts. But any more than that, he's not learning. So slow it down so that he can learn this defense. Just like that. Now, remember, your opponent's uh, face is vulnerable. Don't stab him in the eye. Train safe and practice lift high. You won't regret it. It puts you in a great position to go ahead and attack, to finish an opponent very quickly. Remember I talked about that snap cut. When you lift high as a defense, you're in a perfect position to snap cut him on his hairline right here, on the top or crown of his head, right there, and drive all that blood down into his face and blind him. It's a really good way to set up that snap cut at the high line with the lift high defense. Practice it. The opposite of the lift high defense for attacks on your knife hand is the drop low defense. As I've said earlier, you can't have too many responses. You can't have too many variations in your response to attacks on your knife hand. I really like this drop low defense because it puts you in a good position to counter, particularly with a stabbing attack. You can't use it all the time, like I'm repeating myself, but I want to drive this point home, is you have to mix up your defenses all the time. It's really important. But when you see an attack coming at your knife hand, you can drop down. I almost drop the knife down to my thigh like this. Gets it all the way out of the way. Pulls that knife back, drops it underneath that attacking plane. That weapon's coming on, drops it underneath that, and poises me for that upward stab. I'm going to have Ron come out, and I'm going to demonstrate this defense. Lots of times you hit him in the elbow or in the face. Sorry, Ron, that didn't feel good. I clipped it right on the elbow. Even with that stabbing tip here, it doesn't feel that great. You can see how easy it is to take your opponent when you drop that knife down below his attack and then rise suddenly with an uh, upward plunging stabbing attack. Very effective. Train this at home like this. One person is going to attack. The other person is going to drop his knife out of the way. I'm going to have Ron attack me. 
I'm going to drop my knife out of the way and cut and stab back. Stab back. Stab back. So practice dropping your knife hand out of that plane. Stab my hand. Use the point. You can go to the abdomen too very easily from there. When you drop your knife down and clear that line, you can shoot it right underneath his arm, right there. You can shoot it into his hand, shoot it into elbow. You almost always catch something though if you drive upward in your counterattack when you evade by dropping low. You want to practice this, switch off back and forth. Now, remember, when you're raising, you want to put on a fencing mask for this. Don't even try this without a fencing mask. It's too dangerous. You're liable to stick each other in the eyes. So one person drops, the other person counters. Be gentle, be considerate of your training partner, and be safe as you train this. Circling your knife hand with a big motion using your whole arm to the right or to the left is another good way to avoid a cut or stab at your knife hand. What I want you to do to practice this is come over, get in your training area, get in front of the mirror, come in your fighting stance, and imagine someone cutting or stabbing your hand. As you sense that, I want you to circle your knife hand to the right and make a circle. And I want you to come back. Now, the same thing, I want to circle to the left. Circle right, circle left. I don't want you to do this. Just move your wrist. That won't get your knife hand out of the way. You've got to move your arm and vacate that space. Move your arm in a circle to the right and get it out of the way, and move it to the left and get it out of the way. So you're going to circle to the right, circle to the left, circle to the right, circle to the left. Come on out here, Ron, and we're going to demonstrate this. Ron's going to cut up my hand, and I'm going to circle. I'm going to circle. I'm going to circle all the way. I'm going to circle around, circle around. Kind of looks like the U that we taught earlier, except you can corkscrew off this motion right into his face, right in right into a stab, right into a stab. This corkscrewing motion is really effective. It's both defensive and also leads right into your offense. So you really want to get good at practicing the circle motion like this. Cuts at you, he stabs at you, same thing. See what I mean? Really effective. Now, to train this at home, again, one person's going to be the aggressor, one person's going to be the defender. When Ron attacks, I'm just going to circle out of the way. Circle out of the way. Circle out of the way. Now, again, I want to stress, you have to make a pretty big motion. Don't just go like this. It looks like you're doing something, but in effect, you're not moving your arm, you're not moving your wrist. It's really staying in the same spot and you're likely to be struck. So make your whole arm move, move, move. As you advance in doing this, I want you to practice stepping in. As you circle or corkscrew, you're going to step in behind it. Just like that. Just like that. Like that. Like that. Practice this at home. Again, because of the danger on these motions, I really prefer you to wear a three weapons weighted rated uh, fencing mask when you practice this technique. Another option for defending cuts and thrusts at your knife hand, getting your hand out of the way, is what I call angle out. When you angle out, you need to combine footwork with your defense. You say you're in your on guard fighting stance, you sense or see that attack coming at your hand. Sometimes you'll take about a half step to your right Turn your wrist and feed him the point just like this and he'll run into the point first. So it's almost like a stop hit which we're going to get to later but it's a really good response when it's used judiciously to cuts and stabs at your knife hand. You can also do it to the opposite side, angle out this way. Sometimes you want to move your whole body and get it out of the way. Sometimes you can do the same thing, you can angle this way and stab up or you can turn your point this way and intercept his hand. But remember that when you're using this angle out defense, it's a little bit more vulnerable to a vertical whip. A vertical whip quite oftentimes penetrates this defense, so you need to be aware of that. 
Now we're going to show it. Just like that. When you're training this with your training partner, I really prefer when you train this at home that you put on a fencing mask and you put on your hockey gloves. One person will feed like Ron did, the other will defend, and then you switch roles. Try it, work with it. It's a good varied response in your bag of tricks on defense. If you want to be proactive in the defense of your knife hand, if you want to be proactive in keeping yourself from being cut or stabbed in the knife hand, I suggest you learn how to use evasive hand patterns. When you put your knife in an evasive pattern, your opponent is going to have a hard time catching up to it and cutting or stabbing it. Um, the first one I want to teach you is continuous circling. I'm going to have Ron come out and I'm going to show you an evasive hand pattern using continuous circling to confound his attack and make it hard for him to cut or stab me. Go ahead and go after him. When you sense him keying to you moving to the right, move to the left. See, when you're circling continuously like that, you're making it hard for him to cut you or stab you. It leaves you in a good spot to attack, like that. Another way to confound your opponent's attacks on your knife hand is to use an evasive pattern that mimics the letters in alphabet. Sometimes I cut my initial L in the air like that. Sometimes I'll cut a Z. You can start at the bottom and work to the top, start at the top, work to the bottom. Sometimes I'll cut a W like this. Sometimes I'll cut an N and I'll work it backwards. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I'll cut a B, a B, just like that. You can, as long as it's a gross approximation of that alphabet, what you want to do is give a pattern that he can't key to. When you're cutting letters, you cut that Z, you cut that L, you can cut a D, cut a D, cut a D. Keep moving and keep your hand in motion. That's the main thing, and you're varying where your blade's going constantly, so he has a hard time keying on that. One of the ways that you can practice this is to stand in front of the mirror and just practice cutting an L. You can cut an L like that. You can cut an M. You can cut a W. It doesn't matter. As long as you're keeping that knife hand in motion. Pick a letter you like. Get five or six letters that you're familiar with making those motions and practice them in front of the mirror. Then put on your hockey gloves and your fencing mask and have your training partner come out and attack your hand with cuts and stabs and you use these evasive motions to keep your knife hand safe. That's how you can train that at home. Once you think you've got down the previous evasive patterns I've taught, here's some more that you can use. I use these all the time in my knife sparring. The first I want to show is from our fighting stance it's a diagonal pattern like this. All you do is you move your knife hand diagonally from your shoulder to opposite hip, just like this. When you see your opponent key to that, switch sides and cut from the opposite shoulder to your uh, forward hip, just like that. That's diagonal evasive pattern. Try to keep it in that window of motion we showed earlier in here. Don't go too high, don't go too low. Just keep it going like this, then switch. Whenever you see him key, switch. He's going to give you a signal. He's going to see in his face, hey, I'm catching on now. I'm catching on. When you sense that, switch to another pattern. 
Here's another one I use. Just a horizontal motion like this from side to side, just like this. This is a very good pattern. It leaves you in a really good position to parry. I'm going to talk about this later when we get more into defense but, uh, and, and counter cutting and using the knife actively to defend with. But this side to side horizontal motion like this is really useful when you sense an attack coming at your face. Your knife's in motion and you can pick it up wherever that attack comes very easily. A hand in motion is a lot faster than a hand that's still. If it's in motion, you have a lot better chance to react quickly than if your hand is still. A still hand is really dangerous in a night fight. You're really exposed. We're going to go into that later too. So keep that hand moving in an evasive pattern. Just like this. You can come up and down like this with your knife. Just like that, vertically, up and down, all the time. Again, when you see him, key to that, move it side to side or diagonally, either way. Just like this, just like that, just like this. You can go to the side to side this way, too. But go past your body. Try not to get outside that window of motion in any of your evasive patterns. Work on those. They'll stand you in good stead. Now I'm going to have Ron come in and I'm going to use some more of these evasive patterns I just taught now to avoid cuts and stabs at my knife hand. Just like that. Use your fencing mask and the hockey gloves to protect yourself. The last defense I'm going to teach in this presentation for avoiding cuts and stabs at your knife hand is what I call changing distance. When you're facing your opponent in your on guard fighting stance, you don't have to keep your knife hand in the same position all the time. You can move it, move it evasively and you can move it in and out. You can extend it and you can pull it back. You can keep varying the distance that your knife hand is between your, you and your opponent all the time. It can be close to him or you can pull it back to where it's far away from him. So you can constantly vary this distance. I want to show this from the side. I'll extend my knife hand out, fold it halfway back, put it all the way out again, fold it all the way in, put it out halfway, all the way out, fold it halfway back, all the way out, all the way back, halfway out, all the way back. You can constantly vary the distance that your knife hand is from your opponent. So he has a hard time getting a fix on it. When he cuts and stabs it, he thinks it's out here. The next millisecond, you brought it halfway in. He, he tries again there, you fold all the way back. Now you come all the way out again. You fold back, out, he never knows where that knife hand is going to be in the space separating you. Very hard for him to get a fix on it to stab or cut it. I'm going to have Ron come in here in a second and we're going to show this. See how Ron has a hard time getting a fix on where that is? Scary, isn't it? When you miss, that blade's coming at you. It's really scary. Practice it at home a lot. Now I want to talk about how you can use the point and edge of your fighting knife to thwart attacks on your knife hand or on your person. How you can actually stop him from landing cuts or slashes on your hand or on your body or your face, your legs. The first defense I'm going to teach is the stop hit. 
We're gonna have Ron come out here. Ron, if you just stand there for a moment. A stop hit is using a fast direct motion to intercept a slower motion. If I see Ron wind up to cut number one, I can intercept that with a stop hit. Try it again. See that? I can stick my point of my knife right in his mouth, rock his head back, and, stack, and stop his forward motion. So you can use the point of your knife to stop hit. You can also use the edge of your knife. The same thing. When I see him to come up to cut me, I can intercept his motion. Before he delivers that cut, I can intercept with my own cut. So what you're going to do is the basic principle of stop hitting is you use a faster, straighter motion that gets there before your opponent's initiated attack. Just before he starts his attack, I go with a faster attack. If he's going to cut um, number three at my stomach, I can intercept that with a straighter, faster thrust to his face. If he's going to backhand me, I can stick him right in the forearm before that cut even gets launched and stop it dead. That's how you stop hit. Now, it's really useful to you learn how to use your point and stop hitting because you keep your body further away from his knife. Every time I use my point, I'm the length of my blade further away. When I use my edge, I have to get closer to apply that edge. When I use that point, I'm further away. So when he cuts, I can move away and intercept his motion with a faster motion using my point. It's really important that you learn to use your point and stop hitting. You can train this at home, and here's how I'd like you to do it to start with. One person puts on his three weapons rated fencing mask and his hockey gloves and his trainer. What he's going to do is he's going to cut the 12 angles of attack very slowly. You're going to cut one, and I'm going to stop hit. Number two, I'm going to stop hit. Number three, I'm going to stop hit. Number four, I'm going to stop hit. Stop there. Notice, I don't stand there like a pillar of salt. I have to move. I have to move to get the right angles to apply my point to. Number five, I'm going to get offline. Six, I'm going to stop hit. Seven, I'm going to stop hit. Eight, I'm going to stop hit. Nine, I'm going to stop hit. Ten, eleven, twelve, and twelve. I'm going to stop hit all of those attacks. Practice those using both the point. Now we're going to go again. You can do the same thing with the edge. You see that and you stop hit it. You stop hit it. You stop hit it. You stop hit it. Just like that. 1 through 12, trade off, go back and forth, get really good at trying to see that attack as it first forms, just as it starts, just as he gets ready and launch your own counterattack and get there first. Stop his motion dead with a faster, straighter motion of your own. That's how you stop it. One of my favorite ways to use a fighting knife defensively is in counter slashing. I like to use the edge to um, cut an incoming arm or hand and destroy it. When someone reaches out with a weapon and tries to cut me, if I can't stop hit, I'm going to counter slash. If I can't see it early enough to intercept that motion with a faster, straighter motion of my own, I'm going to try to destroy that hand so it doesn't come again. I'm going to try to cut that arm so severely that that person can't wield that weapon a moment longer. I'm going to show you how we do this. I'm going to have Ron come out here. When you practice this at home, the best way when you start out is to go with those 12 angles of attack. You may be tired of hearing about those by now, but keep practicing them because they're going to build line familiarization into your psyche. It's going to come into your subconscious to where when somebody cuts at you, you don't think that's the number one. Just cut anywhere. You react. You see it instantly. Now, when you're training, I want you to use your peripheral vision. Be hungry. One of the, the main things that you can do to improve your defense with a knife is be hungry to see. Be hungry to see that attack as it first develops. Be hungry to see it as it progresses. Be hungry to move and get out of the way. Every time, and I'm going to go back to our diagonal footwork now. When I see him cut one, I want to move. I don't want to stand there unless I'm so slow or I'm so confused or I'm, I, I, sometimes you're just frozen here like a pillar of salt and he cuts and you're stuck there and you still can't move and you, but you still have to defend. When possible though, I want you to move. I want you to get an angle. Let me explain why. As Ron's cutting, this cut's going to go all the way around like that as he pulls that back to himself. It's going to develop it's, most of its power right here just about here. It's going to start losing power as it returns. Okay? If you want more time to react, you want to step to what we call the zero pressure area. He has almost no force over here. He has lots of force right here in that cutting stroke. 
But as that stroke, cutting stroke continues around, it loses power. So if I step diagonally in, I have more time to deal with that. I have more time to see that stroke, to analyze it, to judge it, and to counter it. The other way that I can deal with that attack is instead of going to the zero pressure area, is to step away from it, outside, this way, here. That's perhaps the safer way. If you have time in a knife fight and you have some room, the safest thing is to get out here and intercept it and counter slash it as you get away. Get clear out here, get your edge on it, pull it through, wreck the arm. But sometimes you want to go here and destroy him instantly. So your movement depends on your space, your geography, your topography, what's around you. You know, if you've got a bunch of tables and chairs all, the, all over the place, you may not have the luxury of stepping back. The only thing you can do is go here and cut him and get out of the way. That may be the only move you can make. But as you learn to counter slash, the first place to start is with this following the 12 angles of attack. So Ron's going to cut him one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. Again, be in motion. Keep in movement. And practice your diagonal stepping. Get used to stepping this way, then stepping back. Get behind your knife. Get used to stepping this way. Get behind your knife. Just like we taught you earlier. Practice this until it's second nature. A moment ago, I taught you about counter slashing. It's really one of my preferred ways to stop an incoming knife attack or an attack with any weapon. I like to cut that hand or cut that incoming arm and destroy it. But sometimes you can't do that because your feet are in blocks of concrete. I can't explain that phenomena. Sometimes you just can't move. You feel like your feet are super glued to the floor and you can't move them. When that happens to you, it's a good idea to know how to block with your knife. Now, the way I want to teach you to block with the knife is to use your edge and put it up and intercept and stop dead that incoming attack. Ron comes out here and he slowly cuts from number one. I'm going to block that. Now notice I didn't cut through his arm and I didn't chop through his arm. All I did is I took the edge of my training knife. Remember this is a, supposed to represent a Bowie knife. And I stuck it here and stopped dead his forward motion. Now, the danger is that I may not have damaged this hand. Now, it's not good for anybody's forearm to run into a 17-ounce razor-sharp knife edge. That's not going to do anybody a lot of good. But since there's no motion, we don't know if that edge bit or not. We don't know if it sheared in there or did it just stop it doing superficial damage. I don't know for certain that I destroyed this arm. Now, when I stop him dead blocking like that, Ron's free to pull back and cut me and cut my hand as he withdraws. Try it again. I block and he cuts. I block and he cuts me. I block and he cuts me. Just like that. Right across the thumb. I'm telling you, even with the trainer that time, that didn't feel good. If that was a razor sharp knife, I'd be like our famous four fingers woo, holding my knife with four fingers and not very well at that. So that's the danger in blocking. But it's a lot better to block the knife than it is to take it in the face or take it in the neck. Now, you can su supplement your blocking sometimes. If I block this knife, I block it, I can knock it out of the way. I block it, and I can pass it to the other side, like that. You can use your live hand. Now, we're going to be touching on that in just a few minutes, and how to use your alive hand, your extra hand, to help you. And you can use this defensively, too. So, sometimes when you stand there they're blocking, you want to pass it to the overside. Sometimes you block it, you just want to shock it out of the way, so you can get your own stab in. One of the ways that you can practice blocking is the same thing as with counter slashing. I'm not going to bore you with endless repetitions, but he cuts one, he cuts two, I block, he cuts three, I block, he cuts four, I block, he cuts five. Now, there's not as much foot movement with blocking because if you could move, you'd counter slash him or you'd counter stab him. You wouldn't stand there like a pillar of salt and just put your knife there. But with blocking, it's, it's a last desperate attempt to keep that knife out of your gut pile or out of your face. You can block, 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 block. Now, as you get better, I want you to put in 
your live hand. We're going to teach you more how to use that later, but always remember that this hand can help you. It can help you get them out of the way, and you can just take them to the ground like that very easily. All right? I want you to practice blocking. One person attacks, one defends, and then you switch. Hey, don't put so much speed and power in it that you're overcoming his defense. Give him a good chance to defend. I'm going to go slow, slow, slow. Make big motions that he can pick up, OK? Don't sit there and like that when you're first starting, all right? Give him a chance to get some skill going for himself. Try it, practice it, make it your own. Learn how to block, live a lot longer. Now I'd like to add to the instruction I just gave to you about counter slashing and blocking. Um, the skills that you learn in blocking and counter slashing will also stand you in really good stead if you're ever in a situation where you're attacked by multiple unarmed opponents or by an opponent where there's a huge disparity in force. In other words, this opponent is so big, so strong, and so heavy that your chances of emerging from that altercation without being gravely uh, injured are very, very small. When you face a huge disparity of force situation where the opponent has overwhelming advantage in you in strength, size, height, weight, reach, you might think about using a weapon. Because when you're in that kind of a situation, for instance, a professional wrestler attacks a 200 pound man, that pro wrestler may weigh 320 pounds. He could probably bench press 500 pounds. The average 200 pound man can't even bench press his body weight today. He can't even bench press 200 pounds. There's a huge difference in strength and experience and size and reach. And that person that's not armed um, has got no chance without a weapon. He's going to get beat to death. So when you're facing that or multiple attackers where three or four people are beating you and pummeling you and kicking you, to try to defend yourself with your hands and feet and emerge without going to the hospital gravely injured, your chances are very, very slim. At that point, a knife will stand you in good stead. Now, you can use your knife to defend yourself against punch and kicks just as easily as you can another knife. If Ron comes in, I'm going to have him leave his knife in for a moment. If he attacks me with his knife and then punches, I can pick that up too and counter cut that. It's very easy for me to cut that. So Ron, I'm just going to have you go and then put your punches in. Just like that. You can pick the knife up, you can use your live hand, and use, use your knife to pick up his cuts and his punches. As I mentioned earlier, the face is a prime target for an experienced knife fighter. Lots of people crouch and give you their face. A lot of people aren't uh, aware of the fact that the face is a really good target. They think the abdomen and the torso is the target when it's really the face. The face is a great place to cut or stab somebody. It stops them almost 99% of the time. A good stab in the face, the Romans found that out thousands of years ago. It finishes people. They're done. They don't want to fight anymore. If you don't want to find your opponent's knife in the middle of your face, I suggest you learn how to parry. We're going to teach you how to parry right now. All a parry is, is using your knife to redirect your opponent's incoming knife or knife hand out of the way. You're just going to push it out of the way slightly so it misses. I like to combine a parry with a step to the side. I'll step this way or I'll step this way as I parry. What I want to do is get my body off his line of attack. If someone is stabbing me right down my center line like this, I want to get out of the way and parry. Don't stand there like a bag of cornmeal. Move, okay? Move. Don't stand there when someone's trying to stab you. Always move and parry. Now Ron's going to come in. He's going to go really slow motion. There's a couple of different ways that you can parry. I prefer the best parry is to actually cut his knife hand or the weapon hand. I don't care what weapon it is. If you can get your knife on it and damage it so he can't come again, that's the highest and best use of the parry. When he comes, I want to get over here and cut his thumb and fingers off. When he comes, I want to get over here and cut his thumb off from the back side. That's the highest and best use of the parry. The problem is, the thrust to your face is really elusive. It's fast. If it comes right between your eyes, it's extremely difficult to see. Because the way our eyes are ma made, we can't see stuff that comes right directly between our eyes very well. It's hard to pick that up. 
So a stab at your face can be hard to pick up in time. Quite often, you won't have the forewarning to counter slash or stop hit. You won't be able to parry on his hand. You'll actually have to parry on his blade. If I parry late on his hand, he's hit me. See this? I've already ate his blade. Sometimes I have to come here on the blade and get out of the way. Quite often, I'm so late in picking that up, if I go to the hand or the arm, I eat his knife first. No good. That's definitely not good enough. So what you have to do is get offline and pick up his blade. Pick up his blade. Pick up his blade. Don't stand still. Now, to practice this, you've got to wear your fencing mask, always. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit more now without it so I can instruct. But don't, don't do what I do. I'm breaking my own rule here. Your eyes are too precious and too easily damaged. Don't risk them practicing. So Ron's going to stab, and I'm going to move. 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 Now, you can parry from right to left. I can knock his knife off to one side or the other. I can use the edge or flat of my blade. I can even use the back of my blade to parry with. I can get over here and knock it this way. Now the advantage of that, I'm, I'm going to give you all the information about knife fighting. When I use the back, of my, the back of my blade to parry with, like this, I knock it off. But now here's my edge over here. I want the camera to see that. That's my cutting edge. That goes right in his face. It's an instant quick kill. Here, here, just like that. It's the same way from this side. I pick it up here and cut him that way. Use the back of my blade to pick it up and go forward and slash his face and finish him very quickly. So there's lots of ways you can parry. You can parry up. You can get up underneath them like that. One of the things I like to do, let's come out and try that again. He's going to stab me in the face, then I'm going to parry up. Lots of times I use my alive hand to wrap this hand. There's a break right here. If I can't get the break, I at least shock him and move him for a split second, and I tie him up. Now, to win a knife fight, you only need milliseconds. It's not one second or two seconds. I need a fraction of a second. If I can knock his knife up and circle his arm here, just for a second, he's going to free that arm in less than a second. I know he is. But if I can shock that arm and hold him for just a millisecond, I can kill him. Or I can drag him down to the ground where I can finish him. So you need to practice the parry all different ways. You need to step off to the side and redirect it. You need to use the back of your blade, forehand and backhand. You need to lift it. When you lift it like this, you can kill him instantly. You need to practice the parry in all of its variations until you're an expert. My heart's desire is to give you the very best possible defense. I want you to have all the information and all the skill that I can give you to defend yourself when you're using a knife. To do that, I want to move into teaching you now how to use your alive hand more actively in self-defense, how to use it to defend yourself in a knife fight. One of the things I'm going to teach first is the stop hit. I showed you how to stop hit earlier with your blade using the edge and point. Now I want to show you how you use your live hand to supplement your blade's point and edge. So if Ron cuts number one at me and then he loads up to cut again, before he can get off, I can throw my own cross. So to show that again, he cuts and I hit. Get in my hit before he unloads with his backhand. That's one of the ways that you can stop hit. It's risky though. You need to have a clear opening. Sometimes though, your knife is so positioned that all you can do is stop hit. You see him go, bang, you put in the stop hit. You see him go, bang, you put in the stop hit. It's not the very best defensive thing you can do. I'd always rather use my knife than my live hand. But when your knife for that brief moment in time isn't available, it's comforting to be able to use your live hand to hit with and to stop his motion. There's other ways to stop hit. We're going to work off the number one attack so you can see it. I can stop hit his hand here and stop the motion. I can stop hit on his forearm. I can stop hit on his bicep. Or I can stop hit on his shoulder. Let's switch so the camera can see that. I want to get about right about that angle. I can stop hit here. I can stop hit on his forearm. I can stop hit on his bicep or his shoulder or his face, just like that. Stop hitting is risky. Just like when you're blocking. When I block something, he can pull and cut me. When I stop hit, he can move 
and cut me. Like if he goes to my stomach and I stop hit, he could come right around that up to my head. And all I can do is raise my arm. When, when, he, um, when someone tries to stab you in the stomach, you can use your live hand that way to stop hit. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Let's switch here so you can maybe see a little bit better. Whenever you're intercepting a stabbing attack, especially a hard stabbing attack at your abdomen, I don't want you to make contact and stop hit this way. I don't want your thumb on one side and your fingers on the other. It's just going to push your thumb back. It's not going to work. Your thumb and fingers have to be cupped and they have to all be on the same side of his wrist or his forearm. But they all have to be working together. You cup it, you drop your body weight, and the optimum thing to do is to pin this arm into his thigh or push it over here to his opposite hip and pin it just for a millisecond. That's the optimum way to stop hit. When he's cutting at you and you stop hit here, remember he may go with his other hand and punch you. You need to pick that off. So you stop hit here, he may come here and you have to go to do something else. So whenever you stop this line, remember there's another line that may go. He may fire his other hand. So you stop hit here, he may pick this off, he may go again, he may go again, and you can kill him right there. Okay? But I want you to be familiar with stop hitting. You can practice this. One person puts on his fencing mask, gets his knife out. The other person puts on a pair of leather gloves like this and has his training knife. You come up, you get in range, and the, this person, the initiator, is just going to cut one through twelve. So cut one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12. Okay? That's the way you can practice it. Get used to it. Get used to this, using this live hand to stop his motion with a stop hit. Looks kind of like a straight arm in football. You're going to stop that motion dead with this straight arm like that. You can straight arm the face. You can straight arm the chest. The main goal is to stop his forward motion as quick as you can when your knife isn't available. Yes, I'd much rather cut him then stop hit him. Sometimes though, this isn't available for whatever reason, then it's handy to know how to use your live hand to stop hit. Another way to make the best use of your live hand is to learn how to use it to beat your opponent's knife out of the way and create an opening for your knife. You use this hand to open a passageway for this blade. I'll show you how you do it. Have Ron come out here. Ron comes on guard. I see Ron has got this obstacle this barrier between me and his torso. I want to get that barrier out of the way. I can beat it out of the way this way with my knife. I can actually knock it out of his hand like that and beat it out of the way. Or I can reach him with my live hand this way and knock it offline, beat it out of the way while I kill him. Now, the key to using your live hand to beat with is you have to take a step as the same time your hand goes forward, you have to be stepping. Because you have to close the distance separating you very, very quickly. If I want to beat his knife hand out of the way, I've got to move in on him instantly. Just, and my only goal is to dominate this hand for a millisecond. Not a second, not a half a second. We're talking about a quarter of a second here. Just get my hand on this long enough for me to get my blade in. Just so it doesn't move. I knock it out of the way, disrupt it, dominate it, control it, if you will, just for a very, very brief period of time. Now I can beat it to the side, or I can beat it down this way. So if I see his knife is here, and he's not paying attention, I'll beat it down like that. I want to trap it against his thigh like that, and kill him. I'll show you again. From here, like that. It isn't even good to step on him. It's good to step on his foot if you can, just like that. It disrupts his balance horribly. Just like that. You can step on him and kill him. So you can beat the knife from the side and down. You can e even beat the blade. If you can't reach the, reach the hand, if he has a single edge knife, the edge is usually down. You can cut him to the flat of the blade and beat it out of the way, or you can come to the top or back of the blade and pull it down. A double edge knife, it gets riskier because there's an edge here and there's an edge here. So you can't put your hand on the top and you can't put it on the bottom you can only hit flat on the sides. Now to do that, make sure your hand is flattened out like this. 
See that? Don't let it curl for that edge to bite on. Keep it flat. Keep your hand flat and beat that blade out of the way. You can beat it forehand or you can beat it backhand. You can use the back of your hand here and give yourself an opening for a quick kill. Now, earlier when we first started this tape, I was talking about the advantages and disadvantages of different fighting knives. If you're going to insist on carrying a tactical folder, you need to pay really close attention on how to use your live hand. Your blade is so short, without this hand to supplement it, you're not going to fare very well in a knife fight. So you're going to have to get really good at moving obstacles, moving a longer blade out of your way so that you can get your short blade in and kill somebody. You've got to practice this a lot. Train this at home. For your partner's safety when you're moving, make sure he always has his fencing mask on and it's a good idea for you to wear one as well when you train. Switch roles, train it often, and it'll do you good. When I can, I definitely prefer to use my fighting knife or trainer to parry with. But if that's not available, if that's out of place or out of time or out of motion, it's just not handy at that particular moment in time, I still will not hesitate to use my live hand to parry a thrust at my face. I don't want to get anybody's knife stuck in my mouth or in my eye or between my eyes or in my nose. I don't want anybody to stab me in the face with a knife. I prefer to deal with it with my fighting knife and cut his hand or direct it out of the way. But if that's not available, some reason I won't hesitate to use my live hand. Again, just like in beating, I told you you want to keep your parrying hand flat like this. Don't curl your fingers and it's easy for when you hit something for the edge of his knife to hook there and cut you. Keep them flat. Keep your thumb and fingers in a line like this and use the flat of your palm or the flat of the back of your hand to parry with. Now what I'm going to demonstrate is a little dangerous because I'm not wearing a fencing mask. Don't you um, duplicate it at home. Whenever you practice these drills, I want you to make sure you're wearing your fencing mask. I'm going to leave mine off so I can talk. Ron's going to come out here and he's going to stab me in the face. Just a little faster. Notice I don't want to stand still. When Ron stabs, I want to move and get out of the way and get out of the way and get out of the way. Move. Sometimes you move your head like that. Don't leave, your, don't leave your head here stationary. Move your head. Your head actually should move almost before your hand does. When you see this coming at you, move your head. That's more important than anything else. Move your head out of the way and use your hand to parry with. Use your hand. Parry. Move it out of the way. Now remember, like we said earlier, if you're late, you may have to parry with your live hand on his blade. I prefer because I get more control on his wrist or the uh, front part of his forearm. But if I have to, I'll go to his blade. Try to move it with the flat of your hand offline. Recover yourself and kill him. If you have to use this, it sure would be nice to be able to counter with your blade and finish the fight because this is risky. This is scary, but it's not near as bad as taking his knife in the face. So I want you to practice getting used to parrying, getting out of the way of his knife and using your live hand. Use your knife sometimes and then put in your live hand. Switch off. Parry, 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 and stab him just like that. Using your live hand to block an incoming attack uh, from your opponent's knife isn't the optimal defense. The best thing to do, like I said earlier, is to stop hit it or counter slash it. But sometimes, for whatever reason, all you can do is block that incoming knife using primarily the outside of your arm. I prefer to use the, the back of your hand and the outside of your forearm because if you're going to take a cut, which we're going to try to avoid, but if you're going to get cut, you want to get cut on the outside. As I said earlier, the inside of the forearm and wrist control the muscles and tendons that allow you to grip your knife. If I have to switch my grip from my right hand because it's injured to my left hand, I still want to be able to grip this knife. So I want to protect my ability to continue to grip a knife. That's why whenever possible, you want to use the outside of your arm or the back of your hand. Sometimes though, you're going to be found your, uh, forced to use the palm, especially on attacks that are coming at you with a bent wrist. Sometimes when you use the back of your arm, those attacks go right around your defense or your passive block and they strike you in the face of the body. So 
There's no set rule. You can't always just do one thing. You have to uh, adapt to the situation. You have to be alert at all times. To make blocking work for you, you have to be hungry. You have to be ready to use this empty hand to save your life. I'm going to have Ron come out, and we're going to show you how to block slow motion at first. Ron's going to attack, and I'm going to block. Now, notice, when I come low, when he stabs low, I've got to drop my butt. You don't bend over here like this with your legs straight to block. Bend your knees, come down. Now, it's a good idea to look up. If he throws the other hand, maybe you do this and kill him right there on the spot. Okay, so remember, when you're blocking, there's something else that can come. Maybe you have to come back here, wipe his eyes, and stab him. That other hand can throw, so don't get so focused on just the knife that you forget that he has other weapons he can employ also. Let's go a little faster now, Ron. That's an idea of how you can use your live hand to block. Now, to drill this at home, what I want one person to do is to come on guard in their fighting stance, and the other person is going to feed them the 12 angles of attack. He's going to cut one, and you're going to block. He's going to cut two, you're going to block. He's going to cut three, you're going to have to step to block. He's going to cut four. Now, when you see cuts coming at your abdomen, forehand and backhand, you need to knock those down. If you just do this, then quite often they'll slide right underneath you and cut you. You've got to knock those things down. When he cuts forehand, you've got to knock it down. Optimally, I would have liked to have done this, but this is, remember, this is out of commission for whatever reason. So I have to come here and block it that way and stop it dead. Now, he can pull back and cut me just like that. That's the danger of blocking. It's not perfect, it, but it's better than nothing. Train this a lot. Remember, your eyes are vulnerable. Wear your fencing mask. It's not pleasant. You're going to have to endure some bruising on your forearms to get good at blocking, but it's worth the effort. It could save your life. As I mentioned just now, whenever possible, I prefer not to use my alive hand to just passively block an opponent's attack because there's always that possibility he can pull back and cut me. Instead, I like to use steering. Now what you do when you're using steering is you're intercepting his cut or stab and you're redirecting it to a safer position so that you can launch a counterattack or get out of the way and get some distance between your opponent. Now, the way you do steering differs um, if you have a knife in your hand or you don't have a knife in your hand. Uh, I have certain options open to me when I have both hands available to steer, and some of those options are closed when I only have one knife hand to, or one empty hand to work with. Uh, also, I want you to keep in mind as we do these training exercises with the alive hand, that this is training, this isn't knife fighting. We're just isolating elements of knife fighting so that you can learn them and practice them at home. You're not going to take six cuts in a row like this in a knife fight. It's over by then. If you're standing at that range, it's over by then. What we're going to do is we're going to keep working on this so that you can pick up that first cut or that second cut. You've seen all those angles of attack so many times in your training that without thinking about it, you can pick up the one or two and get in your own stroke and finish the fight. So don't be surprised when you're training if you miss some of these and they go home. They're going to. Bruce Lee said that if two equal fighters are fighting at close range where neither one of them has to take a step to reach the other one, the defender is doing very well if he can pick up and defend against 50% of his opponent's attacks. In knife fighting, you have to be a whole lot better than that because you can't allow any of them to go through if you don't want to be maimed or killed. So working on your defense is extremely, extremely important. Now, let's get back to steering. When Ron cuts number one, I can intercept this and move it out of the way. Or I can try to get on the other side of it here. So what I can do is I can meet it and I'm going to have to adjust my hand here and swing it out of the way like that. Now notice, I got to hollow my body out or I swing his blade right through my gut pile. So if I meet it on this side, I absolutely intercept it on this side here. We call that meeting the arm. 
If I meet it, I've got to hollow out. Lots of times, I'll step back like this and vacate that, spa that, vacate that space. Now, as you do this, swing his arm and throw it. Don't just let go over here like this and go like that. It's still there. Do this. When you throw it, you can barge him just like that and sail him. All right? So it's really important that whenever you're redirecting something down at your stomach, you hollow out and give some space for that knife to go through. The other way that you can intercept this attack is to step back and get on this side. Let's show it from this angle. I'm going to get on this side of his arm, and I'm going to follow it and direct it over to this side. Again, if I'm successful, I can almost pin his arm here, step in, and barge and knock through him, just like that. So you have two options when you're steering. You can meet the attack, or you can follow it. Now, if I don't have a knife, my options are a little bit better. I'll meet the attack, and I'll steer it out of the way. Cut one, cut a little higher here, and I steer it out of the way. If he cuts number three, I can use this arm. Now look, if I have a knife in my hand, I can't drop the knife, reach over here and do that. That'd be stupid. If my knife's not available, I'm going to do this. Now, I might come in here and try to capture his arm just for a split second. If I don't move on that arm, he's going to use that arm. He's going to cut me. So if you get here, try to capture that arm. Step in on it. With practice, you'll get it. When you feel this, you just curl up around it like that and circle it. And now, you've got a lot of options. Get sensitive on your arms and your hands. When you feel something hit here, it's easy, once you've done it a few thousand times, to wrap it like that. Oh, people say, oh, you can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. When I first started studying Kali in 1980, I said no one could sidestep a knife thrust. It wasn't until about 86 of nonstop practice that I found sometimes in sparring, I'd actually get out of the way of a knife thrust. I said at that time, it's impossible. No one can do it. It's superhuman. It's not. Don't judge other people by the, your lame ass. Just because you can't do it right now doesn't mean that you can't do it in the future. Learning how to steer is really important. It can save your life in a knife fight. Here's how you train it at home. One, put on your fencing mask. One person gently is going to cut. He's going to cut one, steer it out of the way. He's going to cut two, steer it out of the way. He's going to cut three, drop on it. Now, notice when he cuts three that I have to drop my body weight and knock it down as I steer it out of the way. He cuts four, same thing. I knock it down. He stabs five. I move out of the way. Now, I wasn't really able to steer it in a good spot. I pushed it out here. Now, here again, I'm going to wrap it like this. Now I can put it in the knee, in the knee, and I can drag him down. Bang! And strip the knife. Go through the 12 angles of attack very slowly. Give your partner lots of time to practice. Come in here, Ron. Practice meeting the blade or practice following the blade. Sometimes, if I see that back hat coming, I'll come here. I'll follow it. I'll get on this side of it. Now, when I follow it, I want to fling it out. Sometimes exactly that will happen. You'll throw it so hard that it'll come right out of your opponent's hand. I want you to work with this, experiment with it, practice it. Every time you get to knife fight, practice, practice this meeting and following, steering your opponent's blade to a safe area. I've been training in knife fighting for the past 23 years. There hasn't been a week hardly that's gone by that I haven't trained two or three times in knife fighting during that week. Over this time period, I haven't found a better way to use your live hand defensively than to consider this hand as if it was a knife. Anything else is too slow. And we're going to get into this, especially if you're unarmed against the knife. Right now, I'm going to teach you how to use your hand, your live hand, as a knife against an opponent armed with a knife. And it's the same scenario that we've been talking about. Your own knife, for whatever reason, is unavailable for your defense or offense at that particular moment in time you're being attacked. You have to use your live hand. The best way to use this is to think about it as being a knife. Now, I'm going to drop that so I can illustrate. Right here on your uh, palm, you've got a thick pad of flesh. Just blow your little finger. There's a little thick pad of flesh and muscle right here. That's your striking surface. That's the edge of your knife. You use this to cut into your opponent. You can cut into his arm. 
You can cut into his face. You can cut into his neck. You can cut into his collarbone. You can cut into his body. Anything he throws at you can be cut into with this portion of your hand right here, this fleshy portion right here. It's shock absorbing, it takes up the shock of the impact, and also concentrates all the force of your arm, shoulder, legs, hips, everything. It's concentrated on a narrow area. When I was training with one of my uh, training partners, Manny Marquez, and Manny is a semi-pro uh, football player, and he could take a tremendous punch. He's a great gifted natural athlete. Um, he can hit you so hard with the left hook that when you cover it, he knocks you almost a half a step sideways. Really, really good athlete. And one day we were training and it didn't seem like anything I could do would make an effect on him. I took off the 14 ounce boxing gloves, put on my leather gloves and used those. Just as an experiment, I hit him one time on the cheek with the edge of my hand and it was a fight, fight finisher. Just one time like that, bang, that penetrated. He didn't want any more of that. I'm telling you, this edge of the hand really works, especially when you're defending yourself with your live hand. Now, what I want you to do is, when you see your opponent's incoming attack, I want you to cut into it. Now, again, you're gonna hear this a couple times from me. I don't want you to be mamby-pamby about this. Now is the time to tr attack that arm ferociously with your spirit, with your might, with your power. Everything in there, you're gonna consider this a knife this is the knife edge, I'm gonna chop his arm off. Right here, bang! That's what happens quite often is, remember I told you, the tendons and muscles that control that grip are on the inside of the arm. When you attack that, quite often you loosen his grip and he loses the knife. You can attract on the thumb or the fingers if you have to. You can hit the bicep. I prefer though to cut in here, diagonally right in this area on his arm with the edge of your hand. Not only does it shock his grip, for a moment, a millisecond, it makes his whole arm vibrate. It shocks it backwards. Ron can tell you how does this feel, Ron, when I do that. Do you feel like cutting me at that moment? Do you feel like it? Do you think you can counter cut? At that moment in time, bang, I cut that. It's not pleasant. I'm hitting him hard. I don't like him. I hate him at that moment. I hate his guts. I hate this, and I'm coming for his life right now, just like that. That's the attitude you have to have when you're using your hands as knives. Now to train this, <clears throat> we're gonna do it just like we did with the, just the different blocking drills. One person is gonna cut one through 12, the other one is gonna feed him those angles. You know, he's gonna feed him one through 12 very slowly. The person that's practicing, the defender, he's going to cut in to that arm, to that arm. Now, notice, I have to adjust my stance, my position to get the right angle to intercept. I just can't stand here very well and just cut a few angles. I can't stand here like a block of salt and do this. It's much more helpful if I move. If I move, 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 if I move. Practice your body English, your body mechanics. Get used to adjusting your body so they can get the edge of your hand on the target. I just showed you how you could use your live hand as a knife to intercept and stop your opponent's attack with both point and edge. I also want you to understand that if you don't have a knife, your best way to defend yourself is to consider both your hands as knives. A knife attack is so evasive and elusive, it's so frighteningly quick, and that knife can change direction so many times before it gets to you that anything, any other mindset is too slow. If you don't think your hands as knives, if you don't use them as knives, you'll never be able to keep up with, with the fluidity of an opponent's knife attack. Uh, all this other stuff just won't work. It's too slow. The only thing that's fast enough is to have the same mindset as the person with the knife. You have to be a knife fighter too, but at that moment, you don't have knives. You don't have another weapon. All you have is your hands and feet. You have to think of your hands as knives to keep up with this attack. I'm gonna have Ron come in here and I'm gonna demonstrate this. Now, the main thing is you want to be relaxed and you don't want to be rigid. You have to be really supple and you have to have an extremely heightened sense of alertness. You have to make your eyes go way out here. You wanna get your peripheral vision. Think about your peripheral vision. You wanna see all of this person. Don't tunnel in on a small area because you'll miss some of those cuts. You wanna keep your gaze, gaze wide as wide as you can. Also, you want to press into him with your spirit. You got to push in, 
to him with your spirit. If you don't, you're not going to even last a second or two. He's going to overcome you. You have to push in with your spirit. You also have to have the attitude, you're going to hurt him. You've got two goals. You're going to either hurt him so badly that he can't continue, or you're going to hurt him badly enough that you can escape. Listen, whenever you can, run from a knife. No one is paying you to stand in the street with some thug and knife fight him. You're not going to get a million dollars for it. They're not going to take out an ad saying you vanquished some punk in a knife fight in the middle of the LA Times. There's nothing in it for you. Always run. Your ego, your will, uh, your reputation, none of that counts when you're being maimed or killed. All right? Always run from a knife. If you can't, you're going to have to fight. The best way to fight if you don't have a weapon is to use your hands as knives. If Ron cuts number one, I'm going to attack him. If he cuts number two, I'm going to attack him. If he cuts number three, I'm going to attack him. And I'm going to keep attacking him. Let me spin Ron around. I can strip it. Now I can kneel, kneel. I can hit him. I can step over and arm bar him. Just like that and finish. Break his elbow and he's no longer a threat. Lots of ways for you to use your hands as knives. The main thing is you have to have tremendous forward pressure, forward energy, that you don't like this person. You show him absolutely no respect. No respect. He's not your training partner. You don't care anything about him. You hit his knife hand, you hit his face, you hit his neck, you hit his face, you hit him, and you're constantly kneeing him and elbowing him. You get that knife and you strip it out of the way. Now you can stab him with it if you want. That's the mindset you have to have when you don't have a knife and you're facing a point that does, keep your hands as knives. Think of them as knives. Cut into him, injure him, take his knife away, take him out. To train this at home, I have Ron come back in here. What I want you to do is one person is going to be the aggressor, the other one's going to be the defender. If you have a fist helmet, I'd like the aggressor to put on a fist helmet. I have Ron bring that in. A fist helmet gives Ron really good protection. It's got a good face shield, it's heavily padded. Uh, you can go pretty hard against a, a tough opponent wearing uh, a fist helmet. If he doesn't have something like this, you have to show him so much respect that you lose a lot of your ferocity in your defense. What I want you to do is if this is accessible to you, uh, one person is going to attack, the other person is going to cut into that attack with his knife and he's going to deliver simultaneous defenses. Just like that. I wipe his eyes, backhand him, palm strike him. You don't, if you get this knife, just like that. I went a little rougher than normal because most training partners aren't going to let you do that to them. If, you're, if you have an average training partner, you're going to be able to do this. Use your hand as knives. Now, simulate the hit, simulate the hit, simulate the hit, simulate the hit, simulate the hit. Just like that. You're going to have to simulate it. What I want you to get used to, though, is cutting in and attacking. Don't stand here, cut into his arm, then attack him. It has to be like that, simultaneously. Practice like that. Getting used to using your hands as knives will also be of great benefit to you in self-defense situations where there's no weapons involved. You can use your hands as knives against an empty hand attack as well as an attack involving weapons. You can cut into your opponent's arms and legs, you can cut into his body, you can stab him with your fingertips, you can hit him with your palms, uh, you can slap him, you have all the other uh, tools at your disposal too. You can use your elbows, you can use your knees, you can use your feet. You can put in all of your natural weapons, but getting used to using your hands as knives will make your responses very, very fluid and very fast. There's nothing faster than a knife. Why? Because again, to reiterate, a knife does its job without requiring power. There's no power involved with a knife to be effective. So all it has to do is be fast. To keep up with that, your hands have to be fast too. That transfers over into empty hand defense. We're going to show you in slow motion how you can use your hands as knives to defend yourself in a street attack. I'm going to call Ron in here. All I want you to do is come into your, your knife fighting stance. 
Same knife fighting stance. Bring your hands out in front of you. Now these are knives, just like this. You can pick off his jab. You can pick off his cross. You can stop a combination just by stepping into it and cutting back, just like you do in a knife fight. When he jabs, crosses, I cut into his face with my own. You don't have to wait for his third punch. You get used to, in knife fighting, you get used to stepping in. That's going to help you a lot in a street altercation. Someone takes a big haymaker, you're hit simultaneous. You see that punch coming, you cut into it, and you cut into him. If he throws on that side, same thing. If he throws two haymakers, people come in like this, swinging wild. And you get used to that. You cut into that. You watch that motion, just like that. Finish him. Your hands are knives. If he tries to kick you, you can come in here and take that easily. Here's another kick. Take him down again, just like that. Think of your hands as knives. Anything he does, you cut into it, just like that. Knife fights are won or lost with a half inch or an inch or an inch and a half. It only takes a half inch of your blade across your opponent's face to wreck his knight. You're going to destroy his life with running a half inch of the tip of your blade across his face. It only takes an inch of your blade run across somebody's abdomen like that to disembowel them. You're going to cut through the, the shirt, you're going to cut through the skin, the muscle wall, those intestines are going to flop out. Hey, he's finished as a knife fighter right there on the spot. Judgment of distance is absolutely crucial in a knife fight. Until you're a master of judging the distance separating you and your opponent and the reach of your knife, you'll never be an expert knife fighter. Perhaps the greatest masters of judging distance were the Japanese samurai. Years ago, they understood how important the study of distance was. They called the study Mai. The Japanese warrior that was really capable knew within a fraction of an inch just how long he was away from his opponent. He knew the distance between the tip of his sword and his opponent to the hair on your head. That's how accurate it was. He knew it perfectly. He knew exactly when he could touch you and at what distance. And he knew when his opponent could touch him. You have to become an expert at my. You have to become an expert at judging the distance separating you and your opponent and where you can touch him with your knife and where he can touch you. And it's complicated because as we're teaching you in those footwork drills, um, different footwork methods allow you to greater reach. Um, if I take one step, I have a certain amount of reach. But if I lunge, I have even greater reach. I can stab this way, I can take a step and stab, or I can lunge and really reach out and touch somebody. You have to know your range to your opponent, and you have to know the range to him. I can't emphasize this enough. Here's how you can work on increasing your knowledge of my and become an expert at judging distance. Get your training partner. I'm going to have Ron come in here. Ask him to just come in an on-guard stance. Get opposite him in your on-guard stance. There should, you should be able to touch him with your knife without taking a step. Can you touch his hand? All right. Here's a really good distance to start it. I can touch his hand with my knife. Now, can I touch his form with my knife? without taking a step. Yep, I have to lean a little bit to touch it though. Can I touch his alive hand without taking a step? I have to lean and turn my shoulder. See, there's things you can do to add reach to your knife. One of them is you can bend your knee and lean. You can bend your knee, lean, turn your shoulder, which makes your arm longer, and extend. You can also change your grip from a forward grip to palm reinforced grip. That's going to give you even more reach. All these factors you have to take into account when you're studying distance. Once you know accurately the distance that you can reach your opponent, you need to change up. Now, where can I reach him by taking a little step? Can I reach him here? If I'm facing Ron here, can I reach him? Nope. Can I lean? Uh, just barely. So come back a little bit more. Can I reach him by 
bending my knee and leaning. Not quite. So at this distance, look at we're about four and a half feet separating ourselves right now. I take a small step, bend my knee, lean, turn my shoulder, bang. That's the distance right about here where I have to take even a small step to reach him. Now, what if I get back here? What if I take a bigger step, lean, and turn my shoulder back and change my grip? Can just barely reach, uh, reach him. What's my lunge distance? What's the maximum distance that I can reach his hand with a lunge? I say, based on my judgment, it's about six feet. This may be, may be right about here for me. I take a big step, turn, and reach, and I can hit him with a lunge. Okay? That's a long ways away. Some of you tall guys, you guys over six feet, you can stand seven, maybe seven and a half, eight feet away from your opponent. <sighs> Most people don't think that you can take one step and stab them in the hand from here. This is what sets apart our method of knife fighting. We want to fight at long range. I want you to know to a fraction of an inch where you can touch your opponent at at any point in time and where, just as importantly, he can touch you. So you have to practice. You move around him. Where can I reach Ron's hand with a flache? Can I reach it from here? Pretty easily. Look where my foot was. Look at the distance. It's a good six feet almost between my foot and his. Let me step back about another half a foot. What if I take a big step and lean? Nope, I just fall short. So I know I have to be a little bit closer when I flache. My distance for a flache is right about here, about six and a half feet. Again, I'm only five foot nine. If you're six foot four, you could be a foot foot and a half, depending on how long your, your arms are and legs are, further away than I could. Some of you guys, I dare say, could be eight and a half feet away from your opponent with your front leg and still reach him with one single big flache or lunge. You really have to practice developing your ability to judge reach. Now, it's not just to the knife hand. You need to know, where can I reach his lead shoulder at? Can I, I can reach his hand from here. Can I lead, reach his shoulder from here? Just barely. Back up a little bit. Can I reach it from here? Ah, not really. I'm going to have to take a little step. Maybe you have to take a little adjustment step to the side. I'm going to show you this later in strategy, but lots of times you can ch change your space or the distance um, that's separating you and your opponent by just real subtle motions. You make a, just a little bitty angling step in like this. Lots of people won't pick that up especially if you bring your knife up at the same time. You do this, and I have it, just about have it, just like that. So you have to learn what little small adjustments you have to make to get the reach that you want, to strike the target you want. If you can't strike that target without taking a step, you have to judge how big a step do I have to take. The bigger step you take, the more warning you give your opponent. If you can take up space without him noticing it and stick him in the hand, that's the best thing to do. You always want to take up space without alerting him to the fact that you're taking up that space and closing that distance. You need to know where you can reach his face at. We've talked about in this uh, presentation so far how important the face is at a target, but the face is defended by this knife hand. It's a long ways in to that face. There's a good 18 inches between Ron's knife hand and his face right now. Where can I stab him at the face at? It's a good target. It's usually a fight finisher. I want to get that face, but I have to be pretty close. I can't reach it from here, no matter what I do. I'm going to have to take a step. I'm going to have to take a little step to reach that face. I can step this way, too, and reach the face. So it's not always all off your lead leg. Sometimes you take up space with your rear leg. Sometimes I take it up this way. Sometimes I take it up this way. You have to be subtle. You have to be clever. The more clever you can become at taking up space and closing the gap, separating your opponent without him noticing, the better knife fighter you're going to be. You have to train to know what your reach is to his torso. So back up and think about it. Can I reach his torso here with a lunge? I think so. If you reach it pretty easily, you might have another inch or so that you can move back. What's your flache distance? Can I reach him here? Yep. Look at where my front foot started. I'm a good six feet away almost from Ron. Experiment with this. Get your training partner, one person comes on guard, and practice 
um, developing and knowing what your reach is to all the different targets. His face, his lead knife hand, his forearm, his shoulder, his torso, his leg. Get familiar with where you have to be to reach those with all the different attacks at your disposal. That's the study of my. Now, the same token, you have to be just as familiar where he can reach you. You don't want to wander into his range and be unaware. A guy like Ron like this, he can cut me here with hardly even taking a step. Just bending, okay? When you're this close, man, you have to have, be on red alert, all right? You, we're now right back here, I know he almost has to take a step to reach me. I still have to be alert, but not near is on fire and red hot as I do when I'm in this close or this close. Back here, I still have to be alert. When I'm out here, I'm pretty safe. Let's switch. You need to know I'm out where you're outside of his lunge or the shade distance. He can't take one step and reach me from here. Try. Falls way short. Okay? Those are the things that you need to do. And you also have to be able to do them with different sizes of opponents. Try to train with the people with different body types as much as you can when you knife fight. Tall guys, short guys, thin guys, fat guys, they all have advantages and disadvantages. They all give you different reactions. They all give you different feedback. Experiment. Practice this a bunch. This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes, and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision, as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. In volume five, we're going to concentrate on offense. The first thing I'm going to teach you is to how to recognize the many openings your opponent's going to give you in his stance and his fighting method. I want you to become very expert at recognizing the, the many, many common openings he's going to get, uh, give to you. Then we're going to move into how to create openings yourself, what you can do to make an opening or an opportunity in your opponent's defense so that you can land a telling attack. And finally, we're going to go into strategy, some of our basic fighting strategies that we want you to employ as a long-range knife fighter. So let's start training. If you want to become a highly skilled knife fighter, you need to be aware of all the openings that are present in your opponent's defense. 
There's lots of common openings that you'll uh, notice once you become aware of them. In the following presentation, we want to teach you how to recognize common openings so that you can take it full advantage of them, stay at long range, cut or stab him, disable him, and move in and take him out with minimal damage to yourself. When you recognize these openings, it'll give you a good opportunity to score with no possibility of his counterattack hitting you. So let's get busy. Perhaps the most common opening you'll see in your opponent's defense in a knife fight is what I call a still hand. For a millisecond, you'll look for your opponent to hand his, to hold rather, to hold his hand still. If he holds his hand still, for even the briefest moment, he's really vulnerable to being attacked at that particular uh, moment in time. So you want to look for a still hand. If Ron comes on guard and his hand is still, it may be moving around, in and out, and all over the place, and all of a sudden it holds still. It's, I've seen this in all kinds of positions. Sometimes people hold their hands still up here. Sometimes they hold their hands still as they move. Sometimes they, they're moving their hand around and they, they, they rest for a second or their mind shifts or they're thinking about something else and their hand will be still for just that long and then it'll start moving again. Look for the slightest, slightest bit of time in which that hand is still. And when you notice it, you have a huge opportunity to land unopposed, to get in a, a stab or a cut and get out totally unopposed. When he comes on guard and his hand is still, like I taught earlier, he's vulnerable to an upward stab at the bottom of his hand. He's vul uh, really vulnerable to hooking stabs, forehand and backhand. Have him switch so they can see the backhand. I can step to my left, turn my point, and drive it into the back of his hand and break those metacarpals. All I do is just take a little step here and turn my wrist and drive the point in. I can hook it into his fingers or I can drive the point into the back of his hand. I can come over the top and attack his thumb when his hand is still on the inside. I can come over the top and attack his index finger and the top of his, of his hand this way. I can come to the outside and stab his forearm when his hand is still. All kinds of good ways to attack his hand when it's still. Here's some ways to attack with the edge. I can move to this side and snap cut as I go away. I can move to this side and slash his fingers as I move away. Here's one I really like. When the hand is still, I'll come in here, I'll bring my blade up, and I'll ride it right down the side of his blade, just like this, and cut his thumb off. Let's switch so they can see that action. So hold your hand still like that, Ron. I'll bring my blade up like this, and I'll run it just down like this. See how his thumb is right here? Flick, just like that, it'll hit the floor. It's hard to see because you're going right down his blade, just like that, and hitting his thumb. It's hard for him to see that stroke, but it's really effective. You hit that thumb, his four fingers woo, and he's going to have a real problem holding on to that knife. You can cut the bottom of his hand when it's still this way as you move away. You just move backwards, look over your shoulder, and then you just snap cut. As you go past, you snap cut as you go away. You can vertical whip when his hand is still. When you see his hand is still, just move a little bit to the side like this to get an angle. Let's switch so maybe the camera can see. Let's give it go about three quarters there, here, like that. When I'm straight in front of him, his blade's in the way. I want to get my knife in here. So when I vertical whip, I'll step here and I'll just come in here like this and cut on the top of his wrist like that or reach out and cut his forearm. Lots and lots and lots of openings when his hand is still. Look for it. When you're watching television at home, maybe you're on the treadmill, pull out this tape. I train and study constantly on the treadmill. I walk on the treadmill at least four times a week for six miles. When I'm on the treadmill, I have a training tape in there. I'm studying something. When you're walking on the treadmill, take this tape out, practice identifying these openings. Watch them again and again and again. If you think about it, when you're fighting, all of a sudden you'll see, still hand! and you'll take it instantly. You'll see still hand, and you'll take it instantly. You'll see still hand, and you'll take it instantly. Burn that in your mind. A still hand, a hand that's not in motion, is really vulnerable to your initiated attack. When you see that, get off. Attack him, get out, win the fight. When you're fighting, I want you to watch for what we call a still forearm. This is another terrific opening that allows you to do a lot of damage and get out unscathed. What I mean by that is as you're moving, sometimes you'll see your opponent cross his arm like this and he'll expose his forearm. He'll either 
close it like this or he'll open it. Sometimes he comes up here and he'll hesitate to attack. Sometimes he'll come this way and give you the inside of the form, but mostly you'll see the back of the form right here. Um, in preparation for attack, sometimes he'll cross. A lot of times when someone does a, a, is gonna start a vertical whip, they'll cross like this. As he crosses, lots of times they'll hesitate, just for a split second. That's why you have to have um, the, these opportunities or openings drilled into your mind. You have to recognize them instantly. In a millisecond, you have to recognize that is a still form. I can get that and get back out. There's a clear opening in his defense only for a very tiny portion of time. No one stands there like this forever and goes like this and gives you their form to attack. You see it for only a small amount of time. I'm going to have Ron come out here. And let's have him stand three quarter to you, about like this. There you go. Ron's going to expose his form. He's going to exaggerate this. But see this beautiful target right here? You've got everything from the wrist to the elbow. I usually like to come right in here with a vertical whip. If I see that him, uh, somebody exposing the form, I'll vertical whip like this. I almost never stay there in the same spot though. After I cut it, I'm moving. You can also snap cut, give me the same opening, you can snap cut that very nicely like that and you're out again. You lean in, snap your knife down and come back out just like that very quickly. The other way you see it is, let's come over here, is he starts to raise his knife to attack and you cut him here. Anytime, sometimes he'll come out this way. He comes wide, you see that arm open up, and you attack the inside of the forearm. Um, I frequently see people come up and they don't know exactly what they're gonna do because I've changed my position. I don't stand still. When someone starts to faint me, I move and wreck whatever they have going on. But when I see his arm come up, I take it. He brings his arm up and I take it, just like that. Watch for that exposed forearm, either crossed or open. Take it when you see it. I want you to remember whenever you see your opponent hold still for even the smallest amount of time that he's vulnerable. People can only move so long, then they stop to assess things. They, when you change, think, oh, what is he trying to figure out to do? Anytime you see somebody hold still and not be in motion, they're vulnerable. I'm gonna have Ron come out here. And let's switch Ron and get on this side. Come on guard. When you see him still, you have lots of opportunities. His leg may be vulnerable. The outside of his elbow may be vulnerable. His shoulder is vulnerable. When he's still, you can move and take a flank. Let's spin, be on the other side. When I see that he's still for a split second, I may step over here and cut down this flank. I want to move away from his knife and engage that side. When he's still, he may think I'm moving away from him and I reach back and cut him, just like that. He's vulnerable to almost any attack you want to make because his knife hand is in motion, his body's not in motion. Things that aren't in motion can't react very quickly. That's why I told you earlier, when you're moving your hand like this, you're in a good position to pick off a thrust at your head. When he's holding still, he's not in a good position to attack or defend. Watch for it, take advantage of it. People are creatures of habit. When they're fighting, they often repeat the same thing over and over again. Earlier I taught you a number of evasive hand patterns. Watch for your opponent to make a repeating pattern. Sometimes they'll move their knife from side to side just like this. As they're moving around, they're gonna go like this. Sometimes they may move it up and down. Sometimes they may move it diagonally. Watch for a repeating hand pat uh, pattern. Watch for anything he does repeatedly. Remember I told you in evasive patterns, if you don't change your pattern around all the time, he's gonna key to that and he's gonna lock in on it and he's gonna cut you. I want you to do that very same thing. I'm gonna have Ron out here. Ron's just gonna scribe very slowly an L. He's gonna come down and make an L. Just make an L in the air. Now, I'm gonna watch that pattern for a split second and I'm gonna tell when he's vulnerable. As he makes that L again and again, as he comes down here, see what happens to his elbow. As he crosses, that elbow comes out for a split second. So I'll watch that pattern and then I'll cut into it at the appropriate time. Let's switch, just keep cutting that L. As he comes here and gives me that, I'll pick that off. Because I see what's poking out in that invasive pattern. How I can come to him, I stay away from his knife because I don't want to get close to this. Our goal is to cut him, get out. Make him bleed and suffer, we're leaving, okay? When I get that cut, 
I'm going to come out here now and see what happened. Maybe now I'll come in here and cut his hand. When I cut his hand, he drops his knife. Now I cut him again, and I finish him right here. Step on his knife, kick it away, throw him on the ground, and get him some more. All right? Look for a repeating hand pattern. It could be an L. It could be a C. It could be a D. I don't care. Um, it could just be erratic. If he's coming erratically, you can cut a number 12. When he's being erratic and you can't tell what his pattern is, cut straight down. Most of the time you get him. We're going to come back to that, emphasize that further. Look for a repeating hand pattern. Don't let him notice that you picked up on it though. When he's repeating, don't let him know that you noticed that. And at the appropriate time, you move in and cut him. But look for a repeating pattern. Almost everybody does it when they're knife fighting. Take advantage of it. People make mistakes in their fighting stance all the time. They expose their body unnecessarily and unwittingly. I want you to learn to take advantage of it. One of the mistakes that they commonly make is they expose their elbows. Sometimes in their fighting stance, they'll let their lead hand, they'll let the elbow turn out as they move around. Or they'll let their live hand side, they'll let their elbow turn out. I want you to look for that. I'm going to have Ron come in. And I'm going to have him turn three quarters here like this, Ron. Just come on guard. Now, I want you to turn your right elbow out so it faces out like this. Look for this. Lots of times when they're moving, that elbow will turn out. When you see an elbow turn out, it's a good opportunity for you to come in with your knife and just clip off the edge of it. What I like about tacking, tacking the elbows is it keeps me away from his knife hand. I can come over here and just cut the edge of that elbow. Stay away from his knife hand. Look over here. Sometimes I'll look in this direction. Look over here, but step there. Sometimes my whole body will turn here. As I turn here, and then I step this way. And I come in there, and I just clip the edge of that elbow. If you've got a heavy knife, like a Trailmaster or a Laredo Bowie, and you come over and clip the edge of somebody's elbow like that, you're going to shear that bone off. You're going to bust it. That elbow is going to be screwed. He's not going to be able to use that knife arm. Now, this is a very light trainer. This only weighs about three and a half, four ounces. We're talking about hitting this with something that's 15, 16 inches long that weighs 17 ounces that's razor sharp. You come in on that elbow and you smack it like that, it's finished. Let's roll to the other side. Sometimes you'll turn, let's have him face the camera a little bit. You'll turn this elbow out. The live hand, instead of being pinned here next to um, their pec, they'll let this drift out. They'll let the arm drift out. This is a really great target. Look at it. When you see that, I'm exaggerating, but when you see that elbow come out on this side, ah, thank Jesus, because you can come over here in relative safety. Now, remember, when I step to attack that elbow, I want to get my body behind my knife as fast as I can. So as soon as I step here, I'm going to cut, and I'm going to turn and get my body behind my knife. When I step over here, I want to get my body behind my knife as fast as I can. Because even though I cut this, he may go, and I want to pick that off. All right? Just because you cut somebody doesn't mean that you can stop your defensive awareness. When you get this cut in, he may go here, and you can finish him. All right? But you have to be really alert. Try to always maintain a good defensive posture yourself. When you get that cut in, pick that one off. Pick that off and kill him. Watch for exposed elbows. When you get it, it's a good opportunity to attack. One of the best ways to win a knife fight is to make your opponent move. When, people, when you make people move for any length of time, I'm talking about even four and five seconds in a knife fight, the tension starts to break them down and they make mistakes. One of the mistakes you want to look for is an exposed flank. When Ron comes on guard and I get him to move sometimes, I'm going to get behind my knife. Sometimes though, as he's following me, he forgets to keep his knife in front of his body. Right now, he's got an exposed flank. The best way to attack that is to continue, no, just stay there, Ron, is to continue, you stay there, you continue your motion around that. You want to get to his rear. The safest place to be in a knife fight is directly behind somebody, okay? So when you see his flank exposed like that, keep moving around it. Even take a big step, pivot, and cut him. All you want to do is get a piece of that flank. If I can get over here and cut the outside of his arm, if I can get over here, bend my knees and cut the outside of his leg, I'll take it. Sometimes the best thing to do is to take a step this way, 
switch hands, cut him, and keep going like that. Look for that exposed flank. Any time that his body is in front of his knife, this side, this flank, is less defended. I'm not saying that he can't defend it. He could take a step here and turn to defend, but it's slower and more awkward. He's in a more precarious position. You may have a really good opportunity to attack then. So when you see an exposed flank, take advantage of it. Cut the arm, cut the elbow, cut the leg. You could come around this side and give him a quick speed jab. Maybe you take the spleen there on the left side. Maybe you get here and you poke him in the kidney. Hey, three inches from your tie pan in the kidney, ah, oh, he's in a world of hurt now as a knife fighter. He's gonna, his ability to fight is gonna degrade very rapidly. So take that flank, there's lots of good targets. You can get over here and you can stick him in the neck. Hey, it's not all just about the arm. Yeah, I'll take the arm or I'll take the elbow a lot of times because it's closer than the neck. The further I can stay away from my opponent and injure him to a good degree is safer for me. If I can get over here and cut him as I'm moving, hey, I'll take that. But if I'm really beating him on the turn, if I'm really turning and I beat him and I can stick him in the neck as I go by, I'll take that too. Watch for exposed flank. It's well worth it. As I've mentioned, one of the preferred targets in a knife fight is your opponent's face or head. Lots of times, we said earlier, people will crouch and they'll lean forward and they'll put their head forward. They'll get their head forward like this. Forward like this. Sometimes they'll raise their arm. Sometimes they'll raise both arms like this. But they'll crouch and they'll lean their head forward. That makes their face and the top of their skull really vulnerable to your knife. I'm going to have Ron assume that position. He's going to crouch. Look how close his knife hand is to his face. He has very little time to intercept my knife hand before it hits his face. Just a fraction of a second to parry. If he's not spot on, I'm going to hit him far before he parries, okay? When I hit him, his parry doesn't count. His head already went back. Anytime you can get anybody's head to go, and I've said this before, I'm going to reiterate. When you stab the face, the reason I like it so well is the head rocks back. When the head rocks back, he can't see anything below his face. Once I get his chin up in the air, his eyes go up. He can't see anything here now. So I get this up, and I can cover his knife, and I can finish him. So when you see somebody's head rock back from your strike, right, pin that knife hand. Remember we talked about beating it out of the way? Beat it out of the way and kill him. Keep that forward pressure on him. Stab him, lift. Now look how I see how I keep the forward pressure on? I keep that forward pressure on him, just like that. Now, here's another thing. When he's crouching like this, you can fake out his hand, right? Fake out his hand, and just like that. When you want to bring him down, come down and come up with your own knife. When he crouches, he lowers his head, makes it easier to get on top of his skull right here on the scalp and snap cut him right there. It makes it easier to snap cut in his face. When he crouches, it makes it easier to slash his face or to stab his face. Look for someone to crouch. Don't look at their face. You'll give away the target. How come you didn't notice that? You're still moving. You're still moving. And snap cut really quickly. Don't look at it. When you recognize an opening, don't look at it. You give it away. Act like you haven't seen it. In fact, act like you're interested in some other target. And then, like lightning, attack it. Look for a crouch. Look for an exposed face or head. Take advantage of it. Another advantage of making people move with you in a knife fight is that as they move around, like I said earlier, their guard starts to disintegrate. Um, the really nice posture that they started the first second, as you make them move, it starts to come apart. The main thing is, is that they move, they don't keep their body behind the knife. Bit by bit by bit, their stance starts to get wider and wider and wider, especially when you make them move in a half circle. When you make them move quickly like this in a half circle, they don't come down behind their knife. A little bit by little bit, they go like this. They may be here, and they get wider and wider and wider. And when you stop, quite often, they're like this, almost facing you square. I'm going to have Ron come in there, and I'm going to make Ron move real slow, and he's going to show what I mean. When I stop, he's almost square. I have a good opportunity to cut him on that flank, that exposed flank. Stay right where you are, and just turn and face this way. When he's square like that, after I make him move, I come down, I'm behind my knife. I step over and I cut him. I attack this leg, this arm. 
If I have more time and I feel it's a good opportunity, I can go to his torso or his neck or his head. The other way that you find people turning square is after a few exchanges. If we're out here and we're exchanging cuts, I will a lot of times notice that he gets square. After he swings a couple times, he doesn't come back behind his knife. He ends up like this. And he starts to get square like that as you scare him, as he feels more frightened. He comes out of his good defensive posture with his body narrow behind his knife, and he gets wide and square. That's another time to uh, take him on the flank. Look for those two openings. When there's been a couple exchanges, people will get wide and give you that flank. Or when you make the move, especially when you make the move in a circular fashion, they tend to get square. They don't stay behind their knife as they're moving around. Look for it, use it to your advantage. When I was teaching you footwork earlier, I alerted you to be uh, careful of making the mistake of making your stance too long, especially you taller guys. Uh, when you're standing in a stance too long, your balance is affected, you can be tipped over, and your front leg is exposed. Tall guys really exacerbate this problem. It's even worse because <laughs> their leg is way in front of their knife, and they're so tall that uh, a, a smaller, shorter opponent doesn't have to bend hardly at all. He just hardly has to bend his knees to attack the top of your thigh very effectively and very quickly. So look for too long of a stance. You can also uh, set this up. You can also uh, put your opponent in such a situation that he gives you a long stance. One of the things that you can do is when you faint at his head a couple times, he'll lean back. As he takes that step back, quite often he does this, but he doesn't pull his leg with him. So instead of sliding back like this, he just takes a step back and leaves his leg in his stance too long. So when I fake high and he does that, drop underneath, cut his leg off. So remember, lots of times, you can't do it all the time, because like any feint, he'll cue to it and do something else. You have to use it judiciously, but you faint and cut him. Well, as soon as he raises his knife, watch for him to raise his knife. You don't have to go in very deep, just enough to make him feel threatened. Threaten him with that tip. When he goes up, cut his leg off. Look for your opponent when you move him around to get too long. People's stance falls apart. Their fighting posture falls apart when you make a move. Look for too long of a stance, especially against a taller opponent. It's really vulnerable, and it's a good way to take him out and end the fight. One of my favorite targets when I'm sparring is my opponent's exposed live hand. When I was teaching you the basic fighting stance, I cautioned you about letting your live hand drift away from your pec. If it comes off an inch, that's not so bad. You can live with that. But when, his hand, when your, your opponent's hand starts to turn out like this, those fingers start to become dangerously exposed. When that hand drifts away from his chest, it gets worse and worse and worse for him. Some people Hollywood when they knife fight. Some people that are really skilled bait with this hand too. They'll try to draw you to this hand while they cut you with this hand. So you have to be uh, aware that sometimes when you see that live hand drift out, if he's a really skilled knife fighter, he may be setting a trap for you. It may be a ruse. But normally, people forget what happens with this hand. And as they're moving around, it drifts away. When that thing drifts away, don't look at it. <laughs> Do something else. Take them to another direction. I like to, when somebody, I notice somebody's live hand drifts away, I like to move the other way. I don't want them to even know that's a target. And then suddenly, I'll switch back and take that. Let's start on this side. If I see his live hand has drifted away, I'll start moving him here, and here, and here, and here. And then suddenly, I'll come back this way. What I'm doing as I'm circling is I'm taking up space between us. I might start, stay there. I might start here. As I circle Ron, I'm taking up, keep circling with me, Ron. I'm taking up space, 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 and suddenly I'll come back and cut that exposed live hand, just like that. You can also set the live hand up. When you see that a live hand is drifted away, take a cut at his hand, just outside of range, like that. See how he reacts? If he lifts his hand, the lift hand high, if he lifts it high to get away from your cut at his uh, knife hand, aha, say aha on your head. Because what you're going to do is you're going to feint that move again. When he lifts, you're going to go to his live hand. What you're going to do is you're going to come halfway in. Don't come all the way in. Come halfway. When you see it go, then extend and take that exposed live hand. Come halfway, snap cut, take that. 
As soon as you get this, take his face. Because this can drop. You get here and take his face immediately. You cut his fingers off like little chunks of butter. Come back, take his face too. Take his face, keep going around, away from that knife. Look for the exposed live hand. You can get it quite often, especially in exchanges. If you're in here and you're missing, first he thinks this is the target. I'm trying to cut this hand. And it's, it's, it's a good thing to think that too. Most people will, because if I cut this hand, I can go to his torso. He knows this is the primary target. So lots of my action is here. But all of a sudden, without any warning, switch your attention, cut this. When he feels the shock of your blade cutting off two or three fingers, his mind is going here. When his mind goes here, your blade goes to his face and you finish him. One of the things I want you to watch for when you're fighting is to see if your opponent is tracking your knife hand. Where are his eyes? Are his eyes following your knife's movement? As you move your knife here, does his eyes follow? Do they follow over here? Do they follow up? Do they follow down? If he's not keeping his gaze on your whole body and using his peripheral vision and making his gaze wide, but if he's tracking your knife, you have a huge advantage because you can lead him to where you want him to go. If I see that Ron's watching my knife, I'll pull him this way, step and cut this side. I'll pull his attention over here. His eyes go over here, I'll come back suddenly. I can lead him high. I'll bring him up and cut down here. I'll come low and come over the top and stab him. I might pull him to the side a couple times. As I pull him here, I'll switch and cut him on this side. Watch where your opponent's eyes go. It's a common mistake. Almost everybody that's inexperienced in knife fighting makes it. The chances in a street altercation for you to find a really experienced knife fighter are pretty slim. Most people are going to track your knife. This is the threat. They're going to be really scared of this knife. They're going to watch it. They're going to focus on it. They're going to tunnel in on it. That's going to be their whole life. You're going to be able to watch them, what they do. If they come up, draw them up. See what happens. Draw his attention up. Draw it to this side. If you see him go here, come the other way. Take him out. Set him up. You have a good opportunity if he tracks your knife. Lead him to a spot where you want him, and then take him out. One of the things I've learned in 23 years of uh, practicing knife fighting is that you can manipulate your opponent's attention and misdirect it. You can cause your opponent to direct his attention too high or too low. Some people naturally will look at your face and your eyes. Some people will look more at your feet and your lower body. Either one is a mistake. If somebody's attention is just on your upper body, they tend to forget that the lower body is also a target and vice versa. When they're looking down there at your feet trying to figure out which way you're going to go, they forget that their upper body is a target and they need to concentrate on defending that too. I'm going to call Ron in here. and I'm going to show you how very slowly so you can see how you can raise somebody's attention. If you want to attack them on the low line, you pretend that nothing below his waist exists. All your feints, you never even look down there. You look up here. You actually almost raise your head like this, like a turtle. Kind of raise your head like this. And it's like everything's up here. It's all the feints are up here. And suddenly you jump under, underneath that knife. When you see him raise and all of his concentration and everything's up here in his face, and then you get that, he doesn't expect it. That sudden lowering of your butt. As you come up, here, drop. Now as you drop, look up. If you're not successful, that knife's going to descend and you're going to have to defend. But if you've got a trail master or a Laredo Bowie and you get a good cut in here or a good chop, he's going to flop. He's not going to have a counter because he's not going to be standing. He's going to be falling. Same thing. If you want to attack his face, you don't pretend his face even exists. Don't look at it. Everything is down here. You're looking at his feet. You're stabbing his hands. You're trying to, you want to feel, make him feel threatened in his stomach. And without warning, you attack him on the high line. I like to go for best results. I like to go up here, the top of the head. For some reason, people don't think this is a target. They think of the most, oh, I might get stabbed in the face. They don't realize that this is a terrific place to hit somebody in a knife fight. I thought, I'm going to reiterate, you crack somebody here, blood is going to piss like a river down their face. It's going to blind them. They're not going to be able to see. When you get that, you got that. For a split second, he's going to be vulnerable. It's a horrible shock. 
You can just see on his fencing helmet, when I get a snap cut like that, like that, you can just see that vibrate. If he didn't have any protection on, his whole brain inside is going to be vibrating. As he's vibrating, you finish him, just like that. Look for people that are, their tension is too high or too low and attack where they're not concentrating. That's a, a good way to be successful in a knife fight. One of the things that I can almost guarantee will occur in a knife fight is you're going to notice a momentary loss of attention in your opponent. If you can make your opponent move for three, four, five seconds, after three or four or five seconds, his attention isn't going to be 100%. He's going to have very minute lapses of attention where he's not concentrating on either his offense or his defense. I want you to look for those and take advantage of them. When someone has a lapse of attention, you have a terrific but small window to attack in. At that moment in time, you have a really good opportunity to get your knife in, do some damage, and get out. But it's a very, very small window. As he gets more tired, and getting tired in a knife fight is 7, 8, 9, 10 seconds. 7, 8, 9, 10 seconds in a knife fight, we're all tired because it's such an anaerobic, high stress event. I mean, you're just uh, milliseconds away from being maimed or blinded or killed by your opponent's knife. You're under tremendous stress and pressure. That erodes people's attention very quickly. Within a few seconds, it's going to degrade. Watch for that momentary lapse of attention. Now, how do you know when that attention is going to lapse? It comes from experience. After you've sparred for a few hundred hours, you'll start to pick it up. It's very difficult to explain how. You'll just sense that at that particular moment in time, your opponent isn't really concentrating on his defense or his offense. His mind has flickered or fallen off, gone somewhere else for just a very, very short amount of time. The best way to do that is to make him move. Movement starts to disrupt everything. A lot of the stuff we do in our long range knife fighting is to make our opponent move because when we make a move we break up his defense and we create openings. I want you to look for the opening which we call lapses of attention. As I move around Ron in and out, as I move around him, I notice for a split second that he wasn't prepared to attack or defend. He was caught in a moment of time where his attention had just lapsed. When I sense that, I don't hesitate. You can't hesitate for a second. You have to go then. You have to trust your gut feeling. Bet the farm on it and go for it. When you get a lapse of attention, you have to act instantly because it's, it's, his attention comes back really quickly at the beginning. As the fight progresses, you get into seven, eight, nine second mark, it's going to be longer lapses of attention. So the, lo the longer you can draw out the fight, the better for you and the more opportunities you're going to have to cut him. But at the same time, you have to keep your attention up at a fever pitch. A really experienced knife fighter you'll notice has a really good attention span. He can keep his attention at peak for 12, 15 seconds, 16 seconds. That's what you want to do. Most people can't do it. And the average person on the street that attacks you with a knife, he'll never be able to keep his attention at peak performance for very long. As soon as it lapses, take advantage of it, take him out in the fight. Earlier in this presentation, I told you that knife fighting footwork is different from any other sport. Because you don't have to bring power, it has to be very nimble and adroit and uh, very clever and smooth and quick. And um, most people aren't prepared to deal with a knife fighter's footwork. There's nothing in playing basketball or baseball or hockey or uh, swimming or the, probably the closest footwork is boxing footwork. But outside of boxing, there's nothing really that's going to prepare your opponent to deal with your footwork. So there's going to be always a certain amount of confusion. He doesn't really know what you're doing when you're moving. Most people react by this by looking at your feet and trying to stay up with you. A lot of people instinctively know that they don't want you to be able to turn their flank. So they're going to try to stay up with you. When you notice somebody watching your footwork, you have a clear opportunity to attack. Their attention is on your feet, not on their de defense and not on their offense. They're just trying to figure out where you're going next. When you see somebody that's trying to figure out where you're going, you're going to attack. I have Ron come out here. And I'm just going to move Ron slowly a little bit. And I'm going to watch him to see what he does. And when I watch him go in my footwork, I'm going to switch hands and cut him. As soon as I notice, as I move him, that he looks down at my feet, or I can see him start to track, that's when I'm going to attack. 
you need to practice this. When you're sparring, keep careful lookout for your opponent. Where is his attention? We've talked about being too high or too low. It can also be on your feet. Make him move. Don't stand in front of him. You can draw him out. You can take him to the side. You can run him back the other way. You can threaten him. But when you see him look down at your feet, cut him just like that. One of the possible openings you may be able to take advantage of in a knife fight is with an opponent that holds his knife too low or too high. Now I want to caution you, an experienced knife fighter may, hire, may um, hold his knife too low to get you to come to his face. He wants to um, bait you into attacking a certain area. He's already planned his defense and his counterattack. If I hold my knife too low, and I, sometimes I'll pooch my face out like this, trying to give it to you, because I want you to come here. I'm, but I, when I do that, I'm really on edge. I'm really motivated at that particular time to defend instantly and to get my counterattack off. I'm ready to parry. Now, so that's why I want to caution you. A really experienced knife fighter may hold his knife too low or too high to elicit a response from you that he's already replanned um, his counterattack to. But most people that you're going to face don't have that much on the ball. They're going to make a mistake in their stance by holding the knife too high. Lots of times people with a, a boxing background or what they think is a street fighting background, they're going to hold their knife too high. Like they're, like they're going to hold their hands up on the street and try to box you. Their knife's too high. When their knife's too high, of course, come on, Ron, would you uh, take that posture? When their knife's too high, their leg is open. You can jump in here and stab them in the femoral artery or in the groin. You can jump in here and stab them in the knee. You can come in here, and I've showed this many times, and chop their leg off. You can even jump in here and stab them right on the top of the foot. Okay? Tension too high. When they're having their, their knife too high, it's the low line's open. The same thing, when his knife is too low, I see this more than too high. I see people with their knives down here. Okay? Their knife's too low. The reason why is I think people watch too much television. They think the only target is your abdomen. It's cut, cut, stab. It's an X and then a stab. They think they've watched too many karate magazines. They think everybody's going to stab them in the stomach. When their knife is low, don't act like you notice it. Again, look at their knife. Act like this is everything and attack them on the high line. Look for somebody with their knife too low. When you notice it, try not to let them know that you know. That's the key. Move around them a little bit. Move around them. And as you move, stab them in the face. Cut them in the top of the head. Take them on the high line and you'll destroy them. Watch for somebody holding a knife too high or too low. It's a good opportunity for you to end the fight. One of the most common openings next to still hand is what I call an overstrike. Whenever an opponent cuts forehand or backhand at you, quite often there's an opportunity for you to attack. When he cuts forehand, when he crosses his center line right here, he exposes his forearm. Before he can recover and return, there's an opening. Now, also, when he cuts forehand and he backhands, as he crosses center line, the middle of his body opens up again. It's always a good idea when you're slashing and cutting to try to keep your cuts and slashes inside that window of movement. When you cut so hard that you go over here, see how you expose the side of your body? The same thing, when you take a big swipe this way, you open up the whole center of your body. Almost everybody makes this mistake. I make it, everybody makes it. When you get excited, and when you're scared, <laughs> you're gonna miss. And lots of times when you think you have a good opening, you're trying to finish that fight, you go a little too hard, and you end up out like this. That's when you have to learn to get your body back behind your knife. You have to get out of there. Look for someone to open up and show you this. It's called an overstrike. He goes too far. He goes outside of that window of movement, and it's hard for him to recover and defend. So forehand, he gives you the flank here. Backhand, he gives you the center of his body. I'm going to illustrate that. Ron's going to cut um, forehand, and I cut him right through there. When he cuts backhand, I cut him here. The number 12 strike, when we're teaching you the angles of attack, 
Number 12 was straight down and straight up. I'm going to give you a really good piece of information now. When in doubt, cut 12. A straight downward strike like this, not off to the side, right down the center of his body, quite often intercepts most attacks. When Ron's cutting and he's doing all kinds of evasive patterns and I cut 12, it tends to go right in between all of his bullshit. Everything he's doing here and running around and all of his evasive patterns and everything, whatever he's doing, I cut 12, it almost always goes through. When someone, when he's swishing his knife back and forth and cutting at me, all I do is cut 12 and I come right down. When he's moving, cut 12, right straight down. You almost always get him. Look for him. When he cuts this way, cut 12 and take his forearm off. When he cuts backhand, get out of the way and go 12 again. When he closes the distance, cut him here. When he opens, cut him here. Straight down, number 12. When in doubt, cut straight down, number 12 angle, when uh, you sense your opponent's going to overstrike. Look for it, practice it, spar it, watch for it, and do it. I guarantee you, you're going to have a lot of success with that number 12 on overstrikes. Over the last 23 years as I've studied knife fighting, I've read every book and magazine article I could find about knife fighting. I've watched every videotape. In my library, I have over 1,700 videotapes on martial arts and knife fighting, stick fighting, sword fighting, grappling, boxing, wrestling, shoot fighting, just all the combat arts. And I'm amazed at some of the stances, the fighting stances that people ab advocate for knife fighting. Uh, the basic problem with most of these stances is they're under the mistaken belief that you can trade uh, cuts or stabs in a knife fight, that you can use your arm or your leg or your shoulder as a shield and absorb your opponent's blow to land a better blow. Nothing could be further than the truth. Um, I have Ron come out here. Ron, I want you to adopt a special forces stance where, you're, where your hand's like this. Now this one here, like this. I've seen this in a lot of knife fighting books. The idea is that this arm is going to guard and parry and you're going to hold your knife hand back so it's hard for your opponent to get to it and injure it. Um, this is the silliest thing I've seen in the world and I'll tell you why. As soon as I see this and I go like that, that arm's finished and so is he. This is silliness. Anytime I move to this side, he has a hard time defending. Now he could help himself a lot by this if he sucked this back in here and made me come in really close where he has a chance to use this knife. But when he holds his hand out here in front like this, I can come to this flank and attack him with impunity. If you don't believe me, spar it out. Have one person adopt our suggested fighting stance. The other person get the special forces stance going. Let's see who gets cut the worst, who gets cut first, who dies the first. It isn't going to be the guy with our long range knife fighting stance, I guarantee it. The next silly stance that I see is this crouch stance where you're using your arm as a shield. The idea is that the arm and the forearm and the hand protect the neck and the vulnerable abdomen area. Supposedly you block with this hand, just block, and counter with the other one. But what happens is, if I get this block, I can pick that up. If he blocks his hand, that's not, that's not a big deal to do that. It's not a big deal. Or if I get this block and he goes, I can still go. It's not a big deal. If you're a trained knife fighter and you have the long range skills we're teaching you in this tape, when you feel this stopped, get ready. That other hand's coming. You can either pick it up with your live hand and circle it like that and knee him in the face and drag him out and kill him. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do. Don't think for a moment that you can use some part of your body as a shield. Yes, you may have to at some point in time take a cut because there's nothing else you can do. He goes to cut me and I just can get my arm down to block. He pulls back and he cut me, right? But maybe I stomp him here and stab him. You don't quit. It's not optimal. None of us want to get cut. But I won't deliberately put my arm out here in any way and offer to use it as a shield so I can uh, land a better blow. When you run into somebody doing this, take them out right away. Show them no respect. 
Just remember, when you cut this, that backhand may go. So when you cut this, be ready. Keep in motion. Don't stand there. Cut the arm, move. Just like that. Keep going. As I mentioned earlier, most of the opponents you're liable to ever face on the street with a knife aren't going to be skilled knife fighters. Because of that, you have to be ready for very unorthodox attacks. Some people will attack with total disregard for their own safety. They'll abandon all thought of their own physical well-being just to attack you. I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to have Ron come out and I'm going to give you a demonstration of what an unorthodox wild man attack will be like. When Ron and I are practicing um, kickboxing and self-defense, one of us always assumes the wild man in every session and the other one practices the defense and counterattacks because in, in a street attack quite often people don't attack with nice jab cross hook combinations. Those punches come from every angle, every direction and with all kinds of uncertainties. A staggered rhythm, broken rhythm. Um, it's the same thing with a knife. It's not one, two, three. It's more like, are you ready? I hate your guts! I'm gonna kill you! I hate you, I hate you! Stuff like that. And you need to get on your bicycle and you need to be prepared to move to get an angle on that because that person's gonna attack at all kinds of weird angles maybe with absolutely no regard for his safety or your counterattack. Now a trained fighter isn't gonna attack you that way because he's too vulnerable. But sometimes people are so messed up on drugs or alcohol or they're in such emotional state they have no regard for anything but their immediate desire to kill you with that knife. You need to be aware of that. When you're training with your training partner, put on your fencing mask. Make sure you have your hockey gloves on because you're not going to clash hands on this sometimes. And if you clash hands on a fencing helmet without a hockey glove on, you're going to hurt your hand. It's really going to hurt. So protect yourself, pad up. One person attacks with wild man attacks, the other one defends and counters. Try it. Practice it every time you get together to train. One of our basic strategies as long range knife fighters is to always keep our knife hand in motion. I alluded to this earlier when I was teaching you evasive patterns. I was telling you uh, different ways that you can move your hand continuously to make it hard for your opponent to key on your hand. When you're fighting and you're within range of your opponent, your hand, your knife hand, has to be moving. If it's still, it's vulnerable. His initiation is always going to be faster than your reaction. If your hand's in motion, your reaction time goes up exponentially. If it's still, you're way behind the curve. If you're moving even a little bit, you have a better chance of defending successfully. So I want to demonstrate now. I'm going to have Ron come in and he's going to attack my knife hand. I'm just going to stand here in the on guard position. Wait, Ron. I'm going to stand here in the on guard position with my knife hand still and I'm going to try to evade his attack. Give me fast. Hard for me to do. Very hard. Now, watch. When I can add motion to it, it becomes even easier for me. See what I mean? When you can move your arm, it gives him a lot more problems to deal with. Always keep your arm in motion when you're in range of your opponent's knife. That's a strategy you want to live your life by as a knife fighter. Another good rule to follow if you want to be a good long range knife fighter is always to keep your hands, arms, feet, and body in motion especially when you're within the lunge or flashé distance of your opponent. Uh, don't stand there in front of your opponent. Move. Remember, he's not the boss of you. You're the boss of you. He can't direct what you're going to do. You move. You go where you want to go. Don't stand there where he feels comfortable. If Ron, and I just uh, go slow, Ron. If Ron, if I feel like he wants to be there, maybe I'll come over here. If he's at long range, maybe I'll take up some space. Maybe I'll give some space. Maybe I'll move like this. I'll move in, I'll move out. Maybe I'll lunge at him, but I'm gonna keep in motion. 
He's never going to know where I'm going next. Maybe I'll circle this way. When he keys on that, maybe I'll come back. Maybe I'll take up space. See what I mean? Never stand still when you're knife fighting. It's a highly anaerobic activity. A, a long knife fight would be 15 seconds. You've got to move like your life depended on it, because it does. Don't stand still in a knife fight. One of the best ways to assure that you'll emerge from a knife fight unscathed is to always make sure that you fight at long range. You want to stay, I have Ron come in here, you want to stay at least one or two steps away from your opponent out here. Don't unnecessarily close in here. I see a lot of other people teaching close range knife fighting. Yes, you need to know how to fight in here, but this is the range at which you have the greatest likelihood to be injured yourself. You don't want to stay at this uh, extreme close range for very long. You enter this range after you've cut the knife out of your opponent's hand. You don't fight at this range. You don't willingly come into this close range unless your duty requires you to do. If you're in a special military unit and you have to go through a door and there's a guard or someone blocking that path, I may have to come into this range immediately, take him out, go through that door so our mission can be successful. That's about the only time you really have to fight at that close range. If you want to have the best chance to merge without being wounded and take out your opponent and survive that fight intact, you need to fight at long range. Move around. Stay outside. Don't move in. Look for an opportunity where you can take your opponent at a moment of time where he's not expecting it. Stay out of long range. He's not the boss of you. Don't let him uh, coerce you or try to manipulate you into fighting his fight. Stay out until it's you see the opportunity. You're sure that's the moment. Then take him out. Try to always stay and fight at long range. Don't move in here close or even at middle range unnecessarily. Stay out here where you have the best chance to break him down and get off your own attack. As I've said before, knife fighting is a very anaerobic business. Your heart is pounding. You're using oxygen up faster than you can replenish it. You're running low on gas when you're fighting with a knife. You're putting out a lot of effort and you're not going to be able to recharge your batteries quickly. So you're going to empty out and at some point you're going to have to rest. One of the strategies a good long, life, uh, long range knife fighter always emplo employs is he always rests at a safe distance. Don't rest when your opponent can easily cut you. Don't rest here. You can get cut here. Rest out here, at least outside of his lunge range. Remember, right here, I can lunge and stab Ron. I can easily take his hand and almost reach his body from this distance. You need to be aware of what your opponent's lunge and flashé distance and get outside of that. Ron can't reach me with a single step from here. If he lunges or flashés, he can't reach me. He's going to fall short. I need to stay about seven feet away, six and a half to seven feet away to be outside his lunge or flashé distance. If your opponent's taller, you have to be further away. So if you want to rest, if you're tired, move around your opponent and circle out. Get out here and rest. Stay out. If he comes forward, maybe you have to drive him off. Move back out. You enter when you're ready, not when he's ready. You only come in here and come on the attack when you're ready. If you're starting to feel tired, pull out. Get out here. Move around laterally. Make him move with you. Switch distance. If he comes too close, threaten him or retreat. Rest at a safe distance. Don't fall asleep and get killed or maimed because you tried to rest too close to your opponent. Pay attention to his lunge and flashé distance. Another attribute of the superior long-range knife fighter is he never fights at the same distance. He's constantly changing his position and distance from his opponent. Have Ron come in here. Just stand there, Ron, and come on guard. You've got to remember that your opponent, and I've said this time and again, and I'm going to keep saying it. I want to drill it in your mind. Your opponent is not your boss. When you're in the ring fighting, you don't fight your opponent's fight. You fight your fight. Same thing with knife fighting. You don't let him dictate where you're going to go. He's not the boss of you. You dictate where you're going to go and force him to react. 
Never stay at the same distance. And I see this in our training classes all the time. If I could get my, my, my students to circle, they stay right about here, just about one step away. They never come in or out. I want you, let's move over here, Ron, so the camera can pick up. I want you to vary the distance that you're at from your opponent. Maybe you drive them off, come back out, squirt to the side, drive them off, come out, circle out, circle out, circle out, circle out. When he thinks everything is everything, you come back in, suck up that space. When you're changing the distance, he doesn't know what your plan is. Sometimes I want to give space and lure him into the attack. He thinks I'm retreating now. I'm just timing him to get in my counterattack. I want to attack him at that point in time where he thinks he's safe. He thinks he's got me on the run. It's all going his way. His mind's on his defense. Bang! I attack. Use your footwork constantly to change up. Change that distance. Don't stay here right here at the same spot. Sometimes press in a little bit, move back, press in, move out, move to the side, run. Sometimes I'll run on his flank and I'll try. I'll try to get that. It makes him scared. It makes him wary. Helps set him up for something else. Change your distance. You won't regret it. Another strategy you can employ in a knife fight is to change the tempo of the fight. Just like when I was talking about just recently changing the distance, you can change the speed and the pace of the action in the knife fight. You can bring it up to a high level, reduce it, bring it up, reduce it. What you can do is you can actually lure your opponent into making a mistake or going to a sleep by changing the tempo of the fight. I'll have Ron come out here. And I'm going to go in real slow motion so I can talk. I can drive him off with vertical whips. I can come right back again. Now, I can come again. So what I'm doing is I'm being really aggressive here. For a couple passes, then I'll circle. And I'll try to think, make him think I'm on the run a little bit. And I'll turn it up. And I'll turn it up really quickly without any warning. So you can vary the tempo. You can come in with a lot of stabbing attacks like that aggressively a few times. And again, drive him back. And then get on your bicycle and stab him again really quickly. Go for his hand. Change the target. Break your rhythm. Change the tempo. And you'll find you have lots more opportunities to score. Experiment with it at home. Get with your training partner. Put some pressure on him. A lot of pressure. Even more pressure. Back off. Get on your bicycle. Move around. Let him get a little confident. Then switch it on again. Suddenly, without any warning, Cut him, stab him, take him out. After you've spent a few hundred hours in actual sparring with your training partners, you might think about exploring changing your posture. Our main fighting position looks like this. Our shoulders back, our feet are pointed at 11 o'clock, our knife's pointed at our opponent's face, our live hand's pinned here on our left pec, our elbows are tucked in, our knees are slightly bent, our heels up. This is a pretty good fighting posture. It's our basic fighting knife posture. But there's other postures that you can adopt that may cause confusion and give you some advantage over your opponent. One of the ones that I like is that what we call our extended arm posture. I'm going to call Ron in here. And just come on guard, Ron. What I'm going to do is instead of taking our normal posture, I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to come on guard. Instead of holding my knife here, I'm going to extend my arm till it's almost straight out here. It's going to be about shoulder height. The advantage of this posture is I take up space with it and I threaten. I hold people off. When I hold my knife out like this, I'm holding him away from me. Now, when I do this, I want you to notice that the negative about it is that your hand is still. So you have to be very defensively minded when you do this. You know, my arm isn't, sometimes I'll move my arm a little bit like this to help myself a little bit, but for the most part, it's not highly evasive. But what it does do is it takes up a lot of room. I can also encroach on his space very easily like this. I can walk right in on him. If he doesn't go for my hand, I can stab him. Um, if you need to make a quick kill, this is a good way to do it. If someone's there, and you need to take them out, you come in extended posture, you come into their space, and they go for your hand, you step in, cut them, step on them, stab them. 
just like that. It allows you to enter. He's either got to deal with your hand or eat your thrust, one or the other. You're going to encroach on his space very quickly. Now, when you do that, you got to be on red alert, eh? Because he's got to deal with his hand immediately, or he eats the blade. If he's unsuccessful, he eats the blade, you kill him, walk through him, and go about your business, and your mission goes forward. So it has some advantages, but the big disadvantage is that your arm is a little bit more vulnerable here because it's not in motion. The other advantage is, is that most of his attacks come underneath your knife. When my arm's here and he wants to go to my body, he's getting dropped on like that. Most of the attacks come underneath that. And I can come to his arm very powerfully and develop a lot of momentum. Also, I can stab him from here, just like that in the forearm, just like that, just like that in the pec. So, it gives you a good position to thrust and to drop with cuts on, but it has some disadvantages. It's for an experienced knife fighter. After you've got a few hundred hours in knife sparring under your belt, you might want to think about trying this and experimenting with this posture. This posture is also seen in Kenjutsu, Japanese sword fighting. You can see this posture adopted with a samurai sword. So it's an ancient way to hold an edged weapon. It works. I wouldn't do it if it doesn't work. Everything that we teach you has been found to be effective in thousands of hours of knife sparring. So practice this and make it your own. You may need it someday in your bag of tricks. If you like to fight with a heavy knife, like a bowie knife or a kukri, I'd like you to experiment with our overhead posture. This posture is particularly well suited for knives that are heavy with a real weight forward blade. Our, to assume our overhead posture, it's very similar to our regular fighting knife stance, except this time we're going to step forward if you're right-handed with your left foot, one step. You're going to turn both toes to one o'clock. You're going to pick up your rear heel, that's your right heel, if you're right-handed. Your left hand, your live hand, is going to come in here on your left peck, peck and your elbow is going to pin here. Your right hand is going to bring your knife above your head like this. So the back of the blade right here, the unsharpened, unsharpened part, is over your head. Now I want you to bring the point back like this till the point is just even with your forehead, just like that. The purpose of this is to keep your opponent from knowing how long that blade is. Now the long suit of the overhead posture is this horrendous downward cut like that. That huge chopping stroke like this is devastating. It's so strong that no one can survive a hit from that. If you hit somebody in the arm, it's going to cut their arm off. If you hit them in the, in the neck here, you're going to cut all the way into their chest cavity with it. Uh, you could actually pass through and come out the other side with a, with a sharp kukri like our Gurkha kukri. Very, very, very formidable cutting attack. It's also a good stabbing attack. You can arc down from here. You can arc to the sides. So it's very elusive and it's confusing as to the reach. People don't understand that you can reach a considerable distance stabbing this way. They have no idea that you can cut them from a long distance away with a single stroke. So quite often, they come unwittingly underneath your knife. That's what I like about this, is this stance puts that person underneath their, your knife. When you hold your live hand in here tight, keep your elbow in. To attack this, they have to come forward, in close. When they come forward, they come underneath that. Now, to make this posture or stance work, you have to be aggressive. You can't be passive. If you're passive, he's going to move you and take this flank. We already told you that when, the, when your body is in front of the knife, this flank's vulnerable. You've got to keep that in mind. This is an experience. Uh, this posture is for experienced, skilled knife fighters only. Don't do this if you're a novice. You won't have the skill to pull it off. You've got to have a lot of aggression. You've got to have good movement. You can't stand still. You've got to constantly be in motion. You constantly have to be threatening your opponent with this, keeping him scared. Have Ron come in here. Just stand there, Ron, on guard. If I've got a Gurkha Kukri, that's a big, powerful knife. When I come like that, he knows that if he gets hit by that, it's curtains for him. He's going to be scared of that, especially if I cut one time and miss. That one cut, he sees that ferocious power coming at him. Oh, he's going to feel a pain right in his balls. It's going to hurt. He's going to be scared, OK? You've got to keep that pressure up. You're stabbing at him all the time. He doesn't know what you're going to do next. 
Now, to defeat this posture, he has to come in here, take your flank, and get to this, this portion of your body without you cutting him. Now, it's hard to use your knife defensively when it's up here. When you stab down, you better be ready to uh, counter cut anything that comes at you. If you miss, you better be ready to keep fighting because you're vulnerable. It's a committed stroke, but it can be very useful. It'll confuse a lot of opponents. Most people won't have seen it, and they'll walk right into it like that. So, put on your three weapons rated fencing mask. Get out your trainer. I made one here out of boogie board foam and uh, duct tape. I like to train with a kukri like this. Make a trainer, put on your protective equipment, and practice. Try this out. I don't think you'll regret it. It's a great thing to have as a change up in your arsenal. Several times during this presentation, I've alluded to the necessity of changing up your uh, defensive, uh, invasive hand patterns. You can't cut the same pattern all the time. It's the same thing in offense. You can't present the same offensive posture all the time. You need change ups. We just taught you an extended arm posture and an overhead posture. Now I want to teach you a high posture. I'm going to have Ron come out and come on guard. To assume the high posture, which I want you to do is stand with your feet shoulders distance apart, step forward on your right foot, turn your feet to one o'clock, raise your left heels, just like our regular knife fighting posture. The main difference though is we're going to bring our hand up high till our hand is over our head. We're going to bend our wrist and our point of our knife is going to be pointing down towards our opponent's chest, just like this. Okay? What this does is this puts our blade at an angle that he's not familiar with. Again, he's under the blade. I can stab down like this. I can stab straight into his face. I can drop. Now, I'm in a palm reinforced grip here. To cut, I have to switch to a forward grip to drop, to, to have the strength to hang on to that knife. Okay? But I can get tremendous power doing that because it's dropping a long ways down to cut him. So I can stab at all kinds of different angles. These descending angles are very elusive. It's hard for him to judge the angle I'm going to stab at. Now, to make this posture work, just like with the overhead posture, you have to be very aggressive. You can't be passive to do it. It presents some problems for your opponent when you're always stabbing at him all the time at weird angles all the time. Or when every time he tries to move in on you, you cut him like that. So he's always underneath your knife. The downside is like with the extended arm posture. When I'm here in this high posture, my arm is almost frozen. I have a little bit of motion to it, but I don't have the full gamut of evasive maneuvers I have in our regular fighting stance. So you have to be aware that your arm is a little bit more vulnerable and he's going to be trying, that's the main goal, he's going to try to counter slash you. Adopt that high, high posture for a second. When his knife is up there high like this, I'm going to drop it down a little bit lower. I'm going to try to get in here and move my blade close so that I can snap cut it. That's what he's going to be looking to do. So you need to be aware of that, that his goal is to close the distance, inch his knife in, inch his knife in, and slash like that, suddenly, without any warning. So you have to be ready to move your knife. You also have to constantly keep up this aggressive stabbing attack. But it has some real advantages. You know, obviously, when I'm up high like this, it's hard to defend the low line. But he's got to drop to attack my low line. He has to come in deep underneath my knife, just like that. And by the time he gets there, I can develop tremendous power. I mean, for, see the, how far this knife moves? When I hit his arm like that, flop, it's done. So this uh, high posture has a lot of advantages, some disadvantages. You need to play with it and make it your own, because you may need it someday to win the fight. If you favor a fighting knife that's particularly well suited for stabbing attacks, our loaded posture is something you might want to consider because its long suit is stabbing. To assume the loaded posture, it's very similar um, basically to the overhead posture. We're just going to change one thing. You're going to step out with your left foot forward, turn your feet to one o'clock, pick up your right heel, pull your shoulder back, 
put your life, live hand on your left pec, tuck in your elbow, narrow your body. Now, here's the main thing. You're going to pull your right arm back that's holding your knife all the way back next to your side. It's almost like it's cocked under spring tension because what you want to do is you want to shoot this out at a moment's notice and take your opponent unawares at a distance he doesn't think you can stab him at. Now, to make this work, again, like with some of the other postures I've showed you, you have to be very aggressive. Now isn't the time to be passive. Now isn't the time to be easy. You've got to be very, very aggressive. You've got to make that other person fear you. He has to be in fear of his life. At any moment, he's going to be stabbed. Um, you have to drive him. You have to work him. You have to be busy. You can't rest. You can't be inactive, or it won't work. If you're not willing to put out a lot of effort to make this uh, posture work, don't adopt it, because it won't work for you. I'm going to show how it works briefly. Have Ron come in. Come on, guard Ron. What I want to do is I want to move around. Now, you got to make sure that you're ready to use your live hand. And I'm going to shoot this knife quickly under spring tension, like this, at distances that he doesn't think that I can reach him. Sometimes I'll go for his face. Sometimes I'll go for his groin, like that. You're going to change up. But this arm is shooting out all the time. As you shoot out, be ready. If you miss, he may counter, OK? So you always have to be ready to defend. Play with it. Practice it. Maybe it's not for you, but maybe you'll really like it, and it might save your life someday. This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes, and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. volume six, our final volume, I want to teach you the training and sparring drills that you can practice to become a superior knife fighter. The first thing we're going to do is go through quite a number of different training drills that will build the attributes you need to start sparring with a partner. Then I'm going to go into actual sparring drills that you can practice with your training partner to improve your overall knife fighting ability. So let's start training. Before you actually start sparring, I want to give you some training drills 
that will help you develop the attributes you need to be an effective knife fighter. Before you, you um, go out and sparring, uh, I don't want you to just whack in away at each other. That won't uh, do you any good, it's just a waste of time. If you don't have the skills already developed, you're not ready to spar. So I, what I want you to do is to follow along and practice these training drills. What we're going to do is we're going to isolate different aspects of nice sparring so you can work on them in small increments. And when you have them all put together, you're ready to start sparring with your partner. Now, when we're doing these training drills, it's not a contest. No one's the winner, no one's the loser. You're trying to help each other learn. You're trying to develop a, the, the attributes of a good knife fighter. So when you're um, offering targets to your opponent, sometimes make it easy for him to stab your hand or to cut you. Hold your hand still. Offer him your uh, forearm. Offer him your elbow. Extend your leg so that he can cut it. Let your live hand drift out. Give him those openings that we talked about so that he can help um, recognize the opportunities he has to attack. You want to build his ability as a knife fighter too because he's going to turn around and do the same thing for you. You're going to help him learn, he's going to help you learn. So sometimes you're going to have to make yourself vulnerable so that he can build his eye-hand coordination and develop his ability to stand, to stab a hand that's in motion or to cut a hand in motion. You're going to have to help him learn to recognize openings by um, exaggerating those openings so that he actually gets it. You know, you might have to actually put your arm like that. Oh, 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 okay, I slashed that. You may have to hold your hand still like this and hold it there for a couple beats and then he stabs it. Oh, oh yeah, that's a still hand. Okay? Sometimes you're going to move around and you're just going to stand square to him like this. Oh, 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 he's standing square so he cuts you. So you're going to have to make yourself vulnerable and you're going to trade off so that you both learn. It's a learning process and it has to be a cooperative process. Let's train. We're going to start our series of training drills with stabbing attacks on the knife hand. What I want to do is I don't want to overcome you at first. I don't want to give you so many things to defend against that you're not successful. So we're going to isolate just stabbing attacks at the knife hand. One person's going to defend, the other person's going to attack. Then you're going to switch. Now remember, the person that's defending, sometimes I want you to give the attacker a clear opening so he can practice actually making contact. If he misses all the time, he's not going to build the eye-hand coordination eye-hand coordination he needs. So it's a cooperative thing. You gotta work together to get a lot of benefit out of these training drills. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, the only target is my knife hand. And Ron's gonna attack it by stabbing. Sometimes I'm gonna hold it still and sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm going to give him my forearm to stab. Sometimes I'm going to raise my arm high and have him stab that. And sometimes I'm going to show him that it's hard to get those. Just like that. Then I'll go back and I'll attack Ron's hand the same way. Now we're going to isolate cutting and slashing attacks at my knife hand. We're going to do it the same way we did with the stabbing attacks. I'm going to evade sometimes and sometimes I'm going to make myself vulnerable so Ron can practice his offense. Still hand. Exposed elbow. Standing square. Just like that. Now, I'm going to go on the offense, and Ron, he's going to evade. Just 
just like that. Sometimes he's going to offer you a live hand. It's going to vary the targets he gives you. Trade off. We spend a lot of time in our training developing our defenses against attacks on our knife hand. I've said again and again, the primary target for your opponent, especially when you're using our basic fighting stance, he has to dispose of your knife before he can come and take your life. So you really need to be good at defending against attacks on your knife hand. So we've got lots of training drills that we use to uh, bring up our defenses and to perfect them. Now we're going to allow both cuts and thrusts at the knife hand, and I want you, when you train now, to use the full gamut of defenses, evasive patterns, circling, fold back, all the things that I've taught you, basic U, lift high, drop low, the full gamut of defenses against cuts and thrusts at your knife hand. I'm going to go about half speed now so that you can see and watch more carefully. See what I mean? That's how I want you to drill it. Use all of your defenses to defeat his attacks, then switch. You attack him. He uses all the defenses. Sometimes you're going to make yourself vulnerable so that he can cut and stab you. Switch off and cooperate. Learn. Because your face is such a vulnerable target, I want you to have a lot of practice in training to defend it. Now, Ron and I are going to demonstrate how you can do this at home with your training partner. I'm leaving my fencing mask off so I can give instruction. Don't you do this at home. I'm breaking my own rule. It's very dangerous. So we're going to go about half speed so that you can see what's going on and I can explain it. But when you practice at home, what we're trying to do is isolate your defense against stabs at your face so that you get used to picking up that incoming knife and reacting very quickly. I want you to get used to defending your face. Most people can't. Make sure you can. Just like that. Sometimes put in your live hand. Get used to using this. Sometimes you won't have the luxury of a long knife. You'll have to use your live hand to win the fight. Now I want to isolate how you can use your live hand to parry off thrusts and stabbing attacks at your face. Earlier when I was teaching you how to use your knife hand defensively, I just I want to reiterate that you use the flat part of your palm or the flat part of the back of your hand. Try to keep your fingers lined up straight like this. Don't curl them like that because it'll catch on the edges of the blade and cut your fingers off. When you have to make contact with the blade sometimes, you want to hit flat so that you uh, minimize the chance of being cut. I'm not saying you won't be cut because sometimes you will, but you'll minimize the chances of being cut. Same thing with the back of your hand. I'll come out here and have Ron come out here. Now remember, if we can, we want to parry on the wrist. Usually we can't because we're too late. It's a long ways. By the time I get to his wrist, his knife is almost at my face. I have to really see this coming, and I have to reach out a considerable ways in front of my body to parry on his wrist. Sometimes, though, you're going to parry right here on the blade. Remember, always move your head when you parry. Try to actually move your body. Get out of the way of that, OK? Here's how you can train at home. One person is going to be the attacker, one's going to be the defender. Now remember, these training drills are to isolate different parts of the knife fight so you can work on your attack and your defense. Right now, we're primarily going to work on our defense. So I'm not wearing a fencing mask so I can talk. Don't you do this at home. It's very dangerous. What I want you to do 
When you see him go is I want you to use your live hand and to, to redirect that knife. So when he stabs at my face, I want you to step off, stab right at my face. I want you to step off line. Get out of the way. A little higher. Off line. Sometimes you're going to have to get on the blade like that. I want you to practice both. Getting on his hand, on his hand, on his blade, on his blade. A little faster. Now remember, sometimes you want to lift. Sometimes when I see this coming in, I want to lift him here to get in my own shot, wrap that arm, and work him over. So you can parry to the inside, you can parry to the outside, and you can lift. Sometimes you won't be able to do move to the right or the left. You'll just move your head back to get out of the way. You'll rock back. Just like with your knife, a lot of times you rock back to get your head out of the way. It's the same thing with your empty hand. Sometimes you'll just rock back. So you'll just rock back. Gives you a little bit more time to use your live hand to intercept his knife. Let's continue on with our uh, training drills and keep working with parrying. Now I want to focus on parrying attacks at your torso, your abdomen area, or your chest with your fighting knife. I'm going to have Ron come over. And Ron's going to attack with straight thrusts to my center line. I want you to practice at home by intercepting that straight thrust, getting off line, move. If you can, you almost want to move first. When you see that knife coming, your foot wants to almost move as fast as your knife does. So your foot moves, gets you out of the way. Your foot moves and gets you out of the way. Now, if you squirt off to the side like this, remember the principle is you're going to have to push in or you're going to have to step back and get your body behind your knife. So anytime you advance this way to parry, you may have to step forward and get your body behind your knife, or you may have to retreat and get your body behind your knife. Remember that. Whenever you're moving, and whenever you're drilling, when you end up, your body needs to be behind your knife. So Ron's going to attack a little higher up here, and I'm going to parry just like attacks at the face. Now, again, the best and highest use of the parry is to cut his hand. When he stabs, I want to destroy his hand. If I come this way, I want to destroy his hand. But if you can't, get on his blade. If you're able to get offline, get on his blade, you've got a good opportunity for a quick kill. If you get here, he throws his hand up, take that hand and kill him. If his hand's in the way, cut it. Come again, just like that. Always be aware that when you pick up one attack, another may follow. You can get here and you can elbow. You can also get here and pick this up with your other hand and cut him. So you always have to be aware that he may not be finished with his first attack. Sometimes when you're drilling just for fun, add in a hit from that alive hand after you parry. When you parry your opponent's knife, make him throw and try to hit you. Pick that up. It'll stand you in good stead. This is a good way to practice. One person's the attacker, then the other person's the attacker. Always try to move off line. Get out of the way. Don't stand here like stone. Yeah, sometimes you will. Sometimes you'll just recoil like that because you're taking in a moment of time, you can't do anything. I swear. In the thousands of hours I spent in knife fighting, there's been occasions when I felt my feet were six feet deep in concrete. I couldn't move them at all. All I could do is just this and be glad, okay? So I'm not saying you can always do it, but many, many times you can get here. Be anxious to parry his stab. Be hungry to get your defense off and your counterattack in. That's the way you win a knife fight. One of the hardest attacks to defend against with your knife is a cutting or slashing attack at your torso. Attacks that come about waist to abdomen high have historically been really hard to defend against. Um, that's why I think you need to spend a lot of time with your training partner isolating these particular attacks and working on your defense against them. I'm going to show you how to do this. Ron's slowly going to cut at my torso. When you intercept this, here I'm out of position so I use my live hand. 
When you cut forehand, I want you to step to the zero pressure area if you can. That gives you a little bit more time to look at the trajectory of that incoming attack. Don't just stand here and do this. Try to move to the zero pressure area and get a look at it. Now, as you come over here and get a look at that, remember your attention just went here. So he's liable to throw this. So you can come here. You may have to cover with your elbow even if you can't get your knife on there. That's what I love about the different martial arts I've studied is I've got lots of uh, things at my disposal to protect myself. If I can't get my knife out of the way, I kind of bong. I lift my elbow, I drop my chin underneath my arm to protect it, and I ride that out. I can slide in now and cut him if I want to. So whenever you're defending here, remember that back hand can go too, and that hand can come again. So you have to stay ready. Remember what we talked about stepping to the zero pressure area. As his arm scribes this arc around here, as you move ahead of that and get here, you have more time to deal with it. When he backhands, go slow. As I step here, the zero pressure area is over here, clear over here. So I'm going to move here and intercept it. Now, it's my experience, and I got this from Dan and Asanto, his help too, that when you have cuts and slashes at your torso, they have to be knocked down. You just can't uh, mildly intercept them. Put some downward pressure on them. Knock those things down. Cut down on that if you can. Knock it down. Take its power away from it. Cut it down. Don't just uh, flimsily slash it because it may come still through and cut you. You need to put some pressure on it and cut hard, get out of the way and destroy it. Cut hard, get out of the way and destroy it. It really helps you to be successful if you move. Try not to stand here and do this or this, blocking. Blocking is really iffy. Quite often it crashes through like that and cuts you. It crashes through and cuts you. So if you have to block, you may have to use both hands. And I really suggest that. If you're going to block, you might want to use one hand on his wrist and drive your knife into his forearm like that. Reinforce it this way. Practice it. See what problems develop. Work on solutions. I've given you a lot of them right now. Practice it. Every time you train, get used to defending your gut pile. You'll be glad you did. Next, we're going to isolate using your live hand, your non-weapon hand, to defend against cuts and stabs at your torso. Sometimes you're going to block. When he cuts at me, I'm going to block. Sometimes, as he cuts backhand, I'm going to cut into him. Sometimes I'm going to steer him out of the way. He cuts backhand. I may intercept that and steer him out of the way and fling him out of the way. It depends on the speed and the trajectory and the energy he gives you how you're going to defend. So what I want you to do is keep in mind all the defenses I've taught you on how to use your live hand to defend yourself and use them now and practice. Your, your training partner is going to cut or stab you. Let's work the cuts first. He's going to cut you and cut you. So now, right now, I'm using the edge of my hand. I may block. Now, when you block like this, you got to put some energy in that. Try not to hit out here, because he may go right through and cut you. You want to get on his wrist if you can. Better yet, use the back of your hand, intercept that, fling it out of the way. When you can, you want to block with the back of your hand. But you can't always pull that off, depending on the, the type of movement that's coming. Some thrusts with an angled wrist, you need to use a straight arm. You need to practice all of your defensive techniques with your live hand. Maybe he cuts backhand and I straight arm it down. Maybe he cuts forehand and I straight arm it down. You need to practice all of those. One person will feed and one person will defend. Now when he stabs, I need to get out of the way. I parry it off. I cut into it. I knock it down and pin it to his thigh, just like that. Remember, you can step on his foot here, then move in and barge him right over like that. Work on all those things. Experiment with it. Have him stab you at angles. You've got to play with it. Work with it. Remember, when you're down low here, be cognizant that the other hand may come, and you have to deal with it. 
Always remember, it's not just the knife. He has other weapons he can bring to bear. Play with it. Get good at it. The last training drill I want to teach is the leg replacement drill. I can't emphasize how important it is that you get good at vacating space, moving your foot back, and getting it out of the way. Getting that leg out of the way, making that person miss. You use this not just against attacks at your legs, you use a leg replacement to get out of trouble all the time. So it's a good idea to practice it. Here's how I want you to train it with your training partner. One person's going to attack, the other's going to defend. Now, don't just come in here at light speed and start smacking your partner's leg. Feed him at a speed that he can defend against. Give him nice big motions. You know, exaggerate the motion so that when I attack Ron's leg, he has a good chance to get out of the way. Now make it realistic. Don't cut clear out here. I'm going to penetrate in here. Raise that up a little bit, Ron. I'm going to penetrate this high. If he doesn't move that leg, I'm going to cut it. All right? If he doesn't move that leg, I'm going to cut it. But I'm not going so hard that every third time I hit him in the leg. He won't learn anything like that. So I want you to practice like this. One person's going to attack. The other one's going to defend. So get in six or seven good attacks, then switch off. Now this gets a little wearisome to come in here and jump in here and out. It takes a lot of strength to keep doing that. So give 10 reps each person and then give it a rest. Come back to it or do it the next day. But don't neglect the leg replacement drill. It'll stand you in good stead. You, if you do this all the time, I promise you, if you stand in front of the mirror and you practice this leg replacement again and again and again, you'll do it instinctively. You'll have conditioned reflexes. When your opponent tries to cut your leg, you're going to vacate that space and you'll counterattack. You'll do it without even noticing it. Make it a conditioned reflex so you'll never notice it. You'll do it so fast, it'll happen easily and instantly. Now we're going to teach you how to spar by using archival footage. We're going to use um, the skills and abilities you already have and we're going to break them down into individual blocks and we're going to teach you how to spar by building block after block until you're engaged in full out open sparring. Next we're going to show you um, how to spar. We're going to have one person attack the hands and the other person is just going to use evasionary tactics to defend. What we want to do is we want to isolate sparring into individual increments that you can absorb and build on. So you use one, in, uh, one increment and the next increment and then the next increment and before you know it you're fighting full out. And we're going to use archival footage to show you how to learn to spar this way in real time. In our next example, both people fighting are free to attack the hands and use any defense they choose. They can use any evasionary tactic they want as well. Watch them and learn.
Now we're going to have one person attack with thrust and the other one defends any way he wants. In this next example, one person's going to attack with cuts and slashes and chops, and the other person is going to be free to defend any way that he can. The goal is not to get cut. What we want to do is isolate the cutting and slashing attacks so the defender has a chance to get used to seeing those and defending against them, but without being overwhelmed by a bunch of stabbing attacks as well. We want to break it down into an increment that he can handle. Now we're going to isolate the face as a target. Throughout this presentation, I've been stressing the face as a target and the need to be able to defend it. Now we'll show you how to spar by just isolating the face. So you don't forget about it when you're in full out sparring. You don't forget the fact that your face is a target and you get used to defending it. And we're going to have you defend it again and again and again until you get really confident at it and it pops out automatically comes out of condition reflex. That's what we want to build and the breaking these sparring sessions down into smaller increments is we want to start building your condition reflex so that when you're in full out sparring you'll have that attribute. You'll be ready to defend your face. In this next sparring illustration, we're going to isolate the legs as a target. One person's going to attack and the other's going to defend. Again, I want to warn you tall guys, you need to get really good at defending attacks at your legs. A lot of people will use an attack at the leg as a change up. They're going to attack high, 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 and when you think your attention is all about being stabbed in the face, they're going to drop and cut your legs. It's the same thing in boxing. Sometimes you punch a lot of straight punches 
in a row. Jab, jab, cross, jab, jab, cross. And then all of a sudden, you go to a wide hook. The guy's narrowed his guard. He thinks you're coming up the middle, and you hit him from the side. It's the same thing. When you lead high, 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 and then attack the legs, if you're not used to defending the legs, if you haven't built conditioned reflexes, you're going to get cut, you're going to get knocked down, and you're going to get killed in a knife fight. So you need to practice defending your legs. Here's a good way to train it at home. So far, we've been isolating individual aspects of the fight and individual targets. Now we're going to make it a little more difficult. One person gets to attack any target he wants, and the other person gets to defend. He can attack with cuts, or thrusts, or chops, any attack he wants, but the other person isn't going to counterattack. He's only going to work on his defense. You're going to switch off, practice this at home, spar like this at home before you go full out into sparring because it'll build your condition reflexes. That's what you need when you get into a sparring match. You can't think all the time. Your muscles and your subconscious do the work. Train it, spar it, and learn to live. Now we're going to illustrate full out open sparring. One person is going to be able to use any attack or defense he wants and so is the other. They're both going to be equal. They can both attack at will and use any defense they want. So every man's on his own. It's a free for all. But keep in mind when you're sparring it's not a death match. It's not a match for money. You're not getting paid. You're here to learn. The purpose of sparring is to try things out and to build your reflexes, build your skills, build your abilities, not necessarily prove who's better or who's worse. You want to use sparring as a learning experience. Sometimes when I'm sparring, I'll work just different aspects of my game to improve on them. I'll experiment with new feints. I'll experiment with new defenses. Sometimes I'll make myself vulnerable. I might get cut five or six times in a row. So lots of times when I'm sparring, if I get cut or stabbed, I'll have my opponent feed me that line again and again and again until I work on my defense. After I've tried that a few times and I'm used to that line, he very seldom ever cuts or stabs me with that technique again. This is how you get the most out of sparring. Use it as a learning experience, not a contest. Sometimes you have to make yourself vulnerable to learn. Get cut and stabbed in here, training and learning, and you won't get cut and stabbed on the street. Practice and get the most out of your sparring sessions. Work with your partner, be cooperative, help him to learn, and he'll stick around so you can learn and be a complete knife fighter.
This concludes the training we're going to do in this volume. Remember, repetition is your friend. You need conditioned reflexes, and the only way you're going to get them is to practice these techniques thousands and thousands of times. Remember your safety. Always wear a fencing mask when you're training and protect your vision, as no one can replace your eyesight. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.